Okay, real quick, I know this video is huge and thus probably very intimidating, but that's why I've broken it up into various segments. In this video, I will cover a multitude of rat-themed horror. I cover four different indie games, two of which aren't that scary, but the other two are quite disturbing. I will also cover a horror novel trilogy written by James Herbert, which includes The Rats, Lair, and Domain, each book consisting of swarms of gigantic mutated rats tearing through humanity like fucking butter. I cover dark and grotesque rat phenomenons, a serial killer with the alter ego of a humanoid rat, and I will also discuss the giant rat as a cryptid, providing some decent surface level research as well as my own deeper dives from various angles to give you, the viewer, a completely unbiased conglomeration of info. I try not to be too cold statistic anti-mysticism, and I also try not to spread myth without evidence. I stay between those two lines. And the point of this video is kinda complicated to say the least. See, I have an upcoming rap album called I Lure Rot. And in this album, one of the important topics I frequently draw back to is rats and rodent filth. We as humans have practically been at war with the cunning rat, but the propaganda that rats are simply disease-ridden pets and nothing more is misinformation. Granted, I want to let you know right now that I will be focusing on horror elements. Rats really aren't that bad in the grand scheme of things if you take humans out of the equation, which I will talk about later. However, the things I am really going to narrow in on are all disturbing forms of media and information that are all well-researched and intentionally structured to make you squirm in your seats. Musophobia is simply the fear of rats. The only bias of this video is that I could go on about how rats are not so bad after all. Many people have them as pets and it works perfectly fine for them. So just remember that I am intentionally focusing on the negatives for the sake of this video. It's partially a monument of content designed for patient viewers, yet it's also been made for myself to better understand everything as I studied the concepts and connected everything together. It's not going to be perfect. The last one I did was two and a half hours long about the slip-mouthed woman because oriental tradition is also a big part of my album and the slip-mouthed woman is a Japanese yokai legend. There was a lot of issues in that video. There's bound to be some in this one. But I'm not trying to just backdoor excuse any criticism because I've definitely tried really hard to make this video work. I'm just saying cut me a tad bit of slack in the end. And there's not much reason to continue babbling on. Let's get started with the first horror game for this video. When I was searching for rat-themed horror games on Steam, there weren't a lot of options, which I suppose is understandable. This isn't a very popular theme to work with, but I also went on Itch.io and found a handful of worthy rat-themed horror games which are all free. The first one that I chose to play was called Ratman, developed by Aza Game Studio. This developer has many games under their name and almost all of them have a similar style. That is, found footage VHS horror. I only played the one called Ratman, but I can see from the screenshots that other games such as Crawlerphobia, Cavephobia, and Cloakophobia all are found footage VHS horror games. It's not easy to make a great found footage horror movie, but with a game, there's a handful of elements that can easily be manipulated to form a decent, albeit a little half-assed horror game. Some of those elements are distortion and low visibility. Practically, if you slap a VHS recording HUD over the camera and then add some glitch effects, it can look a lot like an authentic found footage experience. But with this particular style, I do find it a little lazy, but that doesn't mean it isn't a successful style. Basically, it's not dumb if it works, and it definitely works. In this Ratman footage, I was constantly wondering if an enemy was right around the corner. This low visibility effect really stirs up the darkness. I mean, don't get me wrong, people usually aren't afraid of the dark, rather they're afraid of what is in the dark. Thus, the stronger and wilder the imagination is, the more horrendous the suggestions of what lurks unseen are going to be. This is kind of like an element of cosmic horror, but keep in mind Ratman is by no means a cosmic horror horror game. I'm just saying that the fear of the unknown is only as strong as the mind that it wraps around. 
So I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but when I look into the darkness even in this game, which is a very dark game, my mind goes to incredibly hideous places. There are ways to amplify this. If you give the observer some information beforehand, if that information is carefully designed, it can spark greater fear. For instance, hearing noises that aren't easily discernible but are definitely threatening or malignant or just straight up bizarre. Another could be what the observer feels. Maybe there's vibrations, things might be shaking, lights might be malfunctioning, perhaps there's a horrible smell. All of these things, when searching in the darkness, adds to the fear of what lurks within it. This game, though I don't mention it much in my commentary, does a decent job with these particular elements. But one of my biggest gripes with it was that the level design looked fairly bland. What I mean by that is, it takes place in a sewer, which would be like the fourth or fifth game by this developer within a sewer, but anyways, everything kind of looks the same. The structure is also very maze-like, so it is super easy to get lost. Winding corridors interconnect with one another, but other passageways lead to dead ends, and I found myself going in circles quite a lot. Let me be clear, this is only a negative thing for the game if it was unintended, which unfortunately I have no idea whether or not this was intentional, but there's some very artistic value in this type of structuring that provides a very particular type of horror for the player. When everything looks the same, when the darkness is dreadfully thick and there's all kinds of other elements that force you to pay attention, it's easy for the player to start questioning themselves. If this game were a 10 hour game, I can see players literally going insane trying to complete it. This game, however, took me about 36 minutes to complete and my edited footage is about 22 minutes, so no, I didn't go crazy playing, but I was already kind of crazy to begin with anyways. And my issue with that style is simply that it's easy. If you make everything look the same, well, that's essentially copy and paste. Not to mention, most of As A Game Studios horror games follow very similar environments. I wouldn't be surprised if assets and elements were reused and recycled in many of his creations. But is that really that bad of a thing? I'm not so certain. Maybe you can decide for yourselves after watching my footage. Here's my mutant vermin extermination adventure. Alright, Ratman, face the terror or be devoured. Play tape, press escape to reject tape. Created by As a Game Studio. Alright, tape 747 has been recovered. The contents of this tape have not yet been analyzed or viewed by any officials. A marine is sent on a mission into a sewer system to investigate the current rumors in the news about a cryptid creature said to have eaten many homeless people and a military officer most recently. The unidentified creature is said to roam below the city in the depths of the sewers. Fight for your survival if you want to make it out in one piece, or be skinned alive by Ratman and his minions. It's up to you. What if I have a being skinned alive kink? Do I win in this situation? Is this a win-win situation? Like what if I secretly want to be torn apart and ripped into pieces by giant rats? Then what? Don't listen to me, I'm stupid. Shit, I dropped all my gear when I fell down. Gotta collect it and move on. I fell down a sewer hole. Thing. Alright. A knife, a wrench, a pistol, grenade, and a flashlight. How come it- look, if I'm a trained, like, marine- hold on, there's no way I can get back up this tunnel. It's too steep. Why the hell did I accept this mission? You would think that a trained marine wouldn't just slip down this shit. You know, I imagine if I was a marine, I could still find a way to climb up this shit. Like, come on. Whatever. It is... 1992, May 3rd. red light. I don't know if this means I'm going the right way. If this game is going to be the way I think it is, I bet everything will look the exact same and will be maze-like, which 
is a game mechanic that I don't usually do well with. Not that it's a bad mechanic, but the way my brain works, it's hard for me to map out something. Stay back, rat. Fuck you up. I have such a large inventory. Is there like a quick wheel select? You change weapons just by the scroll wheel, but I don't like that. Okay, so one... Pressing 1 pulls out the wrench, pressing 2 pulls out this, but 3 and 4 don't do anything. Q and E lean. I don't know what use that is. I doubt I'm going to be tactically leaning around corners in this shit. We'll keep the flashlight out for now, just because I can't see Jack Dick in this place. inventory I wonder if the if the wrench is any better than the knife or if there's any point in having one versus the other maybe one has longer range but less damage I don't know holy fucking hell um hickory dickory dock the mouse contested the glock the trigger was pulled put six in his skull hickory dickory dock I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't waste the ammo for the sake of creativity, and that's exactly why I'm stuck in the rat corpse. I can't move. This is shit. This is garbage. Run. Holy fucking hell. Don't go that way. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Grenades. Pick them up. I don't know what to say about that. There's so many fucking rats. I don't have enough ammunition to fight that many rats. There's way too many enemies. Okay. Uh, let's let's just go with the wrench instead of the knife. I don't need both, I don't think. I definitely need this thing. And let's not waste a single bullet of that pistol. There's got to be another gun in here, right? There's got to be. Oh no. Oh no. Not off to a great start. Hello. What the fuck are you? I want this gun. You fucking thought. You'll be worshipping him soon, we all will eventually. I kept telling him the rat then the rat man is real, but they never listen to me. Probably cause you're an average Joe looking motherfucker wearing plaid in a sewer where there's these things how are you not dead by the way I don't trust you you should be dead there storyline fixed oh hey those little smaller rats probably gnawing on this poor fella ha get wrenched I'm gonna keep the shotgun out because there is a flashlight attached to this motherfucker and for some reason I can't hold a flashlight and a pistol at the same time despite being a trained marine. I also already am lost. I don't know which way is which. This looks new though. Is this like a fucking SWAT team soldier? SEAL Team 6 looking motherfucker? I guess I could be a marine. Wearing all black, though, I'd picture a marine to have camo fatigue. Oh my god, what a horrendous aim! I'm not gonna be using that. Okay, this is very low damage, but at least it's something. There's a shitload of enemies in this game. I guess I just had to find the guns before going too far. But how would I know where they were? Like already, this is a lot of fucking enemies. Jesus fucking Christ. 
there's so many enemies. When you give the school janitor an arsenal of military grade weaponry. Am I going back to spawn? This looks like I'm going back to spawn. Whoa. Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh fuck. Oh my god. That's not good. Too many of them, what the hell? Oh boy, oh boy, and there's one right there too. Just, oh my fucking god. More grenades, thank god. God, the grenade got me. I didn't know how, how much the, I didn't know how far the blast radius would be for that. I wonder how much damage the flashlight melee does. Probably barely any. Whoa. Okay, yeah, this thing is shit trying to melee with this. Not a good idea. I also don't much like that I can't just step over these guys or that there's like a, like they can totally block my passage. I should hear some crunching of bones and some slippery blood noises as I step on them and through them. <laughs> All right. It's been a long time since seeing some Remy the Rat scurrying about. And I am itching to turn a creature into pasta. Oh boy. Are there any more of you motherfuckers over here? Mayhaps. I'm getting stuck on, like, nothing. What is this? Whoa! Oh, I can block. Hell yeah. I like this. Spear and a shield, for some reason, is... Oh, but you're in my way now. I don't know if cutting you up makes it any easier for me to get by. It doesn't seem to be doing anything. There we go. I wonder if they're drawn to noise, like if I make it, you know, if I shoot a lot, are they gonna know where I'm at? Do they just roam scripted paths? I don't know how these AI work. Alright. Okay, there's too many of you to use a shield on. That fucking hurt. Oh boy. Oh man. Oh man, how do I heal? There we go. Oh man. Oh man. Change weapons. Ah. Smaller rat in the way. I can just kind of squeeze by him though, that's cool. Oh no. I'm running out of here. Fuck that shit. I'm not getting stuck here. You fucking thought, idiot. Fucker. 
Here we go. Shit, I dropped all my gear when I fell down this hole. Had to escape from those things. I can't get back up. Gotta continue and move on. What shit writing is this? I dropped all my things again. Wouldn't they be right here in front of me? That's dumb. You get a big thumbs down from the critic. That is cool to know, though, that I can just kind of run around those enemies. I don't need to kill them all. Knife, shotgun, hell yeah. Also a spine cross. Is that the symbol for the rat man? Or is that just, is there any purpose to that? Is it a plus sign? Oh god, I hope I have a lot of oxygen. Yo, what? There's a shark in the sewer? Oh my god, there's another one. Oh, bro, this is not cool. Go, climb up, climb up. Get the fuck out of that water. Whose sewer is this? Are we in Aquaman's toilet? What the hell is going on? Is there going to be more... Is there going to be more rats up here? I hear a baby crying. I will punt that baby. I will kick it so hard you don't even want to know. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Now I got a med kit. Which is amazing, right? I like the ambiance. I really do. Good music for this game. Hello. Whoa. Why? Is there any explanation for what I just saw? Am I just hallucinating? Am I going crazy? What the fuck was that about? Do I need to go back down? I need to go back down. Fuck! I don't like sharks, man. Fuck you, gross looking motherfucker. Are you dead or not? There's another one. I can't seem to hit him though. I'm gonna get some air. Okay. <laughs> I love the jumping noise. Okay, see, I see his tail, but I can't do anything about it. I'm afraid to get too close to him. What the hell? I'm not, I'm not doing this. No, it's not just a corpse. Holy shit! And then, ow! Oh my god! I do, no, I do not like that. Fuck this! Let me take a big gulp of air. I don't have a meter for, for lungs, do I? I don't have a lung meter. This is actually really fucking spooky, being crammed in these tunnels with sharks that are obviously way too large for these tunnels. I need an air pocket soon. I don't know how much air I have, but I imagine it's not a lot. Air, move, move, move. Oh, yes. I really hope they can't swim up and bite me in the nuts. That's how most trucks attack you. They attack you from, from below. Man. You know what? That's so... What kind of shark would be in a sewer? That's that's never been a thing, ever. There's no way. Nice little torso. Yum, yum. I'll be honest, I don't know where I'm going. Can the sharks smell these bloody torsos? Is it, like, bad to be near them? Let's go this way. Man, I don't know where to go. Everything looks the fucking same. Dude, I've been swimming down here for ages. I cannot find the exit. What the fuck? I guess that's one of the problems with making it such low visibility and having everything look the exact same. This looks kinda new. Is this the exit, hopefully? I think I found the exit. It's got this greenish tint. Oh boy, I did. 
God damn, this place is falling apart. Not again, lost my gear when it should collapse. Who the hell am I talking to? the hell am I talking to anyway? I don't know what the fuck's going on. It was super loud. I could barely read. Have you guys ever been in a car and you turn the volume down to read better? Do I win yet? What the fuck? How many more rats do I have to obliterate? Whoa. What the fuck? What are those fucking groaning noises? Satan's bowels. Ooh. Ooh, I like the smell of this one. Wait, they're giving me a lot of bullets. Is this the... Is this where I see Rat Man? I've always preferred Mice Dude. He's a little bit nicer. Alright. This looks very boss fight-ish. Yep. I fucking do it. Oh. Holy. Shotgun time, I suppose. Let's go, Master Splinter. You really think you can contest the 12 gauge shotgun? With your fucking kung fu? I wish I knew how much health this guy had left. Let's try. right? Do I become the rat man? That motherfucker wearing plaid was such a liar. I ain't worshipping shit. I kill your god. This the end? I like this music. Oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, here we go. Cool. Tape 561. A tape was recovered showing a marine escaping a complex underground sewer system. A unidentified species of mutated rats and a urban legend cryptid known as Ratman were found to, leave, to, to live beneath the city of Oakville. Man, this guy's gotta work on his writing. I hate to be that guy, but come on. The creature appeared to be almost impossible to kill. Yeah, almost. I saved the day. Big hero badge on my chest. The Marine Corps have been notified of the casualties within the premise. As well as FBI and forensics have been called. Further investigation awaits as the sewer system is planned to be demolished. You know what, now that I think about it, I may be a very good writer, but I probably couldn't make this game. You know what I mean? I should I should chill out on my grammatical uh, criticism. I need to stop being such a grammar Nazi.
Alright, so I really enjoyed this game, despite me nitpicking quite a lot. It does have a handful of issues, but overall it was an enjoyable experience for me. Also, remember, this game is completely free on Itch.io, so it's more of a piece of art than a product. This game had three levels, the first being infested with two forms of giant rats, the second being completely underwater with obnoxiously sized sharks roaming the tunnels, and the third essentially being an open arena for the boss fight. Let's start with the first area. The layout is nothing too crazy, typical sewer interior. Everything looks like slimy concrete. In this first section, there are black rats that are about the size of a dog or a cat, and there are also even larger albino rats with more health and more of an upright posture. In this area, you start with a knife, a pistol, a wrench, a grenade, a flashlight, and a med kit. Personally, I kind of think that having both a knife and a wrench as melee weapons was not a good idea, considering you can change weapons with the scroll wheel. I don't really know for sure what the difference is between the knife and the wrench, but I think one has more range and less damage. I don't know. Apparently the player is a marine, so perhaps a specialist or a military engineer, hence the wrench. But what I would have rather seen is some sort of valve or gate within the map that required the wrench to loosen and open, instead of just being another completely unnecessary melee weapon. The grenade is also very dangerous to use, since the first level is so cramped and claustrophobic. I killed myself with grenades more than once while playing, which I know was partly because I was making poor decisions, but at the same time, I felt it was partly faulty map design. There's a particular dead end with two extra grenades there. I usually ran into this area whilst being chased by the mutant rats. At this point, the measly little 10 bullets in the pistol are surely emptied, so of course I try to use the grenades. This never really ended well, which brings me to the next problem. This game has quite a lot of enemies. Not that the amount itself will universally determine the scariness of a game, but rather this felt unbalanced. There's also a P90, a shotgun, and a spear and shield combo placed throughout this area, so while there technically is enough ammunition to kill all the rats, if not most of them, there's no guarantee you'll stumble upon them unless you have already died many times and have started to learn the layout of the level. This isn't a terrible thing, it just makes things a bit difficult. And difficult doesn't mean bad, however, not all of this feels logical which has nothing to do with difficulty. The shotgun, which is a Spaz-12, is found in this area next to this NPC. This guy babbles on about the Rat Man, how he worships this monster, and how eventually everyone does. I killed this dude every chance I got. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense why he'd be alive down there, surrounded by man-eating rodents, at least not in this calm and tranquil state. I'd expect to see such an NPC locked behind a sealed door or gate, possibly insane, or perhaps just starving and in need. That'd make much better writing than just your average friendly neighbor standing in the middle of a room surrounded by fucking skeletons. At the P90, there's a dead soldier, but this is actually explained in the description. It says, A marine is sent on a mission into a sewer system to investigate the current rumors in the news about a cryptid creature said to have eaten many homeless people and a military officer most recently. The unidentified creature is said to roam below the city in the depths of the sewers. Fight for your survival if you want to make it out in one piece, or be skinned alive by Ratman and his minions. It's up to you. So this dude was a military officer who was reportedly eaten. Turns out he's just dead. I suppose this insinuates that the NPC by the shotgun might be a homeless man, but it still doesn't make the character's demeanor believable in any way. As for Spear and Shield, this combo is very fun to use because you can block incoming attacks. However, it isn't practical when there is a whole assembly line of mutant rats crawling toward you. It's more for one-on-one. -on -one. Yet, once you pick this up, a white rat immediately spawns behind you, and this acts like a jump scare. I thought this was decently placed, as I definitely didn't expect it to happen. It also provides a way to test out the weapon instantaneously, which I felt was pretty clever, because this item can be very useful, and you get shown just how useful it can be right off the bat. Despite having grabbed all of these weapons, though, there were still too many enemies. Perhaps the game intended for the player to slip by the creatures 
as I did instead of killing them all? I'm not sure. But it is a little strange that the player can so easily maneuver around these gigantic rodents to escape. I found it easier to evade them when they were alive than trying to get by a corpse that was blocking my way. That's kind of a problem. This game also uses the word cryptids in the description. Cryptids are essentially fantastical or extraordinary creatures, usually animalistic and typically more modern. Cryptids aren't ancient myths, but I've read about some that dated back to the 1800s. Technically, giant rats are cryptids. Not simply an overgrown brown rat, but a separate and mythological species. Not all cryptids are folklore though, or rather they kind of are, but sometimes there's a bit of legitimacy and truth intertwined with the fantastical elements. Giant rats as a cryptid have a handful of interesting sightings, one of which was World War I in the waterlogged trenches. You can imagine that rats who fed upon countless soldiers in war grew quite large, and if that war raged on for quite a while, those rats might even temporarily adapt and evolve into a larger subspecies that would only be around for as long as the war. Cryptids are a fascinating topic, and you'll definitely hear more about it later in this video. Unfortunately for the next enemy though, there is no reasonable connection. Let me explain. When you find the exit to the first area, you drop down to a level below. During this transition, you somehow drop your whole inventory. This annoyed me, considering the player is a trained marine and that the equipment completely disappears. As you continue onward, eventually you find another shotgun and a knife, as well as a cross made of spines, perhaps serving as a warning effigy for what's to come. Most of this lower level is actually underwater, and in the water lurks giant sharks. Yes, you heard that right, sewer sharks. The concept of that spooks me quite a bit as I have thalassophobia and water themed horrors tend to get under my skin sometimes. And there's something dreadful about seeing a shark that barely fits in the tube he's swimming in charging like a ravenous torpedo toward you. I have had a lot of nightmares when I was younger and going into adolescence that involved sewers and being crammed in underwater tunnels with large creatures that were a threat to me. This awakened some of those buried memories, hence I really enjoyed the unsettling nature of this level, regardless of its absurdity. There is nothing that comes up when you look for sewer shark cryptid, or at least nothing popularly known. There are plenty of shark cryptids and plenty of sewer cryptids, but no sewer sharks. The size of these sharks is also off-putting, if such a creature may exist. Sharks adjust their size to their environment. If you have a shark in a small enclosure of water from birth, it will only grow to a certain size put it in the vast open, and it will grow to its maximum genetic ability. My point is, these sharks wouldn't be this large if they were living in the sewers. Even if you say it was a special kind of cryptid, it basically defies biology, which is tough to argue. I'm all for questioning science, but this one feels a bit pointless to argue, if you know what I mean. I also looked into real cases of people who might have found sharks in the sewer, and there was absolutely nothing. At least nothing documented, but again, despite this being absurd and very unrealistic, this sequence was still disturbing in its own way. Additionally, maybe I shouldn't judge this game on realism, considering the use of cryptids is clearly exaggerated, but still, the sharks thing bugged me a little because apparently these aren't cryptids either, they're just an addition to the game that didn't need to exist. Also in the second area, in the one sequence of rooms that is above water, there is another jump scare. I felt that this one was nicely placed considering the waving figure behind the bars being a false lure. However, I'm not sure why it exists. Maybe a hallucination, maybe it's some other weird sewer cryptid that is completely irrelevant, I don't really know. So the way the scare was implemented was nice, but the purpose and essence of it is completely lackluster. When you exit this underwater segment, you get to the third area, which is essentially a giant room for the boss fight. The boss fight itself is the Ratman. 
but he also has his minions with him, and this fight takes up most of your ammo. The trick is to use the explosive barrels on minion rats that are clumped together, thus saving ammo in the process. I took out the minions first, then the boss after. This fight isn't too hard, but if you didn't know to use the barrels, you might run out of ammo. Also, as you saw in my commentary, I get annoyed when the writing is poorly executed, whether that be purely grammatical or simply illogical. As a writer, I can't help it, but rest assured this game was very fun despite the many problems that I have pointed out. Let's circle back to cryptids for a sec though. Some of the most popular are Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and the Mothman. But there's plenty of fascinating lesser known cryptids as well such as the Brosno Dragon and the Ninjin. The Ratman is also a cryptid, but I didn't know that until playing this game. That guy's creepy. Yeah, let's get out of his eyeline. This is the remarkable story of the Ratman. Westerville's very own Loch Ness Monster. It's a mystery that can only be told inside the cavernous tunnels beneath our feet. I'm Holly Marciano, Channel 6 News. Construction? Let's go again. Yeah. Again. I believe the commonly used name is actually the Ratman of South End. It's a local legend originating in the town of South End on Sea, Essex. Centering around an underpass, the legend has two main variants, the commonality between them being the presence of a rat-like creature who appears in the pedestrian walkways at night. The most commonly told story of the Ratman involves an old man who used the underpass to escape from the rain and the cold at night. The story goes that he was old and barely able to walk. One night, a group of teenagers beat him half to death and stole his blanket, the only real source of warmth he had. Dying from his injuries and the biting cold of the night, he succumbed to hypothermia. His stiffening corpse nibbled and gnawed on by the numerous vermin who inhabit the area. Soon after, locals reported odd noises, namely high-pitched squealing and the sound of nails dragging along the walls. Whether evidence of a real ghost or an overactive imagination, the fact remains that this story and subsequent noises led to locals dubbing the creature the Rat Man of South End. And the other main version of the story is far more fanciful and seems to have emerged through schoolyard folklore, a tale passed between children to frighten and unnerve their classmates, similar to the Slipmouth Woman rumors which I discussed in the video that I mentioned in the beginning. In this version, the Rat Man is no longer a ghost but a real creature. The story runs that the mayor of the town was a known adulterer and was eventually cursed for his infidelity in the form of a grotesque child, a baby with the elongated snout and worm-like tail of a rat. The child grew and developed a taste for flesh. Seeking a solution for his problem, the mayor had the underpass constructed with a concealed entrance to a chamber within which his monstrous offspring might hide, only to emerge at night to indulge in its hunger. Out of these two stories, I think this game was more inspired by the first story rather than the second. But did you know that there's more than just a fictional Ratman? The Otaku Murderer, aka Tsutomu Miyazaki, was a Japanese serial killer who was also nicknamed the Ratman. And I hate that I have to do this, but for the sake of this video, if you don't handle disturbing and horrific acts of violence well, do yourself a favor and click on a different video. I'm not holding anyone's hands or tiptoeing over sensitive subjects, so for the kids who may be watching or adults with the stomach of kids, this is going to get very explicit and I strongly suggest watching something else. Let's dive into Tsutomu Miyazaki, the real rat man. Tsutomu Miyazaki was a Japanese serial killer who murdered four young girls in Tokyo and Saitama Prefecture between August 1988 and June 1989. He was termed by the Japanese media as the otaku murderer and had an alter ego known as Ratman. Miyazaki abducted and killed the girls aged from 4 to 7 in his car before dismembering and sexually molesting their corpses. He also engaged in necrophilia and cannibalism, preserved their body parts as trophies, and taunted the families of his victims. Miyazaki was arrested in Haichoji in July 1989 after being confronted while taking nude photographs of a young girl. 
I know, this guy is wicked. He was diagnosed as having one or more personality disorders, but was determined by authorities to be sane and aware of his crimes and their consequences. Miyazaki was sentenced to death in 1997 and was executed by hanging in 2008. Miyazaki's extensive collection of pornography and horror videotapes was misrepresented by the media as being primarily anime and manga, which triggered a widespread moral panic against otaku in Japan. Tsutomu Miyazaki was born on 21st August 1962 in Itsukaichi, Tokyo, the eldest son of a wealthy family. He was born premature and had a rare birth defect that caused his hand joints to be fused together, preventing him from being able to bend his wrists upwards. Miyazaki's family operated a regional newspaper company and were well known in Itsukaichi, where his grandfather and great-grandfather had served on the town council. Due to his parents being busy, Miyazaki was mainly raised by his grandfather and an intellectually disabled man the family hired as a nanny. He was ostracized when he attended elementary school due to his deformity and consequently kept to himself. He attended Meidai Naikano High School in Nakano, a prestigious high school associated with Meiji University, and was a star student until his grades began to drop dramatically. Miyazaki was ranked 40 out of 50 six in his class and did not receive the customary admission to Meiji University for students of the school. Instead of studying English and becoming a teacher as he originally intended, Miyazaki attended a local junior college and studied to become a photography technician. In the mid-1980s, Miyazaki moved back into his parents' house in Utsikaichi, sharing a room with his eldest sister. Although Miyazaki's family was highly influential in Itsukaichi, he expressed no desire to take over his father's print shop. After his arrest, Miyazaki would say that what he really craved was being listened to about his problems, but believed that his parents, more worried about the material than the sentimental, would have not heard him he would have been ignored. In the same confession, he said that by this period in his life, he had begun to consider suicide. Miyazaki felt he only received support from his grandfather, to whom he was close, and was rejected by his two younger sisters. In May 1988, Miyazaki's grandfather died, which served to deepen his depression and isolate him even further. In an attempt to retain something from him, Miyazaki ate part of his grandfather's ashes. A few weeks later, one of Miyazaki's sisters caught him watching her while she was taking a shower. He then attacked her when she told him to leave. When his mother learned of the incident and demanded that he spend more time working and less time with his videotapes, he attacked her as well. Between August 1988 and June 1989, Miyazaki mutilated and killed four girls between the ages of four and seven and sexually molested their corpses. He drank the blood of one victim and ate a part of her hand. These crimes, which prior to Miyazaki's apprehension were named the Little Girl Murders and later the Tokyo slash Saitama serial kidnapping murders of little girls, shocked Saitama Prefecture, which had few crimes against children. On August 22, 1988, one day after Miyazaki's 26th birthday, Mari Kono, a four-year-old girl, vanished while playing at a friend's house. After failed attempts to find her, Kono's father contacted the police. Miyazaki had led Kono into his black Nissan Langley and then drove westward of Tokyo and parked the car under a bridge in a wooded area. There, Miyazaki sat alongside Kono for half an hour before murdering her, then molested her corpse. He dumped her body in the hills near his home, departing with her clothes, then allowed the body to decompose before returning to remove her hands and feet, which he kept in his closet. Miyazaki burned Kono's remaining bones in his furnace, ground them into powder, and sent them to her family in a box, along with several of her teeth, photos of her clothes, and a postcard which read, Mari cremated. Bones investigate proof. Kono's hands and feet were found in Miyazaki's closet after his arrest almost a year later. On October 3rd, 1988, Miyazaki abducted seven-year-old Masami Yoshizawa after spotting her while driving along a rural road. He had offered Yoshizawa a ride, which she accepted, then drove her to the same place he had killed Kono. Miyazaki killed Yoshizawa 
engaged in sexual acts with her corpse, and took her clothes with him when he departed. Two months later, on December 12, 1988, Miyazaki abducted four-year-old Erika Namba as she was returning home from a friend's house. Miyazaki forced her into his car and drove to a parking lot in Naguri, where he forced her to remove her clothes in the back seat and began to take pictures of her. Miyazaki then killed Namba, tied her hands and feet behind her back, covered her with a bed sheet, and placed her body in his car's trunk. He disposed of Namba's clothes in a wooded area and left her body in the adjoining parking lot where it was discovered three days later. On December 20th, Namba's family received a postcard sent by Miyazaki with a message assembled using words cut out of magazines, Erika, cold, cough, throat, rest, death. On June 6, 1989, Miyazaki convinced five-year-old Ayako Nomoto to allow him to take pictures of her. He then led Nomoto into his car and murdered her, covered her corpse with a bed sheet, and placed her in his trunk. Miyazaki took the corpse into his apartment and spent the next two days engaging in sexual acts with it, taking photos and video of it in various positions. Again, this dude was really malicious. When Nomoto's corpse began to decompose, Miyazaki dismembered it, abandoning her torso in a cemetery and her head in the nearby hills. Miyazaki kept her hands, drinking blood from and cannibalizing them. Fearing that the police would find Nomoto's body parts, Miyazaki returned to the cemetery in the hills two weeks later and carried the remains back to his apartment, where he hid them in his closet. On July 23, 1989, Miyazaki saw two sisters playing in a park in Haichou and managed to separate the younger of the sisters from the older one who stayed behind. He was taking photographs of the younger daughter, whom he had convinced to strip nude when he was caught by their father, who attacked Miyazaki but was unable to restrain him. After fleeing on foot, Miyazaki eventually returned to the park to retrieve his car, whereupon he was arrested by police responding to a call by the father. A search of Miyazaki's two-room bungalow produced 5,763 videotapes, some containing animals May and slasher films, later used as reasoning for his crimes, interspersed among them was video footage and pictures of his victims. Miyazaki was also reported to be a fan of horror films of which he had a collection. Miyazaki, who retained a perpetually calm and collected demeanor during his trial, appeared indifferent to his capture. Miyazaki's trial began on March 30th, 1990. Often talking nonsensically, Miyazaki blamed his actions on Ratman, an alter ego who he claimed forced him to kill. He spent time during the trial drawing Ratman in cartoon form. Miyazaki's father refused to pay for his son's legal defense and committed suicide in 1994. The seven-year trial focused on Miyazaki's mental state at the time of the murders. Under Japanese law, people of unsound minds are not subject to punishment, and the feeble-minded are entitled to reduced sentences. Three teams of court-appointed expert psychiatrists came to differing conclusions about Miyazaki's ability to tell right from wrong. Two teams determined him to be feeble-minded, one team concluded that he was schizophrenic, the other that he had multiple personality disorder. A third team found that although Miyazaki had a personality disorder, he was still capable of taking responsibility for his actions. The Tokyo District Court judged Miyazaki aware of the magnitude and consequences of his crimes and therefore accountable. He was sentenced to death on April 14, 1997. His death sentence was upheld by both the Tokyo High Court on June 28, 2001 and the Supreme Court of Justice on January 17, 2006. Miyazaki described his serial murders as an act of benevolence. Child killer Karu Kobayashi described himself as the next Tsutomu Miyazaki, or Mamoru Takuma. Miyazaki stated, I won't allow him to call himself the second Tsutomu Miyazaki when he hasn't even undergone a psychiatric examination. Minister of Justice Kunio Hatoyama signed Miyazaki's death warrant on June 17, 2008, and he was hanged at the Tokyo Detention House that same day. Ryuzo Saki said, his trial was long and that he was not willing to criticize Hatoyama. Okay, the grueling part is over. Well, grueling to some, fascinating to others. For me, this stuff isn't something I'm really supporting, nor do I feel sorry for Miyazaki. Take it as more of a morbid intrigue, which technically you signed up for by watching this far into the video anyways. And pretty much everything I said about Miyazaki was from Wikipedia, which I know isn't the most reliable source. Even the picture on the Wikipedia page that's supposed to be his rat 
bat-like hands actually isn't a photo of Miyazaki's real hands. I did try looking for some info on Miyazaki in a book I have called The Big Book of Serial Killers, but out of 150 other killers, Miyazaki wasn't mentioned once. This book does, however, mention Gary Ridgway, who's a serial killer that I made a horror court EP based off of back in early 2021. I will not make another serial killer EP for The Rat Man, but on the flip side, one of my favorite artists, Jack Progresso, has a song titled Tsutomu Miyazaki, which is what originally introduced me to this serial killer in the first place back when the Custom Coffins album dropped. I was listening to this shit on the school bus in high school during senior year, but as much as I like this song, it isn't really a topical song based on the killer. There is just a couple of different bars that mention him. Homicide is sloppy, up in rehab with fans, I had to sign some copies. These conveyor belt rappers just get in line and copy. I'ma eat these kids like rap man Miyazaki. Also, I'd like to say regarding Tsutomu Miyazaki, it seems that people really wanted to blame his horrific actions on anime, manga, and horror movies and just dark forms of media that he was interested in. But in reality, it seems clear to me that since he was neglected by his whole family pretty much, that was probably what originally sparked him to lash out. As far as humanoid rats go with mythology and folklore, it's actually quite a rare idea. One of the most famous human transformation stories is of the werewolf. Technically, a were-rat exists as a concept, but clearly isn't as big of an idea as the werewolf, for example. But I imagine it would be the same idea under some circumstance, probably a type of lunar phase, a man would perhaps transform into a half-rat, half-man. I know that this is a thing within Dungeons and & Dragons, and also the Dungeons & Dragons Forgotten Realms ordeal. I never played D&D, &D, but it doesn't surprise me that this exists there. With things like medieval fantasy, you can find almost any form of human-animal hybrid. There's also some badass humanoid rat creatures within the world of Magic the Gathering, which is a card game. I personally always gravitated to this rather than D&D. &D. There's also some Warhammer stuff that involves humanoid rats, which I haven't played yet, but this is entirely fantasy. What about actual mythology? I think the reason such a thing is hardly ever seen is because of mankind's feud with rats as a species. Man and rat have practically been at war in many cases. The Black Death is evidence enough. When we call someone a rat, it has negative connotations. Rats are hardly thought of in a respectable or holy sense. I mean, compare that to the Egyptian gods who are part man, part jackal, or part man, part bird, or the Indian god Ganesha, part man, part elephant. In India, actually, there is one case of rats that are considered holy, but I'll get to that later. But speaking strictly in a deified sense, there is one entity that I found called Ninkalim. This is the ancient Sumerian goddess of field mice. Ninkalim is considered the lord of teeming creatures and features in much of the incantation texts against field pests. But still, while this is close, this is a mouse god, not a rat god. And rats are different from mice. Perhaps this still counts because they're definitely closely related, but we think of mice as less negative than rats. If you really think about it though, mice and rats and all forms of rodents were technically around before we constructed cities. Rats on their own do more good for the planet than humans do. But since they live in filthy areas, we think of them as far beneath us. In reality, the cities we have built were on top of areas that didn't used to be filthy at all. In most cases, what makes a rat so gross is our own filth that it has unknowingly wallowed in. But there is some relevance in our repulsion, without a doubt. Rats carry many diseases, and a single bite could put you in the hospital if you contract something serious. And historically speaking, rats have always been a pest to humans. They are incredibly smart and cunning and have caused us more suffering, I think, than any other animal, besides other humans. You're going to see me eat rats. I'm Holly, and, and that's Jeff. Do you have a last name, though? Are there other people that live down here with you? Can you repeat that? 
Did you say rat man? Are, are, are you the rat man, Bill? It's no wonder that it's so rare to see old stories that involve humanoid rats. Nowadays, with creativity everywhere, it's a bit more common, but my point remains. The reason rat-human hybrids are rare in literature and media is because there's hardly any aesthetic appeal, aside maybe for the horror genre, which is a relatively new thing. Horror was not a form of societal entertainment in ancient times. Tsutomu Miyazaki isn't exactly ancient either, of course, but this monster of a human, or perhaps I should say human of a monster, is infamous for his crimes, but also his alter ego, the Rat Man. When you hear Rat Man as a literal nickname for a person, that's going to draw some attention. It's rare. Well, of course, we can call each other rats for snitching on one another, but it's not exactly the same. When there's a purely characteristic aspect in regards to something more physical rather than a tattletale mindset, it carries much more weight. Anyways, we covered Ratman as a cryptid folktale, as a horror game, and as a real serial killer. Now, I'd like to get into a horror novel by James Herbert that involves lots and lots of rats. Giant rats, mind you. The rats in this story are actually described to be about the size of the black rats in the Ratman game, and it's basically written like an old 80s slasher where the killer is an unstoppable horde of flesh-eating rats that just rip people apart. Don't worry, we're pretty much past all the sexual darkness in this video from Tsutomu, but this James Herbert novel does get it very gory, brutal, and sometimes quite gross. And since it didn't actually happen, unlike the Ratman serial killer, I can actually go into some real detail about what I love about this book and what I hate about it without getting shit from cancel culture. So moving from Tsutomu Miyazaki, let's dive into The Rats. The Rats by James Herbert is one of four in a series. The first book, which was also James Herbert's first novel in general, was published in 1974. The others are Lair, Domain, and then The City, but that one is just a graphic novel. The Rats starts off with a middle-aged alcoholic man who is struggling to find societal acceptance for his homosexuality. This man is named Henry, but at the end of this very first chapter, he wakes up from his drunken sleep being eaten alive by rats. He fights them off to the best of his ability, but the strength in numbers overwhelms him. They crawl up his leg, taking chunks out of him. He can't see because they've eaten his eyes, and he dies right there after he'd lost all feeling in his body. So this book also doesn't hold back any punches, which is good. I like it that way. Chapter 2 isn't important, but in Chapter 3, a dog and a baby are devoured by rats while the mother was gone, and it's described in pretty gruesome detail. The dog initially saw one rat coming out of the cellar and jumped after it to kill it, but then more came, and more and more, and the dog was being ripped to pieces. The rats also then made their way toward the baby, and the dog used the last bit of its strength to try and protect this one-year-old child, but they both became rat fodder. A few chapters later, a teacher named Mr. Harris brings one of his art students to the hospital because the kid had been bitten on the hand by a rat. At the hospital, they see the mother of the one-year-old, now dead, baby, clutching the bloody mass of flesh that was once her child to her chest, and she was acting hysterical. More and more things start to connect that there's a serious growing problem of carnivorous rats eating people. Also, if this rats eating a baby alive thing is too much for you, you're probably not going to survive the whole video, so do yourself a favor and check out early. I'd like to point out that that can really happen. In 2016 in Johannesburg, South Africa, a woman left her three month old baby in the house to go out partying and rats ended up devouring the infant. There's also been many cases in history and some of these fairly recent of rats biting the feet of infants, taking off their toes, and sometimes of course biting them to death. As far as rats in South Africa, that's something we'll circle back to way later in the video. And I know this video is fucking gigantic, but bear with me, it's gonna be a, a long, slow, and absolutely repulsive ride. 
In Chapter 5, we get introduced to Mary Kelly. No, not the famous Jack the Ripper murder victim. This part is entirely fiction. Mary has an extremely tragic past, in and out of mental institutions, and off and on being homeless. She has an incredibly strong desire for lust, yet never feeling fully satisfied. The more she gives in to letting worthless nobodies have sex with her, the emptier she feels and the bigger this satisfaction bowl gets, being harder and harder to fill. She was religious, but she didn't see lust as like a sin of the flesh like the priests did. She was so lustful that it was impossible for her to believe it was a bad thing. She'd pray for orgasms and thank God when she had them. That being said, she felt like she was getting nowhere with the pieces of shit she'd let have sex with her until she met a guy named Timothy. He satisfied her in many different ways and she fell in love with him. Timothy wanted to go into the army though and got flattened by a tank not long after Mary received a letter from him asking her to marry him. Devastated, Mary blamed God for this and went all anti-Christian. This is when she went to multiple mental asylums because of arson. Well, specifically, she'd been caught trying to burn a church down, and she had attempted doing this to various churches on different occasions. She got out of these asylums because of seemingly sane behavior, but ended up doing crazy shit the second she was released. She even cut a priest's ear off with a knife, and also in a house of like five others where she was basically paying for rent with her own body. When she got kicked out of this after these men were bored of her, she burnt that house down too, killing five men and one firefighter. And years later, now at like the present time where the rest of the characters are at, she gets into a brutal fight with multiple other homeless men who wanted to take her bottle of alcohol from her. They beat her half to death and of course stole the bottle of, I think it was scotch. Soon after, the half dead Mary Kelly is met with you guessed it, a bunch of rats. They rip her apart, leaving basically a wet skeleton. And then, because apparently these rats were still hungry afterwards, they went after the other homeless people who were sleeping not far away. They killed and ate all of them. It says that some of the townspeople heard horrific screams of agony but didn't want any trouble because that area where people like those homeless people stay at was nothing but trouble. It's like, I used to work at Safeway, a grocery supermarket, and on the night shifts if you heard a weird old guy screaming in the parking lot or by the back of the store, you mind your business. It's not a diss on homeless people for the sake of being homeless, it's just because, yeah, maybe he's hurt. But more than likely, his veins are full of drugs and he's screaming at a wall about bugs in his teeth. So the people in this town, in my opinion, had the right idea. And if they were to go investigate, they'd likely be eaten by the rats anyways. Cops did show up to this post-rat feast scene soon after, and it was detailed that they came back out of the churchyard where the corpses were extremely pale and vomiting from disturbance and disgust. Usually, it takes a pretty gruesome event to make police officers puke because they're used to seeing crazy shit unless they're recruits, but the book said nothing of the sort. And now I want to mention again that this book is tragic. It is dark and it does not care if it is stepping over the line for like a marketable or easily profitable politically stable novel. James Herbert went way out of his way to make this chapter extra long, talking about how sad and gloomy this character's life is just to end her life and like 12 other people in the very chapter she was fucking introduced in. And that's kind of a pattern with people dying in the same chapter we're introduced to them in, which in my opinion makes the plot itself just a tad unstable and kind of unorganized, but that's just me. I wish there were more things to connect these characters to each other within the town they live live in or something, you know, something to make me care more about them, something of importance other than the constant swarming symbol of death which is the rats, the only thing uniting these characters, many stories, but they're already dead before any cooperation or connectivity can happen, at least that's the impression for the first five chapters. In chapter six, we return to the teacher, Mr. Harris, and we find out that his student who had been bitten by a rat has died barely 24 hours later. Harris learns this at the hospital and has a talk with some of the doctors who are researching the events. And so they call a rat killer company like 
vermin exterminator stuff. Harris and this exterminator named Ferris. Yeah, I didn't like how similar their names were either. They do some investigating of their own, following a couple of rats down a canal. These rats end up heading toward a section of apartments, and Harris ends up going the opposite direction to call for help, like the rat killer company and the police, and Ferris, the exterminator, gets a little too close to a rat hole. He gets killed, swarmed, devoured, picked clean. Other residents of the flats watched in terror from their windows. They bolted their doors shut in most hidden fear. And there's one lady who attacks the swarm of giant rats that were eating Ferris. She swung, I think it was a broom or something, at these rats, but they eventually got her too. Also, I should say that the rat killer Ferris claimed they were the largest rats he'd ever seen, like the size of a small dog. Yet he was still dumb enough to lower himself to the ground and peer into a hole of of which rats came leaping out of. <sighs> it is what it is. <laughs> Chapter 7 and 8 kinda just involve some background information on Harris and his significant other, Judy. They go to Judy's aunt's house, Aunt Hazel, and spend a few days trying to relax far away from all the trouble. Nothing crazy really happens here, except one thing that is told about Harris that I think is worth mentioning, which is that he doesn't like crowds. It's not that he has some sort of hatred for every single individual, but if he's in public and there's too many people, he's repulsed. James Herbert writes that Harris's repulsion is only when people are gathered in mass, and this is compared to the repulsion one might feel towards a swarm of rats. It's not an incredibly significant detail, but I felt like it was a good piece of information. I don't really know why. Maybe it sounded better in my head because I hate people in mass too. I don't know. Humans, for the most part, don't have a clue. They don't want one or need one either. They're happy. They think they have a good bead on things. Well, why, why the big secret? People are smart. They can handle it. A person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. In Chapter 9, we get introduced to a young man named Dave Moody, who survives in this book for like two pages. It isn't said specifically how old he is, but given some of the details, I imagine he's in his late 20s at the most. He dies in a very graphical fashion, which I love. Once more, James Herbert doesn't hold back any punches. It is vividly described, the horror and the gore and the filth of this black river of vermin that yanks Dave Moody down a flight of stairs at a train station. His Screaming for his mother echoing in the station, the swarm of squelchy, round, damnable creatures engulfing him alive, it's a true horror scene. It's a little exaggerated, but it doesn't fluff things up to make it less offensive. One of the people who work at the station named Errol heard Dave screams and found squirming masses of rats everywhere. He panicked and started running in fear, and it is mentioned that this station was super dark and dimly lit. In fact, when Errol heard Dave screams, he thought that someone had slipped down the stairs from poor visibility. Unfortunately, it was actually a horde of hungry rodents enjoying their meal. So Errol begins running through this dark train station. Without really paying full attention, he ran straight into an oncoming train that was just starting to press its brakes, and he died instantly. A preferable death compared to being rat fodder. Then, as the train had stopped into a now rat-infested station, these rats started jumping at the windows, and they tried to break in. One rat made it through, bit a man, who then stomped the rat's skull, not knowing he now only had 24 hours to live. The driver of the train almost stopped, but then continued on, knowing that if he had fully stopped, they'd all die. The station master also comes out of his booth around this time and is like a distant spectator of the situation until they get to him as well. In fact, I'll just read the last page or so here so you can understand the scene, because it's fucking beautifully written. When he'd recovered his composure, he slipped his jacket on and stepped out from the ticket office. Without rushing, he ambled towards the top of the stairs to platform one. What's going on down there? He bellowed, squinting as he tried to see through the dim lights. He heard one cry of what sounded like mum and saw one black thrashing shape. He moved cautiously down a few steps and stopped again. Come on, who is it? The black shape seemed to break up into little shapes that began mounting the stairs towards him. He heard a train grinding to a halt downstairs, and then suddenly, for some unknown reason, the whine of it picking up speed again and carrying on through the station without stopping. Then he heard the squeaks that sounded like hundreds of mice. 
he realized that the creatures were coming up the stairs towards him. Not mice, but rats. Horrible big rats. Black. Ugly. He moved surprisingly fast for a man of his bulk. He cleared the few stairs he descended in two bounds and headed for the ticket office, slamming the door behind him. He leaned back against it for a couple of seconds, fighting for breath and giving his heartbeats a chance to slow down. He made for the phone and with trembling fingers dialed emergency. Police! Hurry! Police! Is the Shadwell Underground Station Master Green speak? He looked up as he heard a scuttling noise. Staring across from him in the ticket office pay window was a huge, black, evil-looking rat. He dropped the phone and ran to the back of the office. The windows were barred, preventing any escape. He looked around in desperation, his gross figure shaking with fear. He saw the cupboard set back in the wall, where brooms and buckets were kept for the cleaners. Pulled it open and pushed himself inside, closing the door behind. He crouched, half-sitting, whimpering, wetness spreading between his thighs, in the darkness, scarcely daring to breathe. That scream! It must have been Errol or someone waiting for a train. They'd got him, and now they were coming for him. The driver of the train hadn't stopped. He'd seen them and driven on. And there's no one else on the station. Mother of God, what's that? Gnawing, scraping. They're in the office. They're trying to eat their way through the cupboard door. Also, now that I think of it, maybe it's not horrible that we get introduced to characters who die in the same chapter with no relevance other than a common enemy. Honestly, that's how a lot of slasher flicks work. Your Jason Voorhees movies, Freddy Krueger, Michael Myers, Leatherface, whatever. For the movie's sake of having constant horror sprinkled throughout, they kill off meaningless characters. But in truth, as a personal preference, I wish it were more. Kill off whoever you want, but make me care about it in a way that isn't just raising the kill count of the threat itself. Let characters discover something new about the threat that we haven't seen before. Let certain characters have multiple connections with each other with how events domino effect and in a horror book, at least this is what I think, when the plot has a bunch of chapters that are just basically gore porn for the carnivorous rat swarm concept, like I could write that because that isn't really plot. It's story building in the sense that more people are dying in the city or near it, all from the same antagonist. But it's also more like a bunch of mini short horror stories with the common element of man-eating rats because there's very little connectivity between some of these events. But that's me nitpicking because please understand that I do like this story, and also plenty of people don't mind that kind of writing at all, that's partly why slashers work. And this book was published in 1974, so this method of horror was pretty normal at the time. Chapter 10 introduces us to yet another group of new people, which was starting to annoy me, but they actually survived the chapter, so that's different. This chapter follows a man named Henry, who doesn't seem like he's all that at first, a rather average guy who you'd normally never even look twice at. He's on a train, it isn't clear if it's the same train from the previous chapter, but it is safe to say that at the least it's a train of the same station. One thing leads to another and there's a fire on the train caused somehow by the rats. I imagine it had to do with some wires being chewed and spewing hazardous sparks. Eventually the train is stopped and people are panicking. Rats slowly start attacking more and more passengers. And I know I sound kind of monotone, but the descriptions used in this chapter, the depictions of horror were astounding. I think with the right movie director, this book could become an incredible horror film. No, not Deadly Eyes. I mean, a better, more modern take. And I'm surprised it hasn't yet. I kind of want to read it to you partially, but this video is never going to end if I keep doing that. Anyway, Henry manages to successfully get out of this burning rat infested train and even escorted two girls, Violet and Jenny, to the exit with him. They almost didn't make it out, but the police had arrived at the station and the large rats that were waiting for Henry and the others scurried away when the officers arrived. Chapter 11 circles back to Harris, our main character, who is back at the school teaching on a seemingly normal Monday. However, one of the kids had left to go to the restroom and came back into the classroom in a panic, stating that there were strange animals at the playground. Upon hearing this, Harris starts closing all the windows and asking some students to help with sealing off some areas. Eventually, the school manages to quietly barricade themselves into safety. However, in the building Harris was in, along with various other 
other students, teachers, and the principal, rats managed to make their way in through the basement where the boiler room was. Luckily, the basement door was shut before too many rats came out, but a handful still managed to bite the principal, dooming him to a painful next 24 hours left of his life. And Harris killed each of these rats afterward with a fire poker, his boots, and even drowned a rat in an aquarium tank. The police and fire department arrived not long after this, and a few of the police dogs broke loose of their leashes and jumped into the horde of rats, which of course ultimately led to their doom. They then decided to use high-powered water hoses against the rats, flooding them out of certain areas as well as just keeping them away from where the children were, and they even used a toxic gas that was harmless to humans to finish off any rats who hadn't drowned. In chapter 12, we stay with Harris, as well as Foskins, who was like the chief of police in that area of London. I don't think that's his official title, it might be undersecretary, but bottom line, he's important. They gather biologists, chemists, virologists, rat experts, military, all kinds of people and corporations together to come up with a solution for the rats, and they decide that they are going to inject bait with the virus and spread this virus amongst the rats. This virus is harmless to humans, but could potentially be harmful to other random animals, in which case they already have a potential vaccine for this and are working on a second one as a safeguard. Also, I think James Herbert must really fucking hate dogs or love the idea of dogs dying in horror because the foundations of this virus plan rests on using puppies as infected live bait. Harris is directly involved with Foskins and his troops now, and they put on these heavy protective suits that are supposed to be resistant to tears and bites from the rats. Harris goes with a few groups to point out certain areas of Stepney, London, where rats will potentially be gathered, and they go and drop off these, these poor little dogs into certain death. But in all honesty, I like their brutal approach. It's funny to me how people will watch a horror movie, for example, and laugh when the dumb survivor trips on a branch and gets ripped in half by the killer, but then they whine and cry when the dog gets its neck snapped. I mean, I get it, trust me. I understand why, which is precisely why I think it's good. It is effective horror for those kinds of people. It makes you feel bad for the dogs because, you know, dogs can't be manipulative, evil psychopaths. They just want to survive. But the discussion on the weight of the death of a man versus the death of a seemingly innocent animal is a conversation that can wait for another time because I'll be talking about it for way too long. Chapter 13 is pretty short. Basically, London is seemingly winning the fight against the rats after the virus plan turns out to be quite successful. A few people here and there are still reported to be dying, but far less than before. And the now virus-infected rats have a less potent lethality, meaning when you get bit by one of these rats, normally you have 24 hours to live. But with this injection, there were a handful of people who lived for a few weeks after being bit and one person who didn't die at all. In chapter 14, we're with Harris, Foskins, and many others at a sort of party celebrating the extermination of the rats. The chapter ends when Foskins gets a phone call, and this is a long time after the virus idea had been used, and we learn that there had been a major rat attack in North London a complete massacre, suggesting that the rats weren't going to go down so easily. They needed more than just a virus. Chapter 15 takes us to a character named Steven at the scene of this new massacre in a movie theater. As you'd imagine, he lasts in the book for like three pages, but the way James Herbert described the theater massacre was really good, just like the train station scenes. But even better than that, in the same chapter it breaks off to George, who was a zookeeper. He also doesn't last very long, dying at the end of the chapter, which I was slightly annoyed at, but slightly not. You see, this book is super fast paced and constantly spoils the reader with blood and death almost every single chapter. The problem with this is that the main character is only the focus of like half of the chapters and the rest are filled with random other characters who rarely ever make it to the end of the chapter, which like I said, doesn't do a lot for the plot in my opinion. That being said, Chapter 15 was a wild card, the first four or so pages being about the theater massacre with Steven and how he dies, and then in the same chapter we get an incredibly described zoo scene. I mentioned that James Herbert likes to kill off dogs, I think he just knows that the reader usually has a soft spot for animals in general, because in this chapter we see giraffes, gorillas, cheetahs, panthers, 
all kinds of animals tossed into chaos as rats invade the zoo. And at the end of this chapter, George is desperately trying to release these animals that he loves, and a fair amount of them get free, but he ends up at the cage of the cheetah. He pleads for it to come with him to safety, and this fucking cheetah rips him to pieces. Imagine the sounds of being in a zoo where every single animal is in distress from giant rats trying to eat them. And the other zookeeper said screw that the moment they knew it was the rats. George was the only one who tried to free some of the animals, but he didn't take into account how a situation that chaotic would make dangerous predatory animals hard to reason with. Overall it might be my favorite chapter, and it has nothing to do with the main character at all. However, I guess I could get tired of having an unrealistically heroic protagonist who is just your everyday art teacher, so it is good that this story mixes it up and uses other characters, but I just wish they had more importance other than filling rat bellies. In chapter 16, it skips a little into the future, and various organizations have come together with the government to completely evacuate London. It was kind of impossible to find a spot for everyone from London to stay, and so they made it a protocol that if you are caught on the streets of London without permission, you get arrested. This at least prompted those who stayed back to stay in their homes and try to be safe, and it also lessened the looting. Now, with London being evacuated, they have a plan to use a special kind of ultrasonic sound waves to lure rats to their death. At this time, protective clothing has been mass produced, the city is jam packed with military and security on all fronts, and Harris is still involved with Foskin's group of officials along with Howard, who was the one who came up with the virus idea, and although it failed, it didn't fail entirely. It still did its damage, but they had hoped it would do more. Foskins now is also in a troubled state because he was forced to resign from being undersecretary, and he took all the blame from the virus plan failing because he also took all the credit when it seemed to have worked at first. The chapter ends with Foskins going off on his own to a certain house that I guess he thinks the nest is at. It kind of glosses over this, and it's also abrupt and kind of out of place, but regardless, Harris decides to go after him despite Judy begging him not to. The final chapter, chapter 17, shows Harris going down into this house after Foskins, and apparently this was the house of a certain zoologist who bred an off-island rat with others, and this is seemingly the source of this chaos. Harris finds Foskins dead, with a bloody axe in his hand, two dead rats nearby, and a couple of them feasting on his body. Harris slowly finds out from more and more evidence that this certainly had been the lair and the origin of London's suffering, and after he found Foskins, the rats that were eating Foskins attacked Harris. Harris barely survives this attack, and I know I'm keeping it brief, but it's actually a really well written sequence. He gets scratched up and even bitten, but he also decapitates a rat with the axe and goes on an enraged frenzy. He passes out from, be it exhaustion, terror, blood loss, all of the above, it isn't quite clear, but when he wakes up, he finds a horrible abomination huge creature, bigger than the already oversized rats, sluggish and pale, covered in thin white fur with its pinkish gray skin mostly showing. Harris approaches this beast while shuddering in fear, and the so-called mutated rat is kinda too obese to attack him. It also had two heads, but the smaller head had no eyes or anything, just a mouth weird lumps. Harris hacks this thing into pieces with the axe until he is basically drenched in blood, and the book ends with him just leaving the house and going back into the street. It doesn't give too much of a cliffhanger or tease for a sequel, but it does leave a lot of questions that the sequel answers of course. The main question I had was, what the hell was the giant pale rat? But as the book Rats More Cunning Than Man described to me, there have been historical accounts that mostly child up to folklore about a king rat that was bigger than the rest, nastier, uglier, and white. This James Herbert novel even says once when describing this creature that it was like the king of the vermin. So personally, that was the way I took it, the killing of the king of the rats. Also similar to the Ratman game, there are two variants, the oversized black rats and the even larger white ones. But aside from the king of rats, there's also a gnarly phenomenon called rat kings, which is when a group of rats gets tangled in a knot of their own tails.
The term rat king doesn't mean a king rat, but rather it's a phenomenon where multiple rats get tangled at the tail. Although if you look up rat king, you might find some artworks of a literal king rat, as in a rodent monarch. But historically speaking, it should refer to a cluster of rats connected at the tail. Sometimes the tails are knotted by an entanglement of hair or a sticky substance such as sap or gum. This phenomenon is also commonly associated with Germany, hence the popular term Rattenkönig. In this video, there's also two toy Totally different rat-themed horror games, both called Rat and Konig, which just means Rat King in German. I'll get to that later on though. The earliest report of rat kings comes from 1564, and most examples are formed from black rats, aka the scientific term ratus ratus. Specimens of purported rat kings are kept in some museums. The Museum Mauritianum in Altenburg, Thuringia shows the largest well-known mummified rat king, which was found in 1828 in a miller's fireplace at Buchheim. It consists of 32 rats. Alcohol preserved rat kings are shown in museums in Hamburg, Gottingen, Hamelin, Stuttgart, Strasbourg, and Nantes. I apologize if I butchered most of those names. I probably did. I don't know how to pronounce German cities. Anyway, a rat king found in 1930 in New Zealand, displayed in the Otago Museum in Dunedin, was composed of immature black rats whose tails were entangled by horsehair. A rat king discovered in 1963 by a farmer at Rukven, Netherlands, as published by cryptozoologist M. Schneider, consists of seven rats. All of them were killed by the time they were examined. X-ray images show formations of callus at the fractures of their tails, which suggests that the animals survived for an extended period of time with their tails tangled. Sightings of the phenomenon in modern times, especially where the specimens are alive, are very rare. One 2005 sighting comes from an Estonian farmer in Saru of the Voroma region. Many of the rats and the specimen, now part of the collection at the University of Tartu Museum of Zoology in Estonia, were alive. In 2021, a living rat king of five mice was caught on video and untangled to save the mice near Stravropol, Russia. On October 20th, 2021, a live rat king of 13 rats was found in Polvama, Estonia. The rat king was brought to Tartu University and humanely euthanized because the rats had no way of freeing themselves. Before that, scientists were able to film the rat king alive. Apparently, the rat king will be added to the Tartu University Museum of Zoology collection. So, what a fascinating phenomenon, right? I like this concept so much that I even have a song called Rat King, which has a lyric video out right Right now. This song is from my upcoming album called I Lure Rot, which includes themes of Eastern philosophical ideas about death, as well as concepts of filth, nihilism, decay, entropy, and utter blackness. Interwoven throughout many songs on this project is the theme of rats or rodent filth, and in my Rat King song, I kind of blend the idea of a king rat and a rat king. The idea of constantly being tugged in all directions when at the core is a horrific ball of putridness. I'm almost certain I have ADD and I start many projects before finishing the first and I often can feel my interest in subjects be yanked toward different things. Not just interest but beliefs and ideas as well. It's not that I can't retain beliefs and ideas and learn from them. Of course I do that. It's more like the more I learn being a sort of jack of all trades, the more my opinion shifts and changes dramatically. It's never 10 steps forward, it's one step forward forward, two steps back, three steps right, four steps left. This idea of a rat king, though, is not exclusive to rats. Apparently, there is such a thing as a squirrel king, too. There have been instances where they were found alive, and veterinarians have had to separate them as the squirrels could potentially starve or be eaten by a predator. A squirrel king of six squirrels stuck together with pine sap was also found in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, in June 2013. In 2018, five juvenile gray squirrels were found in Wisconsin, U.S. Some 
surrounding nice material grass and plastic got further entangled with them and the knot caused some tissue damage to their tails. So it isn't exclusive, but I imagine it's only rats, squirrels, and maybe some other rodent that has nests and easily tangleable tails. But what I like about this concept is the metaphorical aspect. Imagine if you and a handful of other strangers were forced to live life tied to one another by a rope that you couldn't cut without killing yourself. As an art experiment, Linda Montano and Teqing Tse decided to spend an entire year with an 8 foot rope connecting them to each other. This was a type of art experiment and they actually made a rule never to touch each other during the entire year. This is called the rope piece. Teqing Tse himself has done many crazy art pieces that are similar in the sense that they're like performance art. He has another one where he punched in a clock every single hour for a whole year. I think he was off by a few minutes here and there, but succeeded for the most part. And this is all documented. And you thought you were interesting with your aesthetics and style. Anyway, the rope piece is similar to, but not exactly fully grasping the concept of Rat Kings. But being physically connected in this sense is a very thought-provoking concept. If they wanted to do anything, go anywhere, they had to mutually respect, understand, and agree with one another. I suppose you could say that conjoined twins have something similar. Perhaps a two-headed person might feel similar. I don't know the full science on such deformities, but imagine if one head only was a head that could think, eat, talk, whatever, and the other brain controlled the whole body. Imagine that. I think in most cases, though any case is rare, a conjoined twin with two heads but one body would have a neurological connection regardless. Perhaps one controls the left side, the other the right side, and they're just instantaneously coordinated because their brains are somewhat linked. There are many different types of these extreme deformities, whether two people are conjoined from the top of their skull, or if they have no legs and are just connected at the waist. There's a lot of crazy possibilities. Imagine how one of them feels when their conjoined other is not cooperating. An American horror story in the season of Freak Show, there is a conjoined twin named Bet and Dot Tattler. One ends up killing the other with a pair of scissors, but this causes a major problem. Now one head is controlling the whole body, with a second dead head resting on the same pair of shoulders. Imagine how that feels laying down with your rotting twin inches away from you. Imagine what thoughts you would have, what things you would hear when such a link is only halfway severed. This show, of course, is fictional, but this thing could happen, so it's not impossible. But to circle back to actual Rat Kings, there's a reason they're called that. As a cryptid, the mythology tells of a rat leader, a king naturally, that demands to sit high atop a throne of lower, peasantly rats. This mangled nest of lesser rodents becomes a living dominion of filth representing the twisted and evil nature of the one king sitting high atop his suffering legacy. This cryptid story is also German. The story initially spread across Europe in the late 1500s during an era of reformation in Germany after the rise of Lutherism and a peasant's rebellion in 1524. Apparently, commoners in Europe weren't looking too favorably towards the ruling class and the idea of a rat king, or Rattenkönig, resonated amongst the populace that thought rulers were exploiting their sovereignty. Martin Luther was quoted famously as saying, finally there is the Pope, the kind of rats right at the top. And the metaphor stuck. Eventually, when the first real rat king phenomenons were found, they were given this name because of that mystical aura of that idea. But now that I've completely plagued your minds with rodent nightmares, why stop here? The next thing I want to talk about is a game called Rat and Konish, where you play as a rat with your tail connected to the tail of your dead brother rat. Ooh, spicy looking. Ratin Kunich. Let's get it. Heavy atmosphere. Mama rat feeding her babies. Ah, uh, they're tangled.
Oh, fuck. So that's my dead brother. Wow, this ambient is heavy. Come on, come on. How do I, um... There we go, Jesus fucking Christ. we in some kind of sewer system? Can't get up there. Ow. Was there a point? Oh my god. Somehow I did a thing. Come on, brother. What should I name you? Orlando. Come on, Orlando. Jesus fucking Christ. It took forever. So... Do I have to, uh... Um, um, somehow, like... Oh my god. This is gonna get on my nerves if this is how this game's gonna be. Yes. I'm the best ever, obviously. And if you couldn't tell by my voice, I'm actually sick right now, but I still wanted to get something done. And fuck, I missed that jump. I suck at games. <laughs> it missed it twice in a row. This is gonna be terrible to watch. I apologize. I wonder what the red square there is for. If anything. What? Oh no. Don't tell me that I have to like... Slide... <laughs> my dead brother... Over it. Okay, I think this is what you do. I think. Yeah, but now how the fuck am I gonna... How the, how the fuck am I gonna get him back? Okay, good. It's not like he'll still stay. Can I swing him over? No, I don't think I can. Come on. Holy shit, that lunged me back all the way. No. Okay, good, 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 good. Come on. You can see the maggots on his face and shit. They're moving. That's not just bones. But yeah, I am sick. I don't have the bubonic plague. Although right now I kind of wish I did. No, I have fucking COVID actually. Or I had. I am recovering. This is gnarly. I like the art though. Is that the stomach growls of a hungry brother? Just beautiful noises that you hear every day. What in the funkus? I'm not exactly sure 
what specifically is supposed to be going on here. Strange storytelling. Am I in a garbage factory? These are like... Like I'm at a dump? Is that where I'm at? We'll keep this in front of me. For safety reasons. But this is like... This reminds me of the cubed... Like with how they would crush cars and shit. Ah, ah, no, no, come on, brother, come on, we're okay, don't go down that way. There might be fire down there, it's bright. Oh, fuck, it moves, it moves, oh boy. No, fucking hell, man, fucking hell. Okay, come on. Jesus, fucking. Oh no, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> Fuck, I'm so dead. Just kill me, I don't want to deal with it. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. No! Damn it, this. I'm gonna die a lot in this game. I don't have the patience. My brother rat is really getting on my nerves. I wonder, would they ever chew the knot out? Like, could you, could rats live without the end of their tail? Or is it vital for like balance? I will say, I know that it's a platforming puzzle game, but the controls are not great. And it's not that I'm like a terrible video game player, even though I kinda am. It's more that it's it's kind of too simple. It's like not enough. Whoa. Let's go, brother rat. We can make it. All of our bones just breaking instantly. We got this. We got this. Wait, I did this wrong. Uh oh. How the fuck do I... Did I do it right? Oh no. Go left! Holy shit, my tail is long. Come on. Come on, go! <laughs> yes, 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 yes. This way. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, I have an issue here. Oh god. Oh, come on. No, I'm just, I'm just doing bad is all. I'll, uh, come on. Fucking maggot magnet, let's go. What is that noise? What do I do here? I saw Buzzsaw, is that the end of it? Did we get separated finally?
Wow. So this game was developed by Organzola, and I believe this is the first horror game they've done. With that said, I must say this was an enjoyable experience for me, and it was also free. So similar to Ratman, this was more of an artwork than a product. However, if anyone wants to, you can technically pitch in some money when you download the game to help the developers out. The horror elements of this game are kind of strange. It's not your average type of horror. In fact, the heaviest part of the game was the storytelling, which was done through its beautiful cutscenes, but gameplay-wise, it's more emotional than scary. I mean, it's a puzzle platformer where you carry your dead rat brother, who I named Orlando, with the end of your tail. You two are connected, thus you form a Rat King or Rat in Konish. The controls were a little wonky, but I did get used to them fairly quickly. I suppose it would be nice, however, if the game was a little bit longer, because right when I was getting a hang of the controls, it was pretty much over. But also keep in mind that's not entirely the game's fault. I was sick and tired while playing, so it's possible my brain just didn't allow things to click properly. This game is super simple, but it does what it needs to. In many ways, sometimes less is more, and this is one example of how that might work. If this game had no cutscenes at all though, it wouldn't hit as hard, and it definitely wouldn't be as popular, so that's a very strong element in this game. The 2D platforming itself is okay, it's not bad, it's not great, it just kind of was, but I think the driving forces of this game are the storytelling cutscenes, even though I got lost in some of it, and the concept itself of being tied to your own dead brother rat. One last little nitpick is that some of the ambient was extremely loud, but I don't know if that was done on purpose or not. The ambient itself was decent, it was alright, but in some cases I found myself struggling to talk over how loud it was just so you guys could hear me. But that's really only a problem for people like me and not for the average player who isn't going to be recording while they play. All in all, not a bad game. Again, it's free. You can find the download link to this in the description of this video down there with Ratman and the other two that I have yet to talk about. But before I continue this theme of Rat Kings or Rat and Konish, let's go over the second horror novel in the Rats trilogy by James Herbert called Lair, and then we'll circle back to this later on. It'll all connect in the end, I promise. Things will make sense. I'm giving you various angles of vermin filth. That is what this video is. Lair was published in 1979, five years after its predecessor. The book is divided into five segments, Prologue, Signs, Onslaught, Lair, and Epilogue. Prologue is about half a page long and basically describes the birth of the giant white rat that was at the end of the first book. Then in chapter 1 of Signs, we are introduced to a farmer named Ken Woolard who lives in the countryside away from the city. He has cats, not as pets per se, but more as working animals that he fed to keep rats and mice away. Of course, these were regular rodents and not the giant ones. However, Ken soon finds the dismembered paw of one of his cats, and he initially thinks that a fox or a dog had done it, but the idea that THE rats from the first book had done it whispers to him from the back of his mind. He then follows a gory trail of bloody scratch marks, suggesting the cat got dragged away while while still alive, and it leads him to the corpse of his cat. Then, in the same chapter, we move on to a character named Terry who was playing with his children. They were playing with a soccer ball and it got kicked into a bushy undergrowth. Terry's youngest child crawled in after it, and it's described that she saw a furry creature and thought it was a dog, but it clearly was a rat given, you know, what this trilogy is about. She even reached her hand out to it felt the hot breath of this giant rat, thinking it was just an innocent little puppy, and then Terry calls to her, and she retreats her hand, and this is kind of the end of this segment. We then move on to Charles Dennison, the third character switch in the same fucking chapter, which kind of annoyed me a little bit, but when you think about it, Stephen King does the same thing where he'll have a chapter that is two pages long with one character in it, and then have multiple chapters like this back to back to back. 
back, all with new characters. James Herbert isn't doing it much differently, it's just all in one chapter with obvious breakaways. I realize that now. So, Charles Denison is with his horse in the woods, and he says something interesting. He says that the gray squirrel population has gotten noticeably smaller, and no one knows why. As the reader, you can only assume that it's because of the rats. So he's just on his horse, you know, trotting through the woods until his horse gets startled at an unseen creature in the forestry thicket of leaves. The horse gets so scared that it bolts off in the opposite direction, with Charles holding on for dear life, praying that the horse doesn't step into some hole and twist its ankle and kill them both or anything. The horse carries Charles out into an open area and feels safer. The chapter ends when Charles then sees a white deer, which in that area is incredibly rare, but ultimately he's familiar with a lot of folklore belief and knows that seeing a white deer like this, missing from the area it should be at, is considered a bad omen. In chapter 2, we get introduced to Lucas Pender, who works at the Rat Kill organization. We learn that this is four years after the initial terrors of the first book, and that Howard from the first book is in charge of a lot within Rat Kill. Over the past four years, they've been trying to manufacture new and improved ultrasonic machinery as well as new poisons because rats adapt very quickly. If they use one particular poison too gently and with too low of a dose, they can build an immunity to it, and the rats also can become used to certain frequencies if given enough time. At the end of the chapter, Lucas Pender is being sent by Howard on a mission to investigate the Epping Forest on the outskirts of East London, which is where, in the previous chapter, Charles Denison was riding his horse that got spooked by a rat. Chapter 3 introduces us to yet another character, Reverend John Matthews. John is at a funeral during the burial and feels like the forested terrain around the graveyard was watching him. Then it breaks off into another character named Brian, and by this point I'm already annoyed because within 30 pages of the book, we've swapped perspectives with six people, and I don't even know who the main protagonist is yet. While I do think it is important not to have a main character with too much illogical plot armor, having too many characters is a big problem. But I guess at least these characters haven't died in the same chapters they were introduced in like the first book. However, this new character in chapter 3, Brian is also kind of a waste of space. Hear me out. We learn that Brian is a bit of an odd person. He has an obsession with flashing his genitals at unsuspecting women. He doesn't physically hurt anybody, but he's definitely a creep. In this chapter, he stalks a woman through Epping Forest, and right as he is about to flash the poor, unsuspecting lady, they both get scared away by a mysterious rustling noise, obviously from a rat. Then the chapter is not over yet, but it breaks away into yet another perspective. My biggest problem problem with the first book was that the main character was only the focus for like half the book, and the rest was full of meaningless deaths. You can't go into detail about a person's backstory in a chapter just to kill them off without any important connections other than the antagonist. But I don't know if this is better or worse, but now we're jumping new person to new person and they aren't dying, so really I honestly feel bored reading this because there's no reason for me to care still, there's no finite direction, and so far are less horror than the first book, but I remember that since I was patient with the first one, it did pay off, so as of me reading the third chapter, I can say it has a very sloppy beginning plot-wise, but I need to read more before any solid opinions can form because I'm kind of writing this script as the chapters go. After the segment about the character Brian in chapter 3, staying in the same chapter, we move on to Jenny Hanmer, who was a tutor for the students of a school that had organized a day out at Epping's Forest Conservation Center. Jenny accompanies the class of children and their teacher in the outdoors and is showing the kids the various life forms in a specific pool, such as various types of beetles, worms, other insects, and algae, and what have you. Eventually, they notice three strange-looking rodents swimming across the pool, and they don't really recognize how large they actually are until the rats get out of the water. The sight was so disturbing that several students had begun to cry, and yet the rats just scurried away into the woods while Jenny and the teacher tried to comfort the kids, which is the end of chapter 3. Chapter 4 brings us back to Lucas Pender, the rat kill worker, who was being sent to investigate the same area, which I actually really like because finally we have two different characters that connect from different chapters that give me a reason to give a shit. 
Pender is in a meeting with a man named Milton, who is rather ominously considered the warden of the Epping Forest Conservation Center. Milton is the one who called Howard for the investigation, hence Pender's reason to be there. Milton tells Pender that some of the animal cages there had been broken into and their food was all eaten, but strangely the animals were left unharmed. These animals were also so scared at whatever they had seen that they were too traumatized to move from their cages when they could have easily escaped out of the holes that something had bored into the cage wires. They also had found droppings, presumably from rats, and even a hole at the bottom of a door that was reinforced with metal, suggesting something very powerful had to have done it. And before Milton can explain much further, the door opens and Jenny interrupts this meeting, saying that she had seen the rats. Milton doesn't believe her entirely at first because apparently there had been so many false alarms of rat sightings out of fear and paranoia, optical illusions, and misinterpreted shadows. Nevertheless, Lucas Penn goes with Jenny back to where she had seen the rats to make sure. When they get there, they don't find any rats, but they find a dead stoat hanging in a tree. Pender suspects it was trying to climb to get away from something, and had been torn open and soaked in blood, still steaming, meaning it had to have been recent. Soon after, Jenny finds a hollowed out tree absolutely drenched in blood, and riddled with little pieces of meat and bones, unrecognizable to whatever animal they belong to. They surmise that perhaps there had been a whole family of stoats and the rats slaughtered them all, or that this was a spot where rats dragged off whatever prey to in order to feast upon them there. The chapter ends with them both heading back to the center to report what had happened, and I must admit, the way James Herbert inscribed the feel of dread and ominous weight of a silent forest was done excellently here. In chapter 5, the perspective still follows Pender, and after his investigation of the danger levels of Epping Forest, he and Jenny believe that it should be evacuated and quarantined off, but the superintendent and the other officials in charge of the conservation center are very hesitant because of how much it would cost to actually evacuate everyone. The whole chapter gets a little complicated to explain, but it's not totally unreasonable for them to be hesitant. So it tosses the characters into a dilemma of what may be an incredibly expensive false alarm or saving the lives of possibly soon-to-be victims living in the Epping Forest. This is the last chapter of Signs, so now we're moving on to the Onslaught segment for Chapter 6. Chapter 6 brings us to Alan and Babs. Babs is a middle-aged mother who's been married for 15 years, and Alan is slightly younger, also married. Despite the families these two have, they're drawn to each other via lust and have countless affairs. And when I read through a sex scene, I usually expect it to be over quickly, unless the characters are super important, but this chapter had like three whole pages of a single sex scene that was stretched way too far, because as you probably could have guessed, Babs and Alan both die after a few pages. However, the way they die, out in the woods having sex, is described in such a brutal nature that I love it for the barbaric and gruesome gore, but it feels like James Herbert is horrible at character development. He puts a lot of elbow grease into describing the backstories of characters who are about to die in the same chapter, but puts shamefully low effort into making the main characters interesting. Nevertheless, the gore is fun. Babs gets some of her toes chomped off and then cowers into a corner while Alan gets devoured. Rats raked his chest away, digging into the bone, ripping him to pieces with blood jetting out of vital arteries. Babs even spent her last moments thinking about her worried kids and husband would be saying, Mom's late again. It's cold, but I'll be honest, it takes a lot of patience to read through some unnecessary bullshit to be rewarded with bloodlust. But I'm reading these for the sake of the video and so that you don't have to. After the part with Babs and Alan, it breaks away into a character named Gordon. Gordon's a supervisor for an orphanage watching over a group of boys that had been spending a week surviving in the woods. Although the word surviving is used loosely because presumably this area of the woods had been pretty desolate of any potential threats, but as you probably could have guessed, that wasn't entirely true. Gordon had been resting in a tent with some of the other kids and had been awakened by a faint scratching noise. He tries to quietly scramble for the flashlight to investigate and even hits 
at the creature's bulging shape in the tent, causing it to temporarily flee. It comes back and claws a hole into the side of the tent before lunging onto Gordon, and there's a whole scene of pure chaos in the tent that I really love. Not necessarily the gory fun of how the rat clung to Gordon's jawbone and stripped his chest of its flesh, but more so the blind panic of the other boys in the tent struggling to get out of their sleeping bags, the flashlights never really aiming directly at the writhing bodies, and even when they caught a glimpse they didn't know what to make of it. It's all nicely executed. But again, the author went into way too much trouble giving backstory for Gordon because he's dead now and I knew him for like 5 pages. Where's the in-depth details on the main character Pender, or even in the first book for Harris. As I keep saying, it's incredibly lacking in that regard. After this bit for Gordon, we return to another character who was introduced early on in the book, that being Reverend John Matthews. By now, the plot formula of James Herbert is super predictable, so it's obvious that in this chapter, John was going to die. However, putting that aside, the way he dies is, as always, really well done. John was walking outside of the church, which I guess has a graveyard either nearby or connected to it. He'd heard some scratching noises near a grave and even heard the sound of something gnawing on wood. In fact, I like this scene so much, let me just quote this for you. The hole was wide and deep, a pit with acute, sloping sides. At the bottom was a mass of squirming, black, furry bodies. He could not recognize the animals at first, for the pit was darkly shadowed, the sun still hidden behind the trees. But as he watched, he began to establish individual shapes. Even then, he wasn't sure what the creatures were. One emerged from the writhing mass, its mouth full of dried meat, and scrambled over the backs of the others towards the side of the pit. Just before the gap it had left behind was closed by other their eager bodies, the vicar saw directly into the damaged coffin. The sight of white broken bones stripped of all flesh made him sink to his knees, bile clogging his throat to be expelled onto the undulating mass below. He wanted to run from the terrible scene, but the convulsions racked his body painfully, causing him to sway precariously, his fingers digging into the soft earth. He knew these creatures now. They were the harpies of his own conscience, come to torment him, letting him know death was not sacrosanct. The body could be further defiled. The Reverend Matthews hadn't noticed the other rats in the graveyard, hidden in the grass, behind the trees, crouching beneath gravestones. Those that had silently watched him into the church grounds, followed his progress along the path of black, evil eyes, creeping forward, their bodies close to the earth. He wasn't aware that they were all around him, moving closer, haunches quivering in anticipation. It took long seconds for him to realize what was happening when the first one bit into his ankle, calmly eating into his flesh without haste or aggression. And by the time he had screamed and struck out at the rat, it was too late for the creature's companions were already launching themselves at his body, landing heavily against him, teeth snapping and claws scratching for a hold, toppling him over, down into the pit among the others who welcomed the new, warm meat and the satiating blood that ran from it. In an effort that was brought about by terror, overriding all pain, he gained his feet and tried to scramble up the steep incline, long black bodies clinging to him and pulling him back, but there was still more waiting for him up there. His hands grabbed at the grass, trying to haul himself from the pit, and the rats bit off his fingers one by one, the small bones proving no problem for the razor sharp incisors. Unable to grip, he slid back down, one foot falling into the open coffin, sinking in the remnants of the old woman's now masticated flesh. One of the creatures followed him down and for a few seconds he gazed into its black eyes, the twitching pink nose only inches away. The rat slid onto him, its jaws opening wide. The vicar's body was smothered by other giant vermin, the pit filling and brimming over with their agitated, struggling bodies, and a scream screams were muffled. He wondered why it took so long to die, for he could feel a rat inside him, one that had eaten its way beneath his ribcage and was now gorging itself on his heart. Surely he should be dead by now. The pain had stopped moments before or had its intensity become subliminal? Why did he still wonder? Why did the questions, the doubts, persist? Surely now there would be an answer, but no revelations came. There was only the awareness that he was being eaten, 
and then he realized his body was dead, that only his thoughts remained, and the rat fed on his brain, its pointed head buried deep into the open skull, swallowing cells and tissue that no longer functioned, the impulses finding no receptors and fading to nothing. Sunlight pushed its way over the treetops and bathed the church and its grounds in a fresh, vibrant glow, but no birds greeted its arrival. The only sound to be heard was a faint scuffling noise from somewhere behind the ancient building. Soon, even that was gone. In Chapter 7, Pender and Charles Dennison, who is a character from earlier on in the book, he works for the Conservation Center, they team up and ask various people who live in Epping Forest if they've seen or heard any unusual activity because Howard and other business officials want yet even more evidence before they evacuate the forest. And in this chapter, Pender spots the overweight pink obese monster that is the two-headed giant king rat of sorts from a distance but he doesn't quite know what it is. He tells Charles and he just laughs at him saying that there's plenty of giant pink pigs from several farmlands in the area. And even seeing a pig is a good sign because it would suggest that the rats in the area, if any, would be low in number due to pigs not taking kindly to rats. However, Pender is still uncertain in his mind because he didn't get a clear look at it and the overall stillness of the forest has been making him paranoid. Everything is hidden behind a curtain of pines and I really like this. I like when horror has ambiguity in regards to the psyche because, in my opinion, that is true psychological horror. Pender isn't certain it was a pig, and he isn't certain it was another kind of monster, but the environment is putting him so on edge that the idea that it was in fact a giant pink abomination keeps whispering to him from the back of his mind. The chapter ends when a speeding car pulls up to both of them and Jenny gets out. She looks terrified and exhausted and exclaims that they both need to get back to the center ASAP because they found something horrible in the old church, which we can assume was the remains of Reverend John Matthews. Chapter 8 takes us back to Brian Mollison, the PE instructor with a weird obsession of flashing people. Between both this segment and the previous bit that included Brian, it's just overall super awkward how much detail James Herbert puts into this weird character. It's definitely interesting, but not at all relatable, unless his general audience are perverted flash freaks. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised considering James was the best-selling British horror writer, but am I being too harsh on his writing, or am I one of the very few who thinks his writing cons outweigh his writing pros. Anyway, Brian Mullison goes out again trying to flash an unsuspecting group of people, including children, and a cop patrolling the forest catches him in the act. The cop chases Brian through the woods until Brian slips into a sort of ditch hidden in shrubbery, and the cop ends up running past, never finding Brian. After the cop disappears, Brian realizes the horror of what exactly he was sitting in. Blood-covered clothing was scattered around with bones nearly picked dry of meat. This causes Brian to break down and cry into his hands, but he doesn't get out of the pit, and honestly, at this point, I was kind of hoping for the rats to find and kill him, but he survives and just sits there crying. Then we break away and return all the way back to farmer Ken Woolard, who was in chapter 1, the guy who found his dead cat. Ken exclaims that two men approached him and were asking questions, one of whom noticeably worked for Rat Kill, meaning that Ken was one of the people that Lucas Pender and Charles Denison questioned during their grid search of Epping Forest inhabitants. Even though Ken had a slight suspicion that some things were definitely off, he exclaims that farmers always have had to deal with rats here in there, and he'd been taking precautions for this by setting traps of rat poison around. He also chalked up the deaths of his cats who were less than pets as fortunate results of attacks by a fox or maybe a badger. Not too long after Pender and Charles had left, Ken hears strange scurrying noises from inside his home. At first he thinks it must be one of the cats that had disappeared and now possibly returned, but when he opens the door, he sees a hellish mass of vermin devouring his dead wife. And again, James Herbert knows how to do gore without a doubt. I mean, from the way the rats ate his wife's wrist tendons, causing her lifeless fingers to open and close, to the way her blank eyes stared directly at Ken with her head being held up only by rats eating under her jaw, Ken becomes furious with a mix of both fear and hatred, and plunges into the writhing mass, kicking and stomping at the rats. But of course, as you probably could have guessed, he also sinks into the pool of blood. 
black bodies. Chapter 9 can be summed up pretty quickly. Pender, Charles, Jenny, and others go back to investigate the churchyard where Reverend John Matthews had died. At this point, Pender is certain that the rats are back, and the police get involved but are told to tell no one that it had actually been the rats. Many people already know about John Matthews' death, but they still want to keep panic levels at a minimum. Pender also exclaims that it's quite strange for rats to dig like this, literally digging up the grave to get to human meat before John even fell in. Pender wants to ask even more farmers if they have seen anything, and he wants to try to triangulate from where there's been evidence of rats to find their lair. In chapter 10, Pender and a bunch of other important people between the higher-ups of the conservation center, police officers, members of Rat Kill, forest inspectors, biologists working for Rat Kill, a lot of people, all gather for an important meeting to decide what exactly they're going to do for the rat problem. They come to the agreement that the lair of the rats could possibly be in the sewers. If the rats are there, then they want to basically use toxic gas throughout the sewers and plug the exits. They also plan to completely evacuate Epping Forest, and they organize different groups with different jobs to cover as much ground in a coordinated fashion as possible. However, the chapter ends when Mr. Whitney Evans, who is like one of the main people in charge of the conservation center, abruptly gets told by one of his assistants that they've just found two more bodies. It turns out that those two bodies were Farmer Ken Woolard and his wife, though there wasn't much of them left. In chapter 11, Pender and Jenny get a bit closer to each other. I'm personally not a fan of how they're intimacy is written, it feels very low effort and uninteresting, but nonetheless it's a thing. It's not the important part of the chapter though. The important part is a very well constructed sequence of horror as the rats break into the conservation center. One of the characters, Jan, gets attacked first and almost dies. Pender saves her, but she is still really messed up. Initially she was looking out of a closed window into the black of the night toward the forest and the window exploded in her face as a rat lunged through. After the top of her spine was exposed, her face mangled and she was choking on her own blood. Rats were breaking in through the windows, and while Pender attended a Jan, another character, Will, was blocking a broken window with a table, trying to hold back invading rats. Eventually, the rats break out of all the windows in that corridor simultaneously, and Will and Pender have to grab the barely alive Jan and get the hell out of there, and Jenny was waiting for them at the end of the corridor. They shut the hallway door behind them, and Jenny says she called the cops, and they can already hear the sirens outside. However, soon after, they realized that the scratching and gnawing sounds from behind the door had stopped, suggesting that the rats, for some reason, had left. In Chapter 12, James Herbert takes us to a boot camp building for police cadets. There's no particular person whom the perspective follows, it's just a large group of cadets who all get woken up one night by the barking and howling of the police dogs. Come to find out that the dogs were barking because of the nearby ducks. I don't know what the building is actually called, but it's like a business farmhouse for ducks that harvest some for their eggs and some for their meat, and all of these ducks were for some reason going crazy, and the dogs at the station could hear them, hence they were going crazy. At first, they had actually thought the duck noises were human screams because, from a distance, sometimes distressed duck calls apparently sound like humans. The sergeant assures them that no, it's just the ducks, but eventually they still investigate, and when they get closer, they realize it was actually human screams. There's a sort of apartment complex that had been swarming with the black rats, and a large group of the cadets could barely believe their own eyes when they saw it. It was mayhem. People were being eaten alive, torn to shreds, gnawed away into red skeletons. Some tried to fight back with makeshift melee weapons, but of course eventually they sank into a pool of vermin. One area of the apartment complex was on fire, causing several burning rats to flee in a squeaking turmoil, along with one person who had also been fleeing the scene on fire. Some of the cadets fired into the black warbling mass of rats, and there were so many that it was impossible to miss. A few cadets were also killed by the rats, trying to run, but the rats still caught up to them. Many lives were lost until finally the rats had had their fill, their bloodlust satiated, and they left the bloodstained apartments, which is where this chapter ends. Chapter 13 brings us back to Pender and the various workers from Rat Kill in protective suits, actively plugging sewer holes in the woods after already filling it with toxic gas. They've placed devices around these sewer tunnels to be able to hear the rats as well, and the rats are panicking, scurrying frantically about underground, and the Rat Kill organization and the others know they have to finish quick before the rats find a way out. 
However, Pender finds a new sewer hole that had not been covered and plugged with cement, so they all quickly try to cover this last new hole. As they're covering this hole, Pender and a few others get the feeling they're being watched. One of them claims they saw movement in the distant trees of the woods, then they all start to see it. The chapter ends with a sort of ambush, rats leaping from overhanging branches onto the group of people who were around that hole. Chapter 14 is one of my favorite chapters in the book because it's just pure relentless chaos. It is full of great ideas ideas and honestly transitions together in a rather cinematic way. Things like Captain Mather, who's in charge of the military squad that was with Ratkill during this operation, making cold but understandable calculations to leave the doomed but still suffering and focus on the suffering but still redeemable. They use this military vehicle as a sort of fortress with multiple soldiers firing out of the back of it and using their bayonets when needed. There's also a really well written scene of a rat up close to Pender's visor clawing at him and gnashing its foul teeth as Pender struggles to escape. Just overall a really damn good chapter. A lot of people get killed too. I think only Pender and one other person from Ratkill escaped with the soldiers. It is said that they did rescue other men, but it didn't specify if they were Ratkill or other soldiers or police or what. Chapter 15 basically describes the aftermath of those who were wounded from the ambush of the rats. Fortunately, it was only at that one spot that the rats ambushed humanity. The rest of the holes were basically rat-free so they released the gas into the sewers. They heard them squealing in pain and scrambling for a way out with their microphones they had placed underground. A few of the holes that were left unplugged still had soldiers waiting at the ends of them with flamethrowers. So despite the lives lost from the initial ambush, the operation seems like an overall successful counterattack for humanity. We also learn a bit more about Pender from someone named Lemon. No, not that Lemon. Spelled like this. And Lemon worked for Ratkill with Howard before Pender. Pender had started. It turns out that Pender had actually lost his parents during the initial outbreak of vermin in London that was covered in the first book. I like this a lot because I've said that James Herbert has been very poor with his character development, but now I have some actually interesting backstory for Pender, being his motivation for working at Ratkill. Even though it's seemingly nothing more than fiery revenge, it's still something. Other than this, we know very little about Pender, still. But I'll take what I can get because we know very little about about anybody at all in this book, honestly. In chapter 16, we learn that Thornton and Lemon have been keeping a secret from the other officials. Granted, the reader already knows about the secret from the first book, that secret being the existence of the giant, white, monstrous, two-headed, hairless, sluggish creature that are essentially a second variant of the rats. Lemon exclaims that a teacher named Harris, who was the main character in book one, had hacked the original white monstrous rat to pieces with an axe, and shamefully so because they wished it were still alive to study. And they also say that the reason they didn't tell anybody about the corpse of this beast was to not cause any unnecessary panic. The reason they let Pender in on this secret is because, based on his dedication to the cause of purging these dangerous vermin, they can most definitely trust him. However, James Herbert doesn't exactly tell us what specifically the top secret plan with Pender is. After this meeting, he goes back to his own place to sleep and Jenny wants to go with him. Jenny and Pender have been getting closer and closer of the chapters, and in this chapter they have sex for a very intimate few pages. After they finish, Pender says that he isn't allowed to say exactly what he was told to do regarding the giant rats, and he kind of leaves it at that. But luckily the chapter doesn't end there. James Herbert skips ahead to the operation itself, of which I quote, Both Pender's and Captain Mather's limbs were still stiff from the bruising their bodies had taken in the rat attack, and they found their descent awkward. The protective suits and oxygen cell on their backs, impeding their movement even further. Pender stood at the bottom of the ladder and swung the powerful torch he was carrying in a wide arc. A feeling of revulsion swept over him when he saw the heaped bodies, many with bloated stomachs, the result of a buildup of internal gases, others with jaws wide in silent agony, their legs extended stiffly into the air, their skin flaking and rotting. Mather joined him and regarded the nightmare scene with equal disdain, sweeping his torchlight into both directions of the tunnel. I wanted to quote that because I just really love the imagery. The chapter really ends after this narratively compacted operation, meaning Pender and Captain Mather were scouting the sewer tunnels before they allowed soldiers to enter for about six hours, but the scene itself is written in like a single page, which isn't a bad thing, just a bit abrupt, and they say they found nothing down there, nothing other than the corpses of the black rats. In chapter 17, we circle back to Charles Denison,
in for the first few pages, and as he's doing his daily ritual of scouting and managing Epping Forest, he comes across several deer that appear to have been slaughtered by the rats. It then breaks away to Pender, who is also going out into the woods with Vic Whitaker. They stumble upon the same house, or mission, or I don't know the right term for it, but it's the same place Pender and Charles Denison were at before when Pender saw something weird out of the corner of his eyes, and Charles said it was just a pig. When Vic Whitaker and Pender investigate this place once more, they find that all the pigs had been dead, and that they'd been dead for a while. They see one of the seemingly dead pigs start to move. Turns out it was a rat burrowing around its insides. When they get too close, it lunges at Vic and nearly kills him, but he manages to keep it away from his face as it squirmed in his hands. After a long struggle, Pender has a hold of it and pins it down, while Vic repeatedly smashes it with a brick. After the incident, they basically say fuck this and start leaving, and on their way out of the woods, they notice strange shapes swarming the trees. A horde of rats begins to ambush them the same way they ambushed Pender before he was filling a sewer hole with gas. The chapter pretty much ends with them screaming run. For chapter 18 and 19, I'm gonna blend the two together because they're both of the same sort of scene. So after being cut off by the ambush of rats, they have no choice but to return to the house. Due to the sheer amount of rats scuttling after them, they have to climb halfway dilapidated segments of this abandoned forest manor, which Vic has a very rough time with because in chapter 17, the rat that nearly killed him tore away the tendons in his hand during the scuffle. They climb and climb, but the rats keep finding ways to reach them until they're basically cornered. They use loose clumps of concrete and bricks to chuck at rats climbing after them, but eventually they run out and it looks pretty hopeless. The rats find a way to reach the floor above them and jump down on top of them, but they don't immediately die. Instead, they fall backward and the floor beneath them gives in, falling even further onto a sea of bristling bodies frantically scurrying about in panic. Because of all the commotion and confusion that was bestowed upon the rats after that whole section collapsed on top, Top of them, even though Vic and Pender were practically being crowded with rats, they didn't attack just yet. But unfortunately, the confused state of the rats only lasted temporarily, and while Pender was trying to keep completely still, Vic was moving around a lot and panicking, and eventually the rats got to him. And as I've said before, James Herbert is incredibly talented when it comes to describing gore, and the way Vic died was just chef's kiss. They rip him to shreds and tear the skin from his very skull, and he describes the look of his red gaping mouth suffering a silent scream of agony. As more rats topple over him and Pender could no longer see Vic under the blanket of vermin, little geyser sprays of blood gush out between the gaps. It's very well written, and these are two of my favorite chapters. After Vic is clearly dead, two of the giant pinkish and grossly obese rats waddle from the shadows, and then they begin feasting on Vic's body shoving the other rats out of the way. All Pinder can really do is sit and watch. Chapter 20, the final chapter, is a pretty decent ending for Lair. Pinder manages to escape out of the house, but only barely. Captain Mather, Jenny, and all kinds of other people working for the military and the conservation center of the woods came with full force and with lots of firepower. But I think it's important to mention the pain Pinder goes through in trying to escape and the self-discipline, motivation, whatever you want to call it. He turns into a fucking monster, clawing his way just to survive and it's just well written. The ending itself is pretty simple, Pender lives and the military carpet bombs the house that had been the lair of the rats, but of course in the epilogue we get a hint that it is not over. In the perspective of Brian Mollison, who was my least favorite character in the book, he sees a couple of starving rats heading toward the city, and that's kind of it, foreshadowing the third book, Domain. And I will cover Domain in this video, and I know that these book segments are super long, and thus this video will end up huge. I don't really expect anyone to watch this in one sitting, beginning to end. I also wouldn't be surprised if some people only watch the video game segments, that's okay too. Or maybe someone's favorite part are these three book breakdowns, I have no idea. But I apologize for the confused people watching because this video is a big Rat King clump in itself. But I like providing variety and a shitload of content packed into one video, I didn't want to do a series of rat themed crap because then it's less value per video. So in this journey of repugnant negativity, our next stop is a place where rats are actually deemed holy. We're looking all the way over in India now, at the Karni Mata Temple. 
Going forward, I apologize for mispronouncing any Indian names. Apparently, I'm not well versed in how German nor Indian locations are correctly pronounced. But anyways, the Karni Mata Temple of Deshnok, also known as Mad Deshnok, is a prominent Hindu temple dedicated to Karni Mata at the town of Deshnok, located 30 kilometers south of Bikaner in Rajasthan. It has become the most important pilgrimage site for devotees of Charani Sagatis after access to Hinglaj was restricted following the partition of India. The temple is also a popular destination for tourists and pilgrims and is renowned both in India and internationally as the Temple of Rats due to the numerous black rats known as Kaaba which are considered holy and treated with utmost care by the devotees. This is sometimes upheld as exemplary of an environmentally conscious Hindu ethos. The temple draws visitors from across the country for blessings as well as curious tourists from around the world. The temple was originally constituted 500 years ago, around 1530 CE, after the Mahaprayan of Karnimata. It initially began with the inner sanctum covered by the dome and grew in size with constructions being added by the devotees throughout the centuries. So what does all of this mean? What is Karnimata? What is the legend? Karnimata was an embodiment of Shakti, which is Hindu for power and is like the goddess responsible for universal creation. And so this embodiment of Shakti remained celibate, therefore she married her younger sister to her husband, Dipaji, for the continuation of his line. From her, Dipaji had four sons, the youngest of whom was Lakshman. Karniji cared for them as her own children. One day, Lakshman drowned in a lake nearby Kolayat while bathing. Her younger sister pleaded to Karnimata to bring Lakshman back to life. Thus, Karnimata lifted the body with her hands and brought it to where the Murti, or inner sanctum, is now, closed the doors and said not to open them. She went to the god of death, Yamraj, and demanded for Lakshman to be returned to life. The god of death queried, if so, how will the cycle of rebirth work? By what law will it move? Karnimata thus declared that her family will not come to Yamraj anymore. Wherever I live, they will live. When they die, they will stay with me. Then, Karnimata chose the embodiment of the Kaaba, so that when human Charanas, which is a caste in India, from her lineage die, they will be reborn as Kaaba and live near her within the temple, and when Kaaba die, they will again be reborn as human Charanas. In this manner, Charan avatar differs from this general understanding of Hindu rebirth in that Jati is maintained across births despite being in a differently embodied form. So I know all that still sounds a little complicated, and it kinda is. With Hindu mythology, there's a lot of technical words you have to get used to because India is very different from the US. Now, in the temple complex resides an approximately 20,000 Kaaba who are cared for by the temple staff and workers who consider them as kin. The Kaaba reside and move in spaces throughout the inner temple complex, including within the main temple, the kitchen, near the massive iron pots used to make halwa, and the various side rooms rooms, and on the rooftop. In each space, there are different food items available for the Kaaba. Those nearest to the Murti of Kanimata feed on the various forms of prasad, offered to the goddess such as ladu, nuts, coconut, and sugar crystals, as well as milk, grain, fruits, vegetables, and even liquor. For the Kaaba on the rooftop and near the iron pots, their diet consists mainly of grains, fruits, vegetables, roti, and water. Therefore, Kaaba of Deshnok Temple have access to a rich variety of resources and are provided protection from predators like cats by their human Charan kinsmen. It is observed that Kaaba have become habituated to human interaction and touch. They scurry across and lie in the devotee's lap or perch on their shoulders while they are sitting in the temple. They eat from the hands of visitors and from the same thali or plate as the Charan workers in the kitchen. Eating food that has been nibbled on by the Kaaba is considered to be a high honor. Temple rules state that if you accidentally step on one of the rats and kill it, you must replace it with a rat made of solid silver or gold. So again, very different types of beliefs than what my average audience is probably used to, but I find it so fascinating. Where I live, if a rat was even in the same room as any left out food, we usually would throw that food away or be very weary if we still eat it. But in this temple, it's considered an honor to eat food 
that was nibbled on by these rats. Also, out of all the thousands of Kaaba rats in the temple, there are a few white Kaaba, which are considered to be especially holy. They are believed to be the manifestations of Karnimanta herself and her four sons. Citing them is a special blessing, and visitors put in extensive efforts to bring them forth, offering prasad, which is a sweet, holy food. Once again, we see this dynamic of black rat and white rat. I mean, technically, albino rats are more rare than black rats. It's a genetic mutation that has been reported in less than 2% of the species. So it makes sense that in this temple, they are considered even more holy. And as for worship, the temple is open to the public early in the morning at 4 o'clock. The priests perform mangla arti and offer bog, special food, in worship. Devotees make offerings to the rats which roam about the temple in large numbers and are considered auspicious. Offerings include cheese and sweets. There are also bowls of milk around the temple for the rats to enjoy. There are two kinds of offerings made. The dwar bent is attributed to the priests and the workers, while the kalash bent is utilized for the temple maintenance and development. Many worshippers believe the rat's saliva has healing properties and will share food and milk with the rats. So that ties in with the holiness of eating food that was nibbled on. It's a very stark difference to how we see rats in America. However, we gotta keep in mind that for the most part, rats are pests to us. It's not really their fault, but it has boiled down to us or them. As I said, like in New York City, for example, where the subways are sometimes infested with rats, technically speaking, this land was their domain before it was ours. Rats on their own aren't entirely dangerous creatures either. Plenty of people have rats as pets, that's fine. Generally, a pet rat isn't going to cause you harm if you take care of it and basically raise it the right way. But a wild rat will bite the shit out of you and potentially give you all kinds kinds of diseases. I'm not really sure how that works in this Indian temple. It would seem these rats don't bite the people that come and go, but I also know that Americans are fucking stupid, clumsy, and obnoxious, and would probably do more to provoke aggressiveness out of rats in a situation like that than Indian citizens would on average. Especially considering it's a cultural thing where they see these rats as precious creatures, and most Americans would probably see them as filthy and disgusting pests. Also, for the making of my upcoming album, I Lure Rot, when I say that it involves a lot of Eastern philosophies, I am taking India into consideration as well. I mean, my focus was actually Buddhism, but there are plenty of parallel ideas between Buddhism and Hinduism, and hence this religious temple is a fresh blend of the concepts that I'm playing with. However, with my artistic license, if you want to call it that, I do twist some ideas here and there and morph some things together to better fit my creation. I had a song called Seven Chakras, for example, which is a concept in Hinduism, but I twisted a lot of things to make crazy punchlines and branch one idea off of another. That's kind of what I'll be doing with the topic of rats as well, as I discussed in the Rat King segment. But enough about all that, where do we go from here? Well, there's actually yet another game I'd like to play, which also involves a temple and rat worship. This game is called Rat and Konish, literally the same name as the last one I played, but this is a totally different game. It's a little unfortunate that they're identical in name and thus they both just mean Rat King, but this third game I'm about to show you is special and a completely different type of experience, I promise. It'll also make sense given its connections to what I've just shown you with this place of rat worship and all. Okay, interesting. I think this is language change? Yes. We'll, we'll go with English. I don't speak... Is this Portuguese? Yeah, I don't know Portuguese. I don't have a Portuguese. That's what I thought a Portuguese was. Me and my brain, huh? And we're just getting started. Shiny. Press any key to start. I like the smell of this one. Nice little loading screen too. Two years ago. Whoa. I want that, like, as a plaque in my room. That thing is fucking awesome. I'm getting closer. 
Press the right mouse button to zoom in. Okay. Oh my god, hello. To interact with an object, press the left mouse button. Compass? You took too long? What? The sun has already risen. There's still a chance. Pick up the recorder. Um, I was wondering about that. If it would fall into the water. If I could just throw my compass over the over the edge. What about this? The plate tape. Yes, let's do that. It's been 10 years since I first got my hands on the artifact. My grandfather always said that such a piece would lead me to glory. Interesting. No, don't play it again. God damn it. No. Ah, oh, fuck. I can't. I can't stop it. Put it down. God damn it. Fuck that thing. You are tall. You are very tall. I'm having very intrusive thoughts of setting you on fire. So if the if in the beginning they prompted me to change my language from Portuguese to English, I imagine this is a Portuguese or or Brazilian uh culture or something of the sort <laughs> ah yes are you responsible for taking care of these statues yes how often do you change these candles do you light them every day they're not candles, they're light bulbs, they turn off, turn on and off by themselves. In the middle of a mangrove? Dot, dot, dot. Interesting. By the way, he's controlling this boat entirely. All I'm doing is looking left and right and zooming in and out. What in the fuck is that? Is it rotating? Or is that just my eyes deceiving me as we get closer? I don't know what use this is. I don't know how long this game is either. I don't know if it becomes nighttime eventually. I'm not sure. I will say it is a little slow for the lack of information we've been given as to what this story is about. Why are some of these statues covered to protect them from what? From the sun? From the moon? That's interesting. So yeah, definitely not a very uh, gameplay-rich 
game. I'm kind of here as a as a passenger. It's like I'm just along for the ride. So it's not your typical game. Not even really a horror game, I don't think. At least it's not so far. I thought I saw that fucking thing move, though. I mean, unless I get, like, sacrificed or some crazy shit. I think this is just a bizarre game. More so than horror. I can't see any kind of entrance. Because they're already gone. What does that mean? Are you sure? I think... Dot, dot, dot. You missed your chance? If you had rode faster, maybe... It's no use, it's your fault. Dude. What the fuck? Fuck that dude. Honey, are you still there? Whoa! You haven't eaten in days. You know how important this is to me. More important than me? Honey, you've hardly touched your rat king. I'm tired. I'm so... All I ask is fucking clarity. If I can't count on you, there's no reason for me to stay here. Do not say that, please. I'm talking to a statue. That is not a human. Holy Bible. I need some time. Okay, then. One year ago. I apologize if I am sniffling or if there's a random cut somewhere where I cut out my sniffling. I'm still kind of sick. I was sick when I recorded the last one. I'm still sick now. Are you sure this is the right way? Okay, now it's darker so it makes more sense to use the lamp. I don't know what the fuck I would be doing though. Let's try this thing again. Second visit, I'm exhausted and completely lost. If it doesn't work out, I don't know how I'll carry on with my life. Also, that compass is tweaking. At least I have nothing left to lose because I've already lost everything. I'm assuming he means his wife. I think my wife is no longer with me. Yeah, that's useless. I don't need that. Catch, idiot. What are you going to do about it? I would love for this to be a real place or modeled after a real place. This would be a really cool boat ride going through these gigantic rat statues holding up lamps. But I swear I saw one that uh, didn't have a lamp. Maybe I have to... Uh, You know, put my lamp in its hands. I'm not sure if I could even do that. Uh, you never told me your name. Bartholomew. Actually, now I don't see the rat with the... The lampless rat. Maybe that's what he meant when he said you missed your chance? I don't know. Because these all have lamps in their hands. I'm not sure what the fuck I'm supposed to do, though. I am not sure. No shit. Should we go back? Get out of the boat? No, I don't understand shit, bro. I don't feel well. He drugged me. He date raped me. Asshole. Now I'm swimming with the fishes. 
Only he who knows the only real and raw truth is ready for the Rat King. Are you willing to give up all your skin for what's rotting inside? Yes. What the fuck? Even I am, finally. Strange. Wait, wait for me. Don't leave me here alone. Please. Do I get to actually control the game now? With WASD. Was a thing that happened? Hooray? Question mark. Now I am playing for real. Is this it? Have I entered the Rat King Temple? Must be. Holy shit! I sprint fast. Usually I complain that the sprint is too slow in games, but I'm like in probably waist high water. There ain't nobody on earth who can sprint this fast in water, but whatever. Maybe I'm half rat. What the fuck is this? Very fucking ominous looking plant. All right. Whoa. Yeah, wow, indeed. I wonder what the true purpose of this place is. They haven't explained much. It's kind of cryptic and vague, the details. And I'm still kind of a little bit lost as to what the fuck is going on. I don't know if that means I'm slow and retarded or if the story isn't good. I really don't know. It could be either or. Bear with me. The red lantern. Should I go in this water? This looks dangerous. Oh, I can't. It's a barrier. I can't even if I wanted to. Alright. This looks interesting, though. Place artifact. Whoa. Whoa! The door should open now. This door? What the fuck? I failed. Oh. Who said that? I'm right here. Fuck off, I don't like that. I'm all looking behind me and shit. 
I'm right here, you fuck off. Oh, it's the flamingo. Where's my BB gun? Fucker. Talk. How do I do that? Why did it pop up for a fucking second? Ah! ah there we go. Who are you? That's cool up there. Me? I'm just passing by. You're the one who came here to stay, aren't you? I don't understand. Where is everyone? The well in the middle of this room will take you to everyone. Send them my regards. Can I grab your fucking flamingo foot and take you with me? Skinny dipping. Oh, wow, holy shit. Okay. Legend has it that one day the rats fled to the mangrove. In the middle of this mangrove, a colony was born and they called it the Ratten Konich. There, they left all diseases behind and dedicated themselves to just being what they really are. Rats. Every day, they gathered the highest point of the Ratten Konich to watch the night. The poor things were in love with the biggest traitor of them all. They fell in love with the moon. How romantic. One day, a lonely scarlet ibis landed near the mice and exclaimed with... Oh, I couldn't read quick enough. Stop looking up, look down, the moon is here, much closer than it seems. Without thinking twice, the rats jumped one by one towards the moon's reflection in the water. Poor things. For being themselves, they ended up at the bottom of the river. According to the legend, the moon, seeing such a sacrifice, turned the mice into beautiful flowers that only opened their petals at night. But that's not true. The moon couldn't care less about them. And it doesn't care about me. But in no way this affects my identity. Connected by our tails on the surface or at the bottom of the river, we are the Ratten Konich. A game by Dion, inspired by a Brazilian folktale. Thank you for playing. That was something. Not horror, really, at all, but... That was interesting. I won't talk about it here, because the more I talk, the more I have to subtitle. So I'll talk about it in post. Alright, first and foremost, I'll say that this game wasn't incredibly special to me, and honestly, neither was the previous game that I covered with the same name that was a 2D platformer. However, the 2D platformer game, developed by Organzola, still provided something unique with the Rat King topic, giving a concept that I'd never really seen before. Yet, the reason I say that both of these games felt lackluster is because I personally wasn't changed by the end of them. The platformer game had an emotional plot, but that's really it. The plot is emotion. All it is, to me, is making you feel something for an animal that you would likely otherwise never think twice about. I'm currently reading a book called In Defense of Animals, which talks about the psychology and the philosophies between how we determine what is and isn't human, what is and isn't animalistic, and it involves loads and loads of information that essentially argues that animals suffer and understand much more than we initially give credit for. Rats in particular are actually extremely intelligent and have shown throughout history to be quite cunning 
when facing humanity. But to circle back to this 2D game, the whole hook of the plot is told through animated cutscenes, which is a stark contrast to the incredibly simple gameplay. And this hook of the plot, or so I'm calling it, seems to only intend to make the player feel something for animals. That's really fucking cool, but for me, this is nothing new. You gotta understand, as I dissect these games, my personal experience and personal opinion are in some ways main foundations of my judgment. This game could be spectacular for someone else watching because perhaps it hit them harder than it hit me. But for me, it was still nothing new. At least, the story itself. The gameplay concept, albeit very minimalistic, was really cool. Having the dead weight hold you back and being able to use the dead weight to press buttons and whatnot, and also keeping in mind that this weight is actually the sibling corpse of the rat that the player controls, that's all awesome. I just felt, however, that I didn't get a whole lot out of it in the end other than the gameplay. And strangely enough, I feel like the gameplay concept was its strongest aspect, but it also seemed to be of little concern in the grand scheme of things. I felt like the emphasis was on the message, and the message just kind of ricocheted off of me. Also, the name of the game is obviously problematic because we have two different games with the same exact name. On Itch.io, I even found a third game with the same name, but I won't be covering that one. I'm just saying, if I were to develop a game like this about a rather niche topic, I'd make sure that I was making something completely original. For example, if I were to make a game about malevolent spirits in East Asia and it took place in Tibet, I would research other games games, books, and films, and all kinds of media that involved the same topics. That way, I could have content that was different and also name my game whatever it ends up being, something that is original. Even if one of these Rat King games was just called Rat King instead of Rat and Konish, technically that'd be more original because there's three Rat and Konish and I see zero games simply called Rat King. But anyway, as for this most recent game I just played called Rat and Konish. This one is apparently based off of a Brazilian folktale. Unfortunately, when I try to search for Brazilian folklore that has anything to do with rats, I find nothing. However, one element of the story in this game is how the Scarlet Ibis said to the rats that the moon was down below, hence there's no need to gaze upward into the night sky. So the rats dove into the water where the moon's reflection had been, and obviously there was no real moon in the water, and these rats drowned. Little scientific fact about rats, though, is they are incredibly strong swimmers. I find it really hard to believe that they drown this way, but it's just a story. And might I add that this story includes a gigantic temple that rises out of the water, so realism is a waste of breath with this. But my point was, the type of trickery with reflections has been told before. When I was in middle school, I remember hearing a story about a kid who saw fruits in the reflection of a river. I believe these were grapes, and the kid didn't really know that it was just the reflection. Every time he tried to swim into the water to reach these grapes, of course he couldn't grab them because they weren't in the water. This would mean they're probably dangling above from a much higher branch, but the kid does not realize this. Anyways, he tries over and over and over, but can never reach the fruit. So he ends up tying a heavy rock to his foot to be able to stay underwater long enough to hopefully reach these grapes. In doing so, he ends up drowning. So clearly, there are similarities with this and of the story told in this game. I'd argue that the message has something to do with being killed by one's own ignorant greed, but in the case of rats, they were told this by the ibis, hence they were kind of further provoked than a kid's simple ignorance. But though I should didn't incorporate realism, I can't help myself. Animals recognize reflections pretty easily. There's no fucking way that this could ever happen for this many rats, and I'd argue that it is nearly impossible for a single rat to fall for this. 
Hence, the storyline of this game isn't great. One of the main issues with it is also that it's very slow up until about 70% of the way through, where the pace picks up quite a bit. But in that first more than half of the game, so much information is withheld from you. It requires a lot of patience. But to add to this, you only play the game for about a fifth of the time. Most of the game consists of you being the passenger in this dude's boat. Then, Dianin, the developer, decided to try to put some tragic back backstory in about the main character and his wife. If you ask me, the ideas for the story of this game would work better with a much longer game that would have more opportunities to properly explain itself to the player, or to simply let the player put the pieces together themselves, but with this game being the length that it is, there's hardly any pieces to work with. Some games I wish were shorter, some I wish were longer. This is one that I think could have been better if the plot had the same basics, but if it were stretched in length, essentially to add filler and some other experiences that just make the player give a shit. Because as I said, with both Rat and Konish games, I hardly gave a shit about what was going on. Sure, maybe I'm a little hard to hook, but a well-developed and well-thought-out game would be able to hook even the most careful and stubborn players. Neither of those really had that captivation for me. But that doesn't mean they are bad games. They each have their own pros and cons, as do all things. It's just that my my personal experience wasn't as fantastic as it appears to have been for other people. That's all. So now, shifting gears once more, let's move on to the third and final book in the Rats trilogy by James Herbert. This is Domain. Domain was published in 1984, five years after Lair. Beginning the first chapter, I already have one problem with it, that being we shift perspective six times in only the first chapter, with all of these perspectives also dying in the first chapter, except for one. I feel like having a lot of perspectives can definitely help build the universe you're writing about as you get to see it from different angles, but too many short-lived perspectives can be a bad thing, as I've said. I want to care about the person I'm reading about, and to care about them, I need to see them reappear time after time and have character development. That being said, I still enjoy the way James Herbert introduces Domain. It is deliciously unforgiving. Nuclear bombs are being dropped on and around the city of London, and warning sirens prompt people to scurry into stampedes of chaos trampling one another. The first perspective we see is Miriam, an elderly lady who didn't quite understand why everyone was rushing to the subway to head underground. She thought about some of the conflicts in the Middle East that had been shown occasionally on the news and wondered if shit had finally hit the fan, but the news had been covering minor Middle East conflicts for years. Why would it be different now? Confused, she doesn't really know what to do and doesn't yet believe that things are coming to an end. Then, as she looks up, everything turns white. Her and everything around her had instantaneously evaporated. Then we shift over to Howard, and this part kind of bugs me because Howard was a character in both the Rats and Lair, but I do not think this is the same Howard. Other Howard was powerful and connected with Rat Kill. This Howard was just doing whatever at a gas station, and James Herbert never mentions any clues or pointers to indicate that this was the same Howard we knew from before, which is a very minor nitpick, I know, but I feel like if you have an important character in other books of your series, you shouldn't have a new, meaningless character with the same name. And as of reading chapter 1, I guess it could still be that Howard, but it seems very unlikely given the way the scene is written. As you could have guessed, this Howard also gets evaporated. He told himself he had just a little more time after hearing the sirens, but the second he saw a flash of light, he knew he had underestimated the weight of the situation. We then shift to someone named Brenda, but who calls herself Jeanette. She's basically a whore, but more like a gold digger. I mean, it's written that she married and divorced a super rich man just for the money, and in the present day, before these bombs go off, she's in a hotel with three Arab guys who she apparently had repeated sex with. But going into more detail about Jeanette isn't important because she gets scorched by the nuclear explosion just like the others whilst staring out of the window that shattered and fused with her upon detonation. Our next perspective is Police Constable John Mack.
Capstone, who was trying to add some control to the chaos. As people flooded down flights of stairs to get underground, he tried to calm them and bring order. Realistically, that's how it is, too. Fear and panic are contagious, and more lives could always be saved if things were organized as far as emergency evacuation situations and whatnot. But how can you tell one person that a randomly selected other person is more important than they are? How can you expect people not to fight for survival? So, while everyone flooded and shoved and crowded, John Mapstone was swallowed in the stampede and trampled to death. We then move to another person who gets flattened by a collapsing tower, which was written pretty well. I love the grotesque details. Imagine a whole building turning your body into mush as thin as water. Not really important to give more details on these people, it's just one after another after another, dying. I think it does help having James Herbert provide details about these people's personal lives because it makes you realize that those who do survive are lucky, and it cracks the illusion that death of non-main characters are unimportant. However, there is still a fine line between providing deaths for side characters that effectively impact the story at least in a minor way, and overdoing it just to raise the kill count, which has been an annoying pattern in all three of these books. I don't want to have someone's life story told to me and then have that character immediately die, because then, more so than feeling bad for the character, I just feel like you wasted my time with reading it. In Chapter 2, we shift to someone who has obviously survived the nuclear attack. His name is Stephen Culver, but the book pretty much just calls him Culver, and he is the main character of the story. In this chapter, he is also with Alex Dealey, who has gone completely blind after seeing the flash of the nuke. Dealey says he knows a place that should be safer than any metro underground subway. He also says that it takes about an hour for the radioactive particles to fully settle into the ground after falling from the sky. Guy. and since it hadn't been an hour yet after the nukes were dropped, he wants to try to go to the surface and find this safe area. So, Blind Dealey directs Confused Culver to this safe zone, which he just says to Culver, I'll tell you all about what it is when we get there. Unfortunately, the spot Dealey wanted to get to was blocked off, and on the surface world, Culver sees bodies and wreckage everywhere. Corpses burnt to a crisp still in their cars, men, women, and children all mutilated. He basically tells Dealey he's lucky that he couldn't see the atrocious nuclear aftermath. In Chapter 3, Culver and Dealey have to turn around because, as I mentioned, the spot Dealey wanted to reach was blocked off by impassable debris. Dealey then tells us that it was a government nuclear fallout shelter unknown to the public and that Dealey worked with the government, but was not responsible for the horrible chaos currently happening. Culver and Dealey are forced to go into another underground station, of which Dealey knew would be crowded and dangerous, but they had no other choice. While they were down there, trying to push their way deeper into the tunnels, they were met with a stampede of people trying to get out, and they collided. Dealey thinks it's just mass hysteria, and honestly, it's a reasonable assumption, but a few people said that they saw black shapes in the shadows clawing and biting people, and that many were killed in the confusion. Culver and Dealey ignore these warnings, though, as they have no other choice but to push on. Dealey says he knows of another shelter somewhere at the back of the tunnels, but as they get closer, they run into a mass of corpses being eaten by large black rats. The black rats. Amidst the cadavers, there had also been a girl standing off to the side, covered in blood and dirt, presumably in shock from seeing her friends or loved ones being attacked and then eaten. Culver tries to whisper to her, to talk to her, but she doesn't respond. Meanwhile, Dealey keeps telling Culver not to help others. Dealey is someone who reasons with cold statistics more so than the generosity of Culver, which in any apocalypse situation makes sense to me. You have to make tough decisions. If you help one, you're gonna have to help them all. If you close your heart to the others who are suffering, the likelihood of your own survival rises. So in this situation, Culver has walked over the rat feast that is the pile of corpses, searching for the metal doorway of the shelter, whilst blind Dealey stays back, hugging the side of the wall. They both know that any sudden jolts of movement or loud noises would startle the rats and potentially mean their death, which is why Dealey keeps hissing at Culver to not engage with the girl. But Culver lets the kindness of his heart get to him, and he keeps 
keeps trying to comfort the girl until the air explodes with her scream. In chapter 4, after the girl has screamed, Culver attempts to calm her down, but she's too panicked to listen. In the chaos, Delia is trying to open the door and the rats are beginning to swarm them. Culver gets bitten in the thigh and clawed at, and both Culver and the girl sink under the weight of oncoming vermin. Culver tries with all his might to fight back the rats, but he is quickly getting exhausted. To add to the mix, the tunnels then start to shake and rumble as dust falls from the ceiling that is now slowly collapsing. This explosive rumbling scared the rats, and they scurried away from Culver, Dealey, and the girl. Another bomb had been dropped, and a whirling fireball was scorching its way towards them through the tunnel. Each of them pressed themselves up against the door, and yet Culver realizes it's basically hopeless hopeless and that the provided cover won't be enough to protect them from the flames. Yet when everything looks like the end is near, the door opens inward and they tumble over each other into the bunker. In chapter 5, Culver wakes up after being out of it for days and we learn that the government nuclear bunker actually has quite a few people taking shelter there. One of the more important people there in the shelter is Dr. Claire Reynolds who helped take care of Culver during his time unconscious. She had helped nurture Culver and his bite wound from the rat of which, fortunately, no crazy illnesses had spread from it. We also learned that the girl who had been screaming before, the girl that Culver pretty much saved, is named Kate, and she'd recovered physically into better shape than Culver, though Culver, Kate, and Dealey, having seen what it looks like on the surface, were in mental anguish. The images of families, of children, being charred to a black by the nuclear blast scattered around and mangled debris had been haunting them. Except, I guess, Dealey, who was blind and couldn't see it, but he can definitely smell and hear and feel it. Such images appear to have affected Culver the most, although we also figure by this point that Culver is actually lucky in a way because he doesn't have anyone. Characters like D. Lee Kate, Dr. Reynolds, and probably most of the others in the bunker had all lost loved ones from the nukes, and they don't even really have time to mourn, so they have to suppress their grievances down as painful as it is. So lonely as it may be, Culver hasn't lost anyone close to him, it's just the shock shocking scene of seeing so many innocent women and children scorched into skeletons that had gotten under his skin. In chapter 6, we learn that this bunker was the Kingsway Telephone Exchange, of course with the dual purpose of being a nuclear shelter, which wasn't public information. The person announcing this information in a meeting-like fashion is named Howard Faraday, the frontline manager of Kingsway Telephone Exchange. This really rubbed me the wrong way because this is the third Howard in the series. As I mentioned in the beginning, the original Howard who was in both The Rats and Lair was someone who worked for Rat Kill as a scientist. And and who worked his way up the system to having a much more powerful position in Lair. But in chapter 1 of this book, we see a totally different Howard get vaporized. I really hope that the Howard who was nuked at the gas station was the original Rat Kill Howard, but James Herbert put zero effort into making it clear whether or not he was the same Howard or a new Howard. All we have to go off of is, well, the name, Howard, which obviously is not reliable information because here we are being introduced in Chapter 6 to another Howard character. Christ, think of some new names, James Herbert. Anyway, his name's Howard Faraday, so I'm just going to refer to him by the last name as Faraday. So Faraday begins talking about how no one suspected a catastrophe like this to happen. Despite the rising tension in places like Russia and the Middle East, some countries had invaded other countries and riots and protests had happened, but there's no clear origin of chaos. I actually like the horror that this insinuates because it's realistic. I mean, this book was also written in the 80s, so 40 years later we have even scarier military tech. I believe it was Albert Einstein who said, I do not know what World War III will be fought with, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. To add to this, Faraday says that one of the many puzzle pieces to the disaster was Russia invading Iran. Look at today's day and age and Russia just invaded Ukraine. I don't know if Ukraine has nuclear power, but I know Russia does. We could all be going about our lives, commuting to work, dismissing the news over and over because the news does over-exaggerate and fearmonger until it's like the boy who cried wolf and the words rising tension become meaningless from repetition up to the point it kills us all. And now I'm sure you can tell my voice changed. I apologize I had to record this in parts. Explaining why is a long story, but I'll just continue where I left off. 
off. Anyways, the character named Faraday introduces us to another man named Alistair Bryce who is a senior civil defense officer and we learn that Alex Dealey was part of the Ministry of Defense, hence he knew to take Culver to the bunker. There's also a handful of other less important government official type characters, but I'll save you the yawning sensation. Faraday and Dealey both explain that communication lines have fallen in the nuclear blast emitted an EMP or electromagnetic pulse, so while Dealey and Faraday are certain there's bound to be other survivors in other bunkers, they have no way of contacting one another because none of the radios will work. However, if this were to happen today in 2023, I'm pretty sure we actually have technology in military bases and bunkers that are resistant to EMPs because of some other complicated system they run on. But remember, this is the 80s or possibly the 90s, but it was published in 84, so we have to put ourselves back a few decades. Eventually, some emotional pain-fueled chaos breaks out amongst the many non-government related survivors. They want to leave the bunker and go looking for their loved ones or for anybody that may be hurt. Things get out of control and the people are furious with tears in their eyes, realizing that they don't have much of a life left worth living anyway. But to bring some order to this chaos, Dr. Reynolds explains how horrible the symptoms of radiation poisoning are, of which I'm actually going to quote. If any of you go out from this shelter now, you'll be dead within a matter of weeks, possibly days. Her voice was raised just enough to be heard over the clamor. She too was standing, her hands tucked into the pockets of her open white tunic, and it was probably the uniform of her profession that gave her some credibility. She represented the physical antithesis of Dealey, a man who was the puppet of a government that had brought their country to war. Their vehemence toward Dealey may have been unjustified and most of those present realized this despite their anger, but he was there, one of the faceless bureaucrats, within their reach, within striking distance. Dr. Reynolds was well aware of whom the rising hysteria was aimed at and in some respects could understand it, for these shattered people needed something tangible to blame, someone to be held responsible. Dealey, as far as they're concerned, you're it. I can tell you this, she said, the noise beginning to subside. It won't be a pleasant death. First, you'll feel nauseous, and your skin will turn red, your mouth and throat inflamed. You won't have much strength. Vomiting will follow, and you'll suffer pretty excruciating diarrhea for a few days. You may start to feel a little better after this, but I promise you it won't last. All those symptoms are going to return with a vengeance, and you'll sweat, your skin will blister, and your hair will fall out. You women will find your menstruation cycle will ignore the usual rules. You'll bleed a lot and badly. You men will have pain in your genitals. If you do survive, which I doubt, you'll be sterile, or worse, the chances are that any offspring will be abnormal. Leukemia will be a disease you'll know all about from a personal point of view. Toward the end, your intestines will be blocked. You might find that the worst discomfort of all. Finally, and perhaps mercifully, the convulsions will hit you, and after that you won't care very much. You'll sink into a brief coma, then you'll be dead. The eyes behind the large glasses were expressionless. Jesus, thought Culver. She didn't pull her punches. There are other milder results of radiation if you'd like to hear them. She was coldly relentless, deliberately frightening them into staying. Food won't do you any good. You won't be able to extract essential nourishment. All the tissue in your body will age dramatically. There will be a contraction of the bladder, bone fractures that won't mend, inflammation of the kidneys, liver, spinal cord, and heart, bronchopneumonia, thrombosis, cancer, and a plastic anemia, which will lead to subcutaneous hemorrhaging. In other words, you'll bleed to death under the skin. And if that isn't enough, you'll have the pleasure of watching others around you dying in the same way, watching the agonies of those in more advanced stages, witnessing what you yourself will soon be going through. So if you want to leave, if you want to expose yourself to all that, knowing you'll be too ill to help others, I don't see why we should stop you. In fact, I'll plead on your behalf to allow you out because you'll only cause dissension in this shelter. Any takers? She sat when she was sure there wouldn't be. 
After Dr. Reynolds had scared the others into staying, Culver tried to tell Dr. Reynolds, Dealey, and Bryce about the rats. The rats that had bit his leg, the rats that almost killed Dealey, Culver, and Kate. Dealey was blind during the time, so he didn't actually see the rats, but Culver remembers when the British government claimed they had completely eradicated this mutant rat species. Obviously, as it turns out, they did not completely wipe them out, because these were the same black rats, now even more genetically mutated by the nuclear radiation. In Chapter 7, we shift perspective to a new group of survivors, most notably a man named Clempton, who are all staying in the basement cellar of their home. This family keeps hearing a scratching noise, but they think it's the sound of their dog, Cassie. I guess for some reason they have to keep Cassie locked behind a door, and Clempton won't let her stay with the family. I suppose having a dog could pose some trouble, maybe an extra mouth to feed, maybe diseases. Not to mention that the family already has to shit in a bucket because they can't go outside into the nuclear fallout. I'd imagine taking care of a dog's remains would be a disgusting cherry on top. But the dogs scratching and yelping were growing more and more aggressive, despite Clempton trying to calm her from the other side of the door. Unbeknownst to Clempton, the rats were actually slowly crawling out of holes and crevices below where the rest of his family were trying to sleep. Cassie began to howl and literally throw herself against the wooden door over and over, trying to get through to save her master and her family. That is when Clempton heard screams from downstairs, and when he turned back, looking downward, he saw the entire cellar was swarming with black rats consuming his entire family. And before he could even really react, Rats were scurrying up his leg and onto his body as well. Amidst the screams and the horror, the dog, Cassie, kept throwing herself at the door over and over in hopeless attempts to reach the others. She scratched, howled, and yelped louder and louder as she heard the screams of her family, until eventually those screams stopped, and after a while she knew it was over and gave up, lying there beside the door. For Chapter 8, we go back to Culver and the others in the bunker. Well, actually, Culver is resting, and has been for days, mainly because of radiation sickness. So the chapter closely follows Kate and Dr. Claire Reynolds. That being said, not much at all happens in this chapter. Basically, everyone is depressed because the world they knew and loved is gone forever, and some of them question whether what's left is even worth fighting for. Some are trying to grieve, others, such as Dili, are still hopeful and want to work hard at getting through the situation. We also learn that Kate had lost a fair amount of family from the nuclear attack, but that's not entirely important because it seems the only one who hasn't had anything ripped away from him is Culver. In Chapter 9, we learn that the depressing mood of the survivors has basically just gotten worse. As Culver was resting and recovering from the rat bite and the radiation sickness, he'd been woken up by the gurgling and yakking sounds of someone who had tried to overdose on pills. He heard painful groans as doctors and leading members of the bunker had shoved a rubber tube down the person's throat. Another had effectively killed themselves by slitting their wrists with a razor blade. Culver hasn't really had any crushing suicidal thoughts because his mind has been focused on recovering. As Kate practically nursed him, she mentioned that he had many horrible nightmares. However, perhaps sometimes it's easier on the mind to adjust to a brutal change unconsciously rather than consciously, though I'm not sure how harmful the psychological after effects of that may be. When Culver fully rejuvenates, he attends a meeting with Dealey, Bryce, Faraday, and the others whose names aren't really given, but it's hinted that they're shelter staff or government officials like Dealey. And it's at this point that we know Dealey no longer has the bandage over his eyes and he can actually see, and Dealey is very thankful that the damage was only temporary. In this meeting, Dealey explains that there's another secret tunnel that in itself is like a bunker, and that since they have no way of communicating with the other nuclear shelters scattered around London, they should eventually try to go there themselves. But firstly, he wants to send a reconnaissance group to just sort of scout the area and see how safe it is, especially considering the existence of the now thriving giant black rat, they can never be too careful. He hopes Culver will join this reconnaissance group whenever they set out. And at this point, I want to say that I very much like the structure of this book and the tone. I wasn't a fan of jumping from one character to the 
next every other chapter, reading as many of them died in the same chapter they were introduced in as James Herbert did in both The Rats and Lair. And Domain tends to stick with the main group, despite the one chapter about Clempton and his family, and the scatteredness of the first chapter when the bombs first dropped. But I think, looking back, that the beginning scatteredness fits, so I don't mean to be so harsh on Herbert's writing. I just get rubbed the wrong way by slasher flick structure, which he does tend to do a lot. Chapter 10 actually shifts to another perspective, but it's okay. I don't dislike shifting perspectives, I think it's a great technique of world building, but as I have said multiple times now, that technique was definitely exhausted in the first two books. Chapter 10 is slightly different though. We shift to the perspective of a 19 year old girl named Sharon, along with 30 or so other survivors all taking shelter in a half destroyed cinema. Technically, the main focus is Sharon, as for the entirety of the chapter, she's the one who is awake in the middle of the night, heading to the bathroom via candlelight while everyone else is sleeping. Unfortunately, I can't talk a lot about this chapter because of a brutally detailed rape scene, which YouTube wouldn't like very much. Especially since I've already talked about Tsutomu Miyazaki in this video, if I go in depth on this as well, it's not a good look. But I hate pulling punches. James Herbert did an excellent job highlighting the horror of, well, rape with extremely dark and gruesome imagery. It's supposed to make you uncomfortable, and the execution is extremely effective. To summarize, Sharon went to the bathroom and was grabbed and wrestled by some unseen older man. Sharon fights back and does a pretty good job, but he doesn't go down easy, so they both end up getting very hurt. Unfortunately, the man eventually overpowers her, but that overpowering is short-lived, as Sharon jabs her fingernail and the man's eye, and as she retracts her finger, the eye pops out of his socket, dangling by his cheek. But during this frightening scuffle, neither of them heard the scratching and scuttling noises of invading rats. A rat leapt at the dangling eye, and more and more swarmed the man. Considering it was so dark and Sharon's candle had been blown out right before she was attacked, she had no idea that rats were doing this. She thought the man was screaming in pain from just the eye wound, but before she could even escape the bathroom, rats were already lunging onto her as well. She heard the screams of other survivors meeting their doom via claws and teeth, as Sharon herself crumbled under the vicious might and weight of a ravenous waterfall of black vermin. Everybody in the cinema was effectively ambushed, overwhelmed, and then devoured. Again, just because I say this chapter is unique or that it offers a different and special flavor of horror to the book, it's not like I'm sitting here with confetti guns saying hooray for sexual harassment. I just think the way James Herbert wrote this chapter was really good. In my opinion, if a horror novel doesn't get under your skin or upset you or make you feel uneasy in the stomach in any shape or form, then the writer isn't doing their job. James Herbert also touched on something that really made me think, which is how the man who who tried to molest Sharon in his mind, he knows that there's not much of a world left living for, that there's no law to punish him, no government or society rules, nothing he could give a damn about existed anymore, so absolutely nothing was going to stop him from getting what he wanted. It made me think a lot about all those apocalypse movies where the world is in ruins, whether it be from zombies or aliens or nuclear war. Usually the thing to watch out for is people. Take away all responsibilities and people turn into monsters but perhaps I'm speaking in a cliche manner, so moving on to chapter 11. In chapter 11, we see Culver, Bryce, a man named Fairbank, and a man named McEwen going out on a mission to see the surface and observe the damage after the initial wave of radiation had settled and lessened in severity over the weeks. Technically, this chapter ends right before they reach the surface, but it takes them a while to get there because of how deep underground they were. Between the reconnaissance group, they had very little to protect themselves with, only two revolvers. On their journey of ascending various stairs and traversing multiple dark tunnels, they see half-eaten corpses everywhere. And as I have said, James Herbert is an expert at describing gore. Here's a few examples. Bodies were sprawled on the stairways as far as the light would reach. There were more, many more, 
piled up at the bottom of the three stairways, disheveled bundles, decomposing, stains of dark blood, dry and crusted, spilling like frozen lava from the heaped forms. And even from where the four survivors stood, they could see the corpses were not intact and that their mutilation had little to do with rotting flesh. Limbs did not decompose before the rest of the body. Surface organs, noses, ears, and eyes did not just fade away. Stomachs did not split as though intestines had broken free from dying hosts. See? It's amazing, isn't it? Worthy of a chef's kiss. This is also where they realize just how much of a threat the rats really are. Bryce vomited at the scene and Fairbank was weak in the knees, trembling. Remember early in the video when I discussed Ratman, how I talked about fearing what is in the dark, fearing low visibility, how the ambiguity in the unknown that lurks in the shadows is often scarier than actually seeing it. Well, here's another quote a few pages later that help solidify the morbid idea. Culver wondered how long the generators operate the emergency lighting had continued to run. Had these people died in total darkness, feeling only the slashing jaws and talons? Or had they witnessed the full terror of their assailants? Which would be worse, unseen demons gnawing away at your squirming body, or black carnivorous beasts seen and thereby understood, tearing you apart? I could spend another 20 minutes talking about the brilliant, quotable writing in this chapter, but you get the idea. They traverse through horribly mutilated bodies, piles and and piles of them, even a few corpses of rats from those who had fought back, and the chapter ends right when they reach the surface, to which apparently things weren't looking any more promising, as whatever they'd seen up there made Bryce fall to his knees and cry. Chapter 12 is very short, and so I'll keep this brief. To summarize what they see is total destruction. Technically, Culver and Dealey had already gotten a glimpse of it in the beginning, but Culver had no idea it was this bad. The giant buildings of the city were all pretty much dilapidated dated and crumbled, the few that still stood barely looked like buildings anymore. To top it off, scorched bodies were everywhere. Of the group, Culver is the one who stays the most level-headed, and Bryce is the one who suffers the most mental anguish. As they wander the disheveled city with a Geiger counter, observing their surroundings, Fairbank eventually points out a store that may still have some food and supplies they can bring back to the shelter with them. They decide to investigate, but Bryce has already broken down and tells them he doesn't want to try over human corpses any longer, and that he'd rather wait right where he was than go with them into the market. So they let him. Culver, Fairbank, and McEwen head into the store, and Bryce stays behind to wait for their return. That's when it starts to rain pretty heavily, and Bryce gets into an abandoned car where he finds a newspaper that says, Stay Calm. Upon reading this, Bryce erupts with laughter until there's tears in his eyes, and it's safe to say that he's succumbed to utter madness at this point, which is where the chapter ends. In chapter 13, Culver, Fairbank, and McEwen search through the store, and outside, it starts to rain pretty heavily. Fairbank gets a bit of joy after finding a bunch of still edible candies and chocolates, but this joy was short-lived. As they go deeper into this building that is halfway caved in on itself, they run into some survivors. However, these survivors have their lives dangling from a thread, as they are horribly disfigured and shriveled by radiation sickness. And this is one of the chapters that that made me decide this is my favorite horror book I've read. I'm gonna read a segment that describes how these survivors are. Culver in the lead, they drew near the corner with the store widened. An electrical department came into view, plastic coated wires hanging loosely from their spools like oversized cotton thread. Light sockets, switches, and lamps lying scattered as if swept from their displays by angry hands. Beyond that, the record and hi-fi department looked as if the choices had not been appreciated. Album sleeves littered the floor, stereo equipment lay scattered, bodies some still moving lulled in the mess. Damp fingers, disembodied by the darkness, curled around Culver's wrist. He recoiled by instinct, the others intentionally, for they had seen the hideous figure just before it had touched him. Culver wrenched his arm free and staggered back against the nearby counter, but the figure went with him, unbalanced, claw-like hands clutching at Culver's clothes. The man fell to his knees, preventing himself from sinking further by hanging weakly onto the pilot's leather jacket. The man's voice was a thin, rasping sound. 
help us. Culver stared down at the emaciated face with its wide, staring death camp eyes, the torn lips, cracks filled with dry blood, gums exposed and teeth decayed brown. A few sparse tufts of hair clung to the man's scalp. His skin was puckered with fresh sores and there was a thin line of dried blood trickling from both ears. Fright gave little room for pity in Culver. The man groaned, although it was more of a throat-singed croak. He seemed to shrivel before them. Overcoming his revulsion, Culver caught the collapsing figure and gently lowered him to the floor. The man's clothes were torn and bedraggled. They smelled of excrement. Please. The voice was weaker this time, as though the effort of seizing Culver's wrist had taken most of his remaining strength. Help us. They followed Fairbanks' gaze and saw the shuffling shapes emerging from the shadows, most of them crawling, some stooped and bent, stumbling as if with age, a whining coming from them that was more frightening than piteous. In that moment of abject fear, it was hard to think of these unsteady, shambling figures as fellow humans, wretches who had no time to shelter properly from the disaster and its disease-carrying aftermath, for they came at the three survivors like lepers escaping their colony like hunched demons rising from unhallowed earth, like the undead reaching out to embrace and initiate the living. It was too much for Fairbank and McEwen, one trauma too many in that day of traumas. They backed away, and after they leave the store, McEwen notices a dog chowing down on some sort of bloody mess. We don't know what exactly the dog's eating. Could be a rat, could be a part of a human, who knows? It might even be possible that this dog is Cassie from before with the Clempton family, but as of now, we don't know. McEwen approaches this skinny and starved animal, and after saying some things like good boy or that's a good boy, trying to be friendly, the dog's head looks up, which is where the chapter ends, insinuating that the dog is potentially ravenous and dangerous. In chapter 14, we see that Bryce has been injured pretty badly. He has gashes on his face, neck, and shoulders, and is clutching his bloody hand, which is now missing several fingers. Bryce has lost a lot of blood and is panicking. He just wants to go back to the shelter as soon as possible in order to get properly treated, not to mention he may need an anti-serum for rabies. As this is going on, McEwen, who isn't that far away, was getting closer and closer to the rabid dog. He realizes that the bloody mess that the dog was eating had a fingernail protruding out of the sausage-like clump. For McEwen, everything feels like slow motion as Culver yells his name and starts running toward him with the gun drawn. Right as the dog is about to leap for McEwen's throat, its yellow teeth showing in a bloody and foaming mouth, Culver fires his revolver and the force knocks the dog to the side. He fires again at the dog's head, then again a third time. Luckily, McEwen was unharmed. After this, they make haste to the shelter, but are met with yet another problem. The rain had been pouring for quite some time, and given how destroyed the cityscape was, and given the state of the tunnels, the water had nowhere else to run, so it was becoming flooded. They had to hold on to various metal protrusions and wiring to haul themselves against the vicious current, with Bryce in the middle. Culver and Fairbank did their best to keep Bryce up, considering he only had one hand to maneuver with, but the weight of the oncoming water made the task overwhelming. Just when they were almost there, a corpse that had been flushed out of the tunnels slammed right into McEwen and Bryce. Culver also had a tight interlocked grip on Bryce, so he went underwater with him. The only one who stayed intact, clinging to a wall, was Fairbank. Miraculously, Culver is able to keep both him and Bryce above water, just enough to be able to breathe, but McEwen is gone. Fairbank goes back to help Culver and Bryce, and they use the last bit of strength remaining with them to finally make it to the shelter door. And yet, once they make it, and as various people struggle to close the shelter door against the weight of oncoming water, Culver's tired mind struggles to understand why someone was pointing a gun at Dealey, who was anxiously standing nearby, and why someone was pointing a gun at Culver himself. In chapter 15, we are introduced to two residents of the shelter, known as Ellison, 
Jensen and Strachan, who want to change the way decisions get made amongst the survivors. They are tired of Dealey and Bryce running the show and want the democracy to be able to collectively vote on survival decisions, although more than anything, they really just want Dealey out of the position of power because they don't trust him considering he was a government official. The man named Strachan was close to McEwen, and his insistently cold questions regarding McEwen's fate added yet even more tension to the situation. Culver tried his best to bring reason to the discussion, to be the mediator, with Fairbank taking his side. They then find out that, within the shelter, there is a storage cabinet with a particular type of rat poison that was commonly used against the mutant rats when they were running rampant through London and Epping Forest. They even found ultrasonic equipment that was also used to deter the rats in the first two books. So more people start pointing their fingers at Dealey, pretty much interrogating him and bombarding him with questions because they have many reasons to believe that Dealey was and still is withholding secrets from them regarding the nature of the rats. Ellison and Strachan want to leave the shelter for good, but Culver reassures them that there is practically nothing left on the surface. Dealey is struggling to maintain power and tries to win over Culver by letting him know that, with a gun to his head, the others actually took a vote on whether or not to even let them back into the shelter when they were pounding on the door. So as you can see, there's a lot of division going on and shifts of power and everyone is tense, scared, and panicking. Culver, on the other hand, pretty much blows everyone off and says that he's beat. He just wants to get some rest and he doesn't give a damn what the others decide to do. He also says that he noticed something odd about many of the corpses in the tunnels, that being most of them were headless. He doesn't know what this means or if the others have any answers for it, but he just throws it out there as he walks away and that's where this chapter ends. I apologize, voice change once again, but I really had to divide this in parts in order to get it done because I can't sit here and talk for like an hour and a half. I I will go crazy. Anyways, in chapter 16 now, we see Kate urgently waking Culver up. Somehow, the shelter had flooded. Not exactly because of the water that was let in when they opened the door for Culver, Bryce, and Fairbank, but for a multitude of other reasons, of which a single origin didn't exist. When Culver and the others went outside, it started to rain, which caused the flooding of the tunnel in the previous chapter, of course, but also, Culver and Fairbank had seen a few buildings slowly giving way. Chunks of the ground were caving in, the earth was loosening, and entire buildings were still slowly falling apart under their own unbalanced weight. So the water that is now flooding the shelter could have gotten in there from a myriad of sources. Perhaps it was the well system the shelter used. Perhaps directly above them and above all the pipes and wiring something else fell apart. Point is, since they are underground, nothing is really stable. To add insult to injury, rising water is not the only threat. Swimming through the tide of foaming turbulence were, of course, the rats. The whole shelter had erupted into a bloody chaos. Various people were dragged under the water and torn apart. One of the rats almost got Fairbank, but he caught the leaping monster just in time and threw it against the wall. Another person had a fully automatic submachine gun, but was already being devoured by the rats. As he went down, bullets were whizzing everywhere and ricocheting into machinery, causing sparks and small explosions. The backup generator was faltering, causing the lights to flicker. Culver, Kate, and Fairbank do their best to make their way towards Dealey, Ellison, Strachan, and the others, waiting against the current and defending themselves against the rats that were now everywhere, running along pipes above them and swimming around them. Then the chapter has a little breakaway to before shit hit the fan, and we follow the perspective of Dr. Claire Reynolds. Apparently she's been having nightmares every single night of her now deceased husband who was caught in the nuclear blast. Upon waking up from these nightmares, Kate has comforted her, and vice versa when Kate would have mental breakdowns. Over the weeks, Kate and Claire have grown close to each other, mainly from the small things like having a shoulder to cry on, and now fast forwarding to the present, she is separated from Kate, Culver, and everyone else other than a man named Tom when chaos unfolds. And apparently her future looks pretty grim. I'll read the last paragraph of the chapter to encapsulate an accurate sense of her dread. 
Claire had no intention of immersing herself intentionally and stood on tiptoe to slip over the top rail. Tom helped her, and as her legs returned to the numbingly cold water, she reached out a shaking hand towards the counter, but stopped, and sagged back against the rail and stared at the black creature as it scurried onto the yellow-topped counter. Squatting there, sleek and black, watching her with deadly, slanted eyes, wet fur rising like sharp needles. Claws splayed into talons, to be joined on the yellow surface by another of its kind, and another, another. Claire screamed as the lights danced their crazy, tormenting flutter. Chapter 17 is a bunch of more terrifying chaos, and the chapter's rather ambiguous cliffhanger still ends with more chaos. The shelter is still flooding at an alarming rate, and rats are tearing unfortunate victims apart. Ellison got his hands on a submachine gun. Keep in mind, this isn't the same person with the gun who died in the last chapter, but Ellison was practically going crazy shooting all around him. Of course, he had still enough sense left in him to prioritize rats as the target, but unfortunately his murder-crazed fury caused the death of Dr. Claire Reynolds. Claire was already halfway dead with a giant rat biting into her neck, and she was covered in blood, wading through the water toward Culver, Kate, and Fairbank. Culver was carefully trying to reach her, but Ellison's bullets were hitting all around Claire and in between her and Culver until eventually multiple bullets hit Claire in the chest and stomach. If it weren't for the dire situation, Culver would have wanted to attack Ellison for what he did in his blind panic, but he didn't have time to even think about it. Things look pretty grim for the survivors, but Dealey suggests he may know an alternative way out. So, trying to swallow his own rage, Culver follows Dealey up a ladder that supposedly led to a way out, and the others followed behind him. Unfortunately, smoke had been rising and swirling about through the cramped passageway they were climbing, and an explosion erupted from below. Culver didn't know if the water had splashed upwards or if he had fallen downwards, and that's where the chapter ends. For this next part, Part, I'm going to bundle chapters 18 and 19 together because it's all still taking place at the same time and the flooding shelter just shifting characters. Everything is still very chaotic, there's a lot going on and a lot of death. To start with, in chapter 18 we shift over to Bryce. After Bryce had nearly his entire hand bitten off by the rabid dog, he was doomed to suffer the side effects of rabies and whatever other diseases the dog may have carried. Technically, Dr. Claire Reynolds was able to give him the the required anti-serums because this is a bit before she was accidentally shot and killed. Yet Bryce still feels like a slow and painful death is inevitable for him. He feels it deep in his core, and he's already experiencing the early and mild side effects of what will eventually be an absolutely agonizing way to go. If he were to survive for the next couple of days, his body would undergo muscle spasms, extreme pain, an inability to swallow to the point where he'd be foaming at the mouth fearing any liquid, even his own saliva, delirium, and eventually a horrible coma leading up to his death. Realizing this, Bryce pretty much becomes suicidal, in the sense that as alarms are going off and the water is rising and he hears gunshots and screams, he realizes that dying here would be preferable to the horrible fate that awaits him. He gives in, sinking below the water, accepting death, for the act of drowning is much easier for him than what his future may entail, and he almost succeeds. He was inches away from death, sinking blissfully into a black oblivion, when Faraday and another man pulled him out of the water. He was furious with them, and actually wanted to die, as Faraday and the other man, whom I don't think the name was given, it might have been Tom, put much effort into reviving Bryce, trying to get him to cough up the water he had purposely swallowed. As they're struggling to keep Bryce up, the same chaos from the rats that has been happening in the past few chapters is still obviously going on. Screams, gunshots, people drowning, people fighting for their lives against the rats, and so on. At this point, Culver, Kate, Dealey, Strachan, Fairbank, and a few others had been heading up a ladder into a sort of tower-type formation. I didn't know nuclear shelters had towers connected to them. I don't really know how it works, or if this is exactly what James Herbert was talking about in the story, but it's the only thing I could find. I'd imagine the nuclear blast would decimate the tower, but obviously here, it is at least intact enough for them to climb upward. 
Unfortunately, this is where a major explosion happens. This is the same explosion that Culver and the others just barely escaped. However, Bryce, Faraday, and Tom were not so fortunate. The initial blast alone burnt Bryce's face off. Faraday had been in front of him, so he actually took most of the damage for him, thus Faraday and Tom instantly die and Bryce gets sent underwater, where he resorts back to his blissful accepting of sweet death. Meanwhile, Culver, Dealey, Kate, Strachan, Fairbank, and I think even a couple others whose names aren't given, are climbing up the ladder. Ellison isn't with them, so either Ellison died in the explosion, drowned, or was eaten by rats, or honestly he could have died in a multitude of different ways, as could many of others had done. But Culver recognizes there's nothing they could do to help them, so they just push forward and try not to think about it. There's a sort of seal door or metal lid type contraption that they needed to close off to prevent the rising rat filled water from engulfing them. Basically, they need someone to stay at the bottom of the ladder and keep it closed, of which Strachan volunteered. And it wasn't meant to be like a suicide mission or a sacrifice for the survival of the others because Culver was trying to stay close as the others ascended and Fairbank was also keeping a watchful eye. But alas, the future for Strachan was grim. More and more rats pressed against the weight of the door or grate or lid. It's hard to explain exactly how this works because it wasn't described very well and I'm no expert on the anatomy of a fallout shelter, but nevertheless, Strachan is overwhelmed and eventually devoured alive by the giant rats. Culver had tried to help help him up to lift him back up, but in doing so, a rat climbed up from Strachan onto Culver's arm and lunged at his head. Culver was barely able to dodge it, and so the rat grazed against the side of his head, taking off part of his ear. He also got bit on the ankle, and Fairbank had to dangerously slice it off of him using a guillotine blade. No, not the execution device, those paper cutting blades. Fairbank ripped one off of the mechanism and held it like a cleaver, chopping rats away here and there up until this point. So Strachan is left in a writhing pool of inky blood and squirming black bodies as they try to just continue on. From the top of the ladder, they saw a huge flash of light. For lack of a way to explain exactly what I'm talking about, it's similar to the horror movie The Ring, when at the bottom of the well there's a circular glow that can be seen above, around the crevice of what is basically the crack in the door, but isn't exactly a door. I need to work on my fucking vocabulary. Anyway, they see this light around the edges of whatever door-like thing is at the top and they fear the worst. They fear initially that another bomb had been dropped but it turns out when they reach the top they hear rain and thunder and realize it was just lightning. It was night outside and storming with huge lightning bolts forking the sky all around. As the rats are busy feasting upon Strachan it gives the rest of them time to get down from the tower unbothered. Chapter 20 is probably the darkest chapter so far, and one might say the scariest, hence this chapter alone provided me all the more reason to adore this novel. The only issue is, for the sake of this video, I'm going to have to be very brief with how I describe it, not to mention James Herbert skips around to three different totally new perspectives in this chapter as well. The first perspective is that of a woman with her family on the outskirts of the nuclear blast. Outside their window, the city is decimated, but they've taken refuge in a building seemingly still intact. The woman has two kids and a husband, but the touch of genius in this part is that the woman is completely insane. It's hard to describe exactly how, but she's pretending that everything is back to normal when obviously it isn't. Her husband is actually dead, slumped up on a couch with a newspaper in his hands, his eyes white and rolled back, to which the woman treats it like a joke. Like, oh my damned husband of mine is so lazy, he doesn't do this or do that, and she basically responds for him in her own head. There's a lot of puking and madness. The woman scrapes the surface mold off of a loaf of bread and bites into it as she asks her husband who was clutching the crumpled newspaper, what's in the news today? Oh, you never know what they're gonna do next, crazy, crazy world. That kind of stuff. The woman pretends that the day is both a school day and a work day, trying to manage a shattered family in a shattered world. 
Again, this is glossing over a lot of the really dark and grotesque details in this chapter, but I can't quote the whole damn thing, so if you didn't feel inclined to do so already, read this book for yourself. Or at the very least, read this chapter as a hook to reel you into the book as a whole, because the main characters are nowhere to be seen in this chapter anyways, so it's not really spoilers. After the first family, we shift to the perspective of a man named Maurice. Maurice is basically what you would call a doomsday prepper. He dug his own bunker in his backyard, which of course his neighbors all called him crazy for. But when the bombs dropped, he felt the sort of smug I told you so, which was just underneath the layer of dread that the end of the world instills. He spent thousands of dollars on equipment that could help him survive for about two months. Not just food, but a bed and blankets, radio equipment, batteries, air filters, and so on. He also realizes that a ginger-colored cat had snuck its way into his shelter, presumably a day or so before the bombs dropped. So Maurice and this ginger cat are forced to live with each other over the course of a few weeks, which doesn't go very well. Maurice has never liked cats, and historically cats have never liked Maurice. But he does try his best, feeding the cat and giving it a tray that he'd hoped the cat would use as a sort of litter box. Despite his efforts, he's just really not that great with cats, and the ginger cat, he now named Mog, was frightened, paranoid, and sketched out because of the nuclear blasts and frequent rumbling. The tension between Maurice and Mog had been growing quickly, with Mog hissing at Maurice and avoiding him, and with Maurice waking up with Mog squatting on his chest in a threatening manner. Eventually, Mog deeply claws up Maurice's arm, causing him to kick the cat across the dugout room. The next night, Mog nearly clawed out Maurice's eyes in his sleep, attacking his face and biting off part of his ear. Because of this, Maurice then kills Mog or tries to. Another great rumbling happened outside of his shelter while Mog was clinging to his back and clawing him, and the power of the rumbling shook the whole room and he fell backward, breaking Mog's back in the process. After this, he threw a blanket over Mog and smashed the covered lump he assumed to be Mog's head. If you think that's bad, I'm actually saving you a lot of the details. This whole sequence is incredibly brutal. And my own cat recently died, so it carries more weight for me, but that didn't make it harder for me to read, I just respected the horror of it more. It turns out that the final rumbling that Maurice and Mog had felt was his own house collapsing on top of his bunker, consequently blocking his ventilation. Because of this, there's no air circulation, and he has to deal with the smell of the decomposing cat becoming increasingly worse as the days progress. Eventually, he starts to go mad, unable to even sleep because of the stench of decomposition. He couldn't leave the shelter and accept his fate of potential radiation either because his exit was blocked by impassive concrete. For all we know, he may have killed himself, or just suffocated from the maddening air dense with death. From this, we shift to our final perspective of the chapter, but it isn't in the perspective of any single individual. It's more of a loose description of a group of survivors trapped in a building. And let me be blunt, in terms of horrific scenes, this sequence is even worse than the first two, which is good. Don't look too far into where I stand in the spectrum of morality. Especially in this video, I bet it's confusing. Me saying bad can be good and good can be bad, whatever. Morality does not exist, we're here to analyze darkness. And this third sequence is the sweetest flavor of the chapter. Various survivors are trapped inside, much like how Maurice was trapped in his own makeshift shelter, via giant chunks of sturdy concrete and cobble. So these people wait here, hoping for a rescue team that never comes. Now that I think about it, the fact that rescue teams hadn't scavenged the nuclear wasteland tells me that it's probably not just England that was bombed. Perhaps there was actually no one left who was able to rescue them. Anyway, some people feel hopelessly trapped in a concrete prison and eventually commit suicide. Others treat it like a protection of sorts against whatever else might try to get in, although, as I mentioned, no rescue team came, so after a couple weeks, even the most hopefully positive people wanted to get out. They were running low on practically everything, so they were out of options. A handful of people start using whatever materials they could find to chip away at the concrete in an attempt to escape. After many days, and I believe even weeks of chipping away, they start to hear some chipping noises coming from the other side. At first, they think that they're being rescued, 
although skeptical why they wouldn't just use heavy machinery. Hours go by of the survivors shouting and trying to communicate being responded to only with silence and the continuous scratching and chipping sound that gradually started to sound like gnawing. As you might expect, it was the rats, and once they get through the wall, it's all over for the survivors. Not a single person lives through it. After one rat clawed its way in, the hole got bigger and bigger until rats were practically pouring out, after which they killed and ate everyone. There are some incredibly described scenes in this chapter regarding how some of these people die from the rats. It is a ruthless yet poetic bloodbath. I can't cover it all, in fact I can't really cover any of it because of how much there is, and because describing this chapter in depth might be the cherry on top of reasons for YouTube to remove it. But to summarize a couple of these sequences, one elderly man hid in an oven that he could barely fit into, and the process alone of rushing into a claustrophobic enclosure and cramming himself uncomfortably with haste, partied with the pumping adrenaline rush, he has a heart attack in that oven and dies. Another survivor, an elderly woman tries to hide underneath a pile of corpses. These corpses were people who had died previously before the rats got in, and this scene is one of my favorites in the whole book. The way the corpses touch and press against her as she frantically tries to bury herself is worthy of a reward. James Herbert deserves a trophy that isn't actually a trophy, but it's a pen that draws his own blood for ink or something. I actually have a pen myself that has a diaphanized rat paw inside of it. I hope some of this book was written with something similar. And to circle back, as you could have guessed, despite the lady being buried under a mound of cadavers, it only delayed the inevitable. She was feasted on even more slowly than previously predestined. Rats gnawing away her fingers and toes as she couldn't do much about it given the weight of bodies she'd thrown onto herself. It's fucking brutal. And that's the tip of the iceberg of what the fuck did I just read kind of paragraphs in this chapter, or rather in this whole book. I have to gloss over stuff otherwise this be a 10 hour video. Moving on to the next chapter, chapter 21, we return to our original group. Not a whole lot happens in this chapter, which is understandable considering how much has been going on in the previous chapters, but we do learn some backstory about Culver. We learn that before the bombs had dropped a very long time ago, Culver accidentally crashed a helicopter he was piloting into the sea. Doing so, he killed eight other people in the wreck, and so he blames himself for it. And I wouldn't say the blame is wrongfully placed out of low self-esteem or self-loathing, because as a pilot it is your responsibility to escort the passengers of the vehicle from one place to another safely. If you're a bus driver and you cause the accident, you are directly responsible for any casualties on the bus. The same goes for boat captains, train conductors, and so on. This is why Culver has been less affected by the destruction and horrors of the world, while everyone else has been losing loved ones and leaving a good life behind to face a new and horrible life, Culver's life was solemn and grim before any bombs dropped or rats or anything. The weight of his guilt, paired with simply not having anyone to lose prior to the nuclear catastrophe, makes him much more resistant to the hopelessness and gloominess of the radioactive, corpse-filled, and rat-infested city. Of course, he isn't immune to fear, but he hasn't had any reason to mourn. Apparently, the only people who made it out of the bunker alive are Culver, Kate, Dealey, Fairbank, a man named Jackson, and Ellison. I thought Ellison had died in one of the previous chapters because of how grim the outlook was, but it looks like he made it out. Around the city, there's also a heavy fog or mist as if the survivors themselves were in a giant sauna after a constant pouring of warm rain. Plus, I imagine some of the radiation and other elements of nuclear bombs had something to do with this changing of the atmosphere around London streets. The chapter ends with people going off to do various tasks, finding wood and materials, this and that while Dealey and Culver remain together. Culver doesn't want to walk around much until he gets his ankle checked out, because remember, a rat bit him on the ankle back in the bunker. He threatens Dealey, saying now that it's just us two, I want answers from you, otherwise I'm gonna break your neck. 
That's paraphrasing from what Culver said to Dealey at the end of the chapter. Unfortunately, in chapter 22, these answers that Culver wanted from Dealey were greatly glossed over. At least, questions about the shelter and what Dealey had known, and this and that about the government and Dealey's importance and whatnot, these questions are answered, but the answers are not revealed to the reader, which annoyed me. However, Culver pressured Dealey further into talking about the rats, threatening him to reveal everything he knew about them. At this, Dealey says he barely knew anything about it, and that most of it were small rumors that had never given reason for panic. The only helpful information that Dealey recalls was the rumor that the same two species of rat that were in the first two books, these same creatures may have been experimented on in a government facility and possibly allowed to breed. Culver gets pissed at this and exclaims that he should have told everybody before. He almost punches Dealey, but calms his temper. Culver also didn't tell the others what Dealey had told him, and so Dealey assumes, rightfully in my opinion, that Culver learned a valuable lesson about what is basically forbidden knowledge. That is, knowledge that when you know about it, it literally makes things worse for you than when before you knew about it. And a variant of this kind of knowledge is information that, when exposed to the public or even just a group of people, panic and potentially very bad decisions that were not thought over would be made. The chapter ends shortly after Dealey had a horrifically described nightmare about being eaten alive by his friends and family who had rat heads, and he himself slowly realized his hands and head were that of a rat. There's a lot to the nightmare, but you get the idea. He's missing his loved ones, and the scourge of the vermin is. In multiple ways infecting his mind. In chapter 23, things get cranked up a notch. While Dealey, Jackson, Ellison, Fairbank, and Kate were sleeping, another group of survivors attacked them. This group is noticeably more roughed up than Dealey and the others. They have radiation blisters and scabs, mostly tattered and dirty clothes, but they also are armed with melee weapons such as knives and pipes. The leader of this group, named Royston, threatens Kate by dragging a knife across her face. Because of this, Jackson tried to intervene, but was beaten badly. During all of this, Culver was lurking about undetected with an axe that his group had previously scavenged. One thing leads to another, and the scuffle gets extremely brutal. Culver murders Royston with the axe, which was pretty justified as Royston was also getting ready to rape Kate. A lot of blood is spilled on both sides. There's a character named Dean that I forgot to fucking mention because he wasn't that important. We barely know anything about Dean other than the fact that he was an engineer and escaped with the others from the bunker. And I apologize for not bringing him up earlier, but I didn't think he'd even exist in this chapter. He was super, super minor. Anyway, this... Dean Guy dies in the scuffle, though it is also glossed over as to how exactly. It was like a throwaway character, a throwaway death. Jackson almost dies, and after the fight, Dealey and Kate are practically dragging him away. Ellison was also almost beaten to death, but he is still alive. Culver is wounded, but his rage and adrenaline pretty much makes him forget whatever painful bruises he may have other than the rat bite on his ankle. Fairbank and Culver did the most damage to the invading group, both being responsible for extremely bloody axe murders, though I guess it's less malicious intent murder and more self-defense murder. Despite Culver using this group of rapists and killers as wood to split, very angrily and violently, if he did not quite literally come to the rescue of his group, they may all have died. But Dean did die, even though we have very little reason to care as a reader. The remaining members of the invading group retreat, and so Culver decides to do the same. They run toward the river as quickly as they can, trying their best to carry Jackson and gain considerable distance. But even after a while, Culver looks back and sees a couple of silhouettes running toward them through the mist, and he has doubts that he and his people, I'll say, will be able to get away. I summarized a lot of stuff in this chapter, but you get the idea. It is very intense and very dark, which I love, but I don't think I need to go extremely deep into detail about every single punch or kick that was thrown or received during the fight. Lots of blood was spilt, and we basically get reminded that during an apocalyptic setting, the most dangerous thing of all is usually other people. 
Now we're very far into the video, and if you haven't noticed, this book is longer than the rats and lair combined. So for the sake of this video's length, I'm going to cover two chapters at a time from here. In chapters 24 and 25, the intensity doesn't slow down, and a lot is packed into each of these chapters. To start with, Culver and the other survivors run into a building to hide from the remainders of the other group that were chasing them. Jackson, the guy who had suffered the most from the ambush, covered and bruises, gashes, and burns goes a little crazy, and I really love how this sequence is described. In this building of temporary refuge, it is very dark, and Jackson is only halfway conscious, not really understanding what's going on. He doesn't even know he's still with his companions, Culver, Dealey, Fairbank, and so on. For all we know, he might think he's being carried away by the other group that attacked him. He lashes out, trying to push and shove away the arms that tried to grab him and calm him down. Culver tries covering his mouth to prevent screaming, which would give away their hiding location. But Jackson still breaks free in his last burst of energy, running out into the open, believing that he was escaping from a rat-infested darkness. All this commotion gives their position away, but as the last couple antagonist survivors enter the building, it starts to collapse. At first I thought this was kind of far-fetched, but then I remembered earlier in the book some buildings were falling entirely on their own in the distance with no need of human intervention and external vibrations. Anyways, this building starts to collapse and it ends up killing Jackson, and to our knowledge it also kills the last members of the attackers. But I want to point out again how well this is written because the things Jackson had seen regarding the rats, mainly from their chaotic terror in the flooding bunker, has tormented his thoughts, and once he's in the dark, with unknown hands touching and grabbing him, he freaks out and thinks he's about to be killed by the rats, thus half running, half crawling out into the light like a maniac, just to be crushed by dilapidated concrete and rebar. So after this collapse, the last of our group are Culver, Dealey, Kate, Fairbank, and Ellison. Dealey had talked about the main government shelter previously, and now since they've been flushed out of their own bunker, he thinks they should make their way towards this main headquarters bunker. During this trek, we get a lot of details of the destroyed city. Fallen bridges, diagonal skyscrapers, scattered debris of wires and cords protruding from concrete and so on. Eventually, after passing one crumbled monument after another, they reach the shelter they were seeking. Fairbank uses the axe to open the door, and I forgot to mention that the main entrance was blocked off so it took them some rerouting to find this alternative entry, but once the door is opened, a blast of ice cold air leaves the shelter and rushes around the group like a fleeting ghost. This is what they've been looking for, been fighting for, yet there's still some sense of ominous foreboding dread resonating around the entrance. For chapters 26 and 27, the group investigates the headquarters bunker. They also found a headless, half-eaten body slumped against one of the doors within the shelter. One of the corpse's hands was still holding onto the door handle. They don't know why the body was headless, but Culver remembered that there were lots of headless bodies back in the tunnels by the previous bunker, but still doesn't know why. They realized that the rats had been down there and decided they couldn't stay there, but they also can't go back because they don't have the light anymore. Their torches had died. At least that's the summary of chapter 26, and afterward we get this cutaway to an in-between chapter. Now, Domain has this type of thing happen multiple times, but I didn't find it important to mention any of the previous ones. However, for this, I will just read directly from the book. It's a page and a half, but it's really cool. She stirred, restless, perceiving a faraway danger. Her obese body tried to shift in her nest of filth and powdered bones. The sound of running water was lost to her, for she did not possess ears, yet something inside could receive the high-frequency mewlings of her subject creatures. There was no light in the underground chamber, but her eyes had no optic nerves anyway, yet she was always aware of movement around her. The huge, swollen hump on her body moved in a deep breathing motion, swelling even more so that dark veins protruded from the whitish skin, skin so fine it seemed the network of ridges must burst through. 
Her jaws parted slightly as air exhaled with a high wheezing sound. The breath also came from another source, another misshapen mouth and a stump by the side of her pointed head. There were no teeth inside this mouth and no eyes above it. A few white hairs grew from the snout, the one that enabled her to smell, but the protuberance had little other use. Her limbs no longer supported the gross weight and her claws, there were five on each paw, were brittle and cracked grown long and curled from lack of use. Her tail was stunted, merely a scaly prominence, no more than that. The mother creature resembled a giant, pulsating eyeball. A mewling sibilation escaped both snouts, and she tried to thrash around on her bed of slime, but her weight was too much, her limbs too feeble. Only dust stirred, the bones ground to white powder by her soldier rats, the sleek black vermin who guarded and protected her with their own lives, whom she now called to her. There were other movements in the dark, cavernous chamber. They were the twitching, writhing motions of her fellow beasts, those who resembled her in appearance, different from the servant and soldier vermin. Many had been produced from her own womb, and many had mated with her. Like the mother creature, most were captive of their own malformation, debilitated by their own grotesqueness, and some were dead, others were dying. She screeched, the sound of a screaming child. She was terribly afraid, but she sensed her black legions were coming to her, winding their way through the flowing corridors, bringing food. The skulls into which her twisted tusks would bore holes so that the spongy flesh inside could be sucked out, swallowed. She waited impatiently in the darkness, obscenely gross, body quivering, while her offspring, six of them in each one peculiarly shaped, like her yet unlike her, suckled at her breasts. Into chapter 27, they push on further into the government bunker and find lots and lots of corpses. None of the important machinery is working, only standard power and dimly lit light systems. And the reason I think that they didn't want to leave just yet is because the lighting system was not active near the entrance and by the super long ladder they had to climb to get down there. So since they no longer have personal lighting equipment, they're worried about traveling in darkness. I probably should have said that earlier, I'm sorry I'm a little scattered with this. Anyways, in this government war shelter they find loads of corpses of military personnel, and so they equip themselves with machine guns taken from those bodies. There's also a couple of inactive and unused tank-like military vehicles. I should mention that the way James Herbert describes the scenery of this military bunker full of dead soldiers and rats is outstanding. But I encourage you to just fucking read it yourself because I've quoted too much already, and one thing about Domain is that this piece of the trilogy actually has the least amount of rats in it, and so some people felt like it deviated from some of the specialness that the rats in Lair had. But personally, I found the combination of nuclear aftermath and the return of the infamous black rats to be a spectacular mix. Dealey, Culver, Kate, Ellison, and Fairbank start discussing what could have happened and the hows, whys, and whens. Dealey thinks that the rats were here to begin with, probably shortly after the first bombs dropped, meaning they managed to get into this main shelter through the sewers beneath. The staff of the shelter had been stockpiling non-perishable foods in the lower levels as well, always adding and never taking, with no real reason to be concerned of things going missing. Why would they be concerned? It's supposed to be an impenetrable fortress, and they did lay various poison traps, but nobody could really predict the cunning or viciousness of this mutant breed of rat to wreak havoc on them let alone in what is genuinely the safest place to be. So when the bombs dropped, these rats came out and tore through everybody. This government shelter had been unknowingly built on top of some sort of giant nest or lair or domain. That is the special and horrific duality of this book because domain is an area of territory owned or controlled by a ruler or government. But this human domain has been overlapped by the vermin domain and the vermin one. This is told to us in a way though that insinuates the group of survivors aren't sure of it yet. 
Clover feels like something more is happening. He has a gut feeling that they're about to see another factor to this chaos that should explain things, but he blows it off as just a feeling. Dealey tells them all that this was likely built on top of some sort of nest or lair or domain, whatever, but as they descend further, gripping their guns with fearful tightness, chapter 27 ends. Between chapters 28 and 29, a lot happens, but I'll try my best to compress it. This video is gigantic, and I imagine very few have made it this far, but if you have, congratulations, you're sick as fuck. Anyways, the first thing I should mention is that they stumble upon a lot of dead rats and dying rats that aren't entirely dead, but are weak and sick. Too weak to get up and attack, but alive enough for their squelching, pulsating breathing to be noticed amongst the dead. Dealey suggests that they are sick. At first he thinks that's probably anthrax, but these dead and dying rats have no pustules or markings insinuating any sickness like that, so then he settles on the idea that these rats have pneumonic plague. And no, not bubonic. There are three different types of plagues, being bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic. I'm not sure where septicemic plague happens, but I know that bubonic and pneumonic are similar. I believe they involve the same bacteria, the Y. pestis, but bubonic is transferred by flea bite, commonly carried on rats, and pneumonic is the same thing, but when that bacteria gets directly into your lungs instead, which is supposed to be much worse. So Dealey suggests that is what these rats are sickened with, so they tread carefully. Eventually, though, they run into some rats that are very lively, some coming from ahead and some coming from where they came from. So they're being pinched or flanked two different ways by vicious hordes of vermin and are forced to take a different exit down into the sewers. Culver and Fairbank held off short waves of stampeding rats with machine gun fire as Dealey, Kate, then Ellison jumped down this ladderless manhole cover opening. It's not a far drop and into waist-high water, but it is disgusting and very dark and slimy. They all eventually make it down there, with Culver being last and just barely making it. From here, they walk along the sewers in search of an alternative exit, and eventually they find a heavy, rusted metal door. They push it open and find lots and lots of decrepit bones and human remains. Putrid severed limbs and heads and a couple of skulls with holes in them, insinuating that the reason there were so many headless bodies was because they had a craving for the human brain. The group is exhausted and covered in slimy filth, shivering from the coldness of their wet clothes. They barely have any fight in them other than the urge to escape, but they stop dead in their tracks when they hear a child crying. Fairbank and Culver decide they'll check it out, while Dealey, Kate, and Ellison agree it's a bad idea. But Ellison is much more aggravated calls them all insane, and uh, in this chapter we don't know if he just stayed behind or if he tried to leave on his own. That part wasn't really told to us. Culver told Ellison he could bloody well leave if he wanted to, but they weren't going to follow him, and things are left at that. So Culver and Fairbank advance towards the noise of the crying child, each of them with a gun. They descend through various rooms that are large and open, ancient rooms of slimy brickwork, sticky cobwebs, and giant pipes, with a familiar stench of vermin. Personally, I think Ellison had the right idea. I wouldn't say that Culver's insane for wanting to save a child's life, but I would recognize that just minutes prior they were almost engulfed by a swarm of rats that were still basically chasing them, trying to find alternative ways to reach them. Logically, getting out of the sewers as quickly as possible would be the best thing to do. You can't save everyone. In a previous chapter, Culver and Fairbank realized this when they ran into survivors who were practically withering away by radiation sickness. And honestly, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a baby or a child to be crying down in the sewers, not to me at least. Yet Culver insists and Fairbank tags along with them. Down in the filthy depths, they find lots of half-dead, diseased rats too weak to fight back. But they also find the second strain, the strain Dealey called a grotesque. These were the ones that were genetically mutated by science experiments that had obviously somehow gone wrong in the very beginning. These giant pulsating pinkish monsters were seen here and there in Lair, and at the end of the rats, Mr. Harris kills one of these whitish pinkish mutants. Originally, I thought in the rats that the grotesque strain was symbolizing a king rat. But then in Lair, there were multiple, being mistaken as pigs when seen in the distance of the woods out of the corner of Pender's eyes. The 
these same grotesques were huddled in the corners of these sewer back rooms that Culver and Fairbank had ventured into. They stop at nothing to pull the triggers of their machine guns, causing various bloody pops of vermin gore. Soon enough, Culver realizes that these childish whimpering cries were actually not that of a human child, but of the mother rat. Culver and Fairbank had been effectively lured into the mother rat's domain, surrounded by hideous, mutated creatures. Chapter 29 ends at this horrendous revelation. Chapter 30 is very short, just two pages long, but we see what's going on with Ellison. In his heart, he truly believes that Culver, Dealey, and the others are crazy for staying there. Technically, in some ways, I relate to Ellison's way of thinking, despite him being described here as some misunderstanding menace. He snatches the Browning machine gun from Dealey and shoves him to the ground, then struggles with Kate for her flashlight and wins. He backs away, aiming the gun at them, but he tells them they can escape with him if they want, but he's leaving either way. And as you might have imagined, neither Dealey nor Kate followed him. In Chapter 31, we go back to Culver and Fairbank. The description of the mother rat and her bloated filth spawn, in my opinion, is detailed enough to give the average person long-term musophobia just by reading this. It's fantastic. Of course, Culver and Dealey instinctively blast it to bits and dump hailstorms of bullets on the rats around them, encroaching from all directions. Culver runs out of ammunition and resorts to the axe, of which he used to deal the final blow on the mother rat. This actually kind of rubbed me the wrong way because that's an extremely similar climax as the one in The Rats where Harris used the axe on the first of the grotesque strain, but that's probably just me nitpicking. Anyway, after they killed the remaining grotesques and the mother rat, the other rats, the black rats, swarm in. However, they basically ignore Culver and Fairbank and instead devour the colossal carcass of the mother rat. When they're done, which didn't take long, they move on to eating the grotesques. Culver and Fairbank take this chance of distraction to run out of the pit of horrors they descended into. Culver barely manages to climb up as the platform they were using to clamber began to fall apart. Fairbank climbs next to him, but the black rats have begun to bite and grab at his legs anchoring him down. More and more engulfed Fairbank, biting, tearing, and clawing him. The second Culver gets a chance, he rushes to help Fairbank, but Kate holds him back. At this point, Fairbank is screaming, help me, with half of his face gone, and Kate basically pins Culver against a wall, telling him it's too late, that he can't save him. Fairbank is covered in giant lumps of bristling fur, eating him alive and dragging him down. And to add insult to injury, James Herbert writes that since the others did nothing to intervene or save him, Fairbank had no idea why his companions were standing idle during his suffering. He screamed for someone to give him a gun. He screamed for help. He screamed until he didn't have a throat to scream with. Fairbank was gone. And one of the problems in the wrath and lair was that the majority of deaths were of people that the reader had had little reason to care about, but here, I actually enjoyed Fairbank as a character, and so his death had value. The whole scene is chaotic, and as I've said a couple times, I could quote little descriptions for hours on end, but I don't think there's any need for that. Everything here is dark, brutal, and relentless. In the next two chapters, things pretty much get even worse for everyone. Ellison ends up getting lost in the underground halls and tunnels, missing the exit by one wrong turn. He opens a metal door, leading to another room, rushes in, and trips over the outspread legs of a corpse. By tripping over his body, he fell to the floor and dropped both the flashlight and the gun in the process. The floor of this room is also like a metal grate, meaning there's lots of empty space throughout the structure, and Ellison happened to drop the gun through this grate into nearly unreachable black slime. This chapter ends with him scrambling for the flashlight only to realize it had broken upon hitting the floor, so he continues on, blindly, feeling against the walls as he treads through a pitch black labyrinth of dread. Culver, Dealey, and Kate end up at the exact spot Ellison was previously, though at this point we have no idea where Ellison wandered off to from there. In fact, James Herbert takes a page or so to explain briefly the life of the corpse that had tripped Ellison, and it's done in a really cool way. This body had starved to death as the rest of his sewer working crew went up to the surface and are probably also dead at this point. And if they're not dead, they're probably wishing they were. 
similar to the suffering survivors of radiation sickness we saw earlier on. But this person who stayed down here and starved to death had maddening delusions and hallucinations that are common with starvation, and the descriptions of these visions are awesome. He'd cover his face with his hands shivering in fetal position in a corner as he heard distant scratching and scuttling. The scurrying noises of the rats paired with his mental degradation spawned horrors in his head that he could only describe as not from this dimension. Anyway, this corpse of the man who starved to death pretty much killed Ellison, or so we're led to believe because by tripping, Ellison no longer has light or a weapon. Now, Kate notices the weapon beneath the metal grate because they still have their own flashlight. So while Dealey and Culver stand by, Kate sticks her hand through the grate, and she's the only one who can because her hands and arms are smaller than both Dealey and Culver's. But in doing so, multiple rats that they didn't know were down there clawed and bit into Kate's hand. Their yellow, ferocious teeth rip her arm to pieces, while also tugging on it enough to prevent her from pulling her arm away. Culver tries and tries to use the axe against the rats trying to eat Kate's arm, but the angles are too awkward and he can't do any real damage. Eventually, Kate is missing almost all of her fingers, shrieking in agony. In the distance, Dealey is in the doorway and warns Culver that more rats are on the way and that they need to do something quick. So, as the gun that Kate almost got was now buried in wriggling rats, Culver basically says forget the gun and to save Kate, and he has to chop off her arm with the axe. It takes two swings. The first swing, splitting the bone, the second, cutting all the way through, and after the second swing, Kate faints. Delia and Culver carry her out together, trying to move as quickly as they can as the rats catch up behind them. They make it out of the sewers, but they aren't safe yet. The rats were advancing, angrily breaking down every door they closed behind them. Just outside the sewers, they reach a sort of river or canal. It runs through the city, but I don't know exactly what it is. Point is, it's a current of water and there's a boat that could fit up to 15 people and they jump onto it. However, as I mentioned in the second Rat and Conage game, rats are decent swimmers and they don't have the key for the boat so they are moving slowly, at least just at the speed the current takes them. Culver and Dilly both use long poles to jab at the oncoming rats and keep them off the boat and in the water, but things don't stop there. Up ahead, further along the stream, a building had toppled over the stream making a bridge of debris and they were on their way to float under this bridge. Only problem is, more rats were already swarming this piece of dilapidated building, many of them were already perched, waiting for them, waiting until the boat got close enough for them to dive on top. And that is where this chapter ends, with Culver's realization of just how grim their situation is, with rats swimming very quickly behind them, and rats ahead of them, and all around them. Culver and Dealey fight the onslaught of rats with the last of their energy in a hack and slash fury, a desperate attempt at staying alive for just a little while longer. And at the very last minute, when all seems so hopeless, the sky thunders, booms, and roars, and bullets rain down on the surrounding vermin. Even the rats that leapt to the water for safety were followed by trails of gunfire. Turns out, two Puma helicopters were hovering above. One man descends from one of the copters and says he can only take one, but then seeing their situation says he can fit two. So Culver and Dealey first help Kate onto the propelling device, and after that Culver and Dealey look at each other like, okay, which one of us is going? Culver tries to convince Dealey that he should go and that Culver would stay behind. But Dealey suggests the same thing, so both of them want the other one to go, to live. Dealey ends up grabbing the axe from Culver, pats Culver on the shoulder, and tells him, please, to go. And so Culver does. And keep in mind, this is all done very quickly, and they don't have much time to think because some of the rats are still trying to attack them. As Culver is being lifted up with Kate, Dealey is struggling to fight for his life. More and more rats overwhelm him, and he almost dies, but the second helicopter swoops down and has another man descend to pick Dealey up. From there, they flew the hell away, and after significant amounts of gunfire, the boat also exploded. The military personnel tend to their wounds, taking gentle care of Kate's arm, but they say she'll be alright. Culver asks the men who had started the war, asking if it was Russia or the US, 
and one of them responded China. Honestly, this doesn't matter that much. I think we could be in a loop of rising tensions with about 20 different powerful countries, but we are most likely to suffer the most casualties by butting heads with either Russia or China because of their military size and their arsenal of weaponry. So the ending of this book is only a semi-good ending. Culver, Dili, and Kate make it out of the city, but apparently London wasn't the only place affected by nuclear bombs. So they live, but is the world they are continuing into worth living? Of course, it's not the entire world that is flattened by bombs, but it's enough damage for things to never be the same ever again. In these nuclear blasted cities, the rats have pretty much claimed the domain. They easily pick off weak survivors and those suffering radiation sickness, and so the main threat of the series, that being the rats, still wins in a way. And it's not common that evil wins in a story. Technically, evil didn't triumph entirely, but the good guys, or however you want to look at it, aren't really having a good time by the end. There is barely any relief, barely any weight lifted from their shoulders. They're still probably going to face the rats time and time again wherever they're flying to. While yes, they did kill the mother rat and her repugnant spawn, the evil, per se, is not eradicated. And to prove this, to add one final bloody cherry on top, as Culver, Dealey, and Kate are flying away from the city, we return to the lightless, weaponless Ellison. This is one of the few deaths in this book that is mostly left for the audience to interpret. All we know is that Ellison heard scratching, clawing, gnawing, and squeaking from behind a metal door that he was sitting against, in a room with no other exit and apparently the rats enjoyed his screams. That's kind of all the information we get, and I think that's fine because just about every other death in this book had incredible description. Therefore, I'm fine with this one having some demented ambiguity. And that is Domain. Domain itself is my favorite of the trilogy, but for many people it seems they like Domain the least. They say that it's too long, not enough rats involved, yada yada. In my opinion, the execution of blending the two horrors being mutated rats and nuclear devastation was beautifully done. And now that I'm done talking about this trilogy and this video is nearing its end, we know a lot about rats in literature, in games, and in history, specifically in the realm of horror, and with emphasis on facts that are dark and disturbing. For those of you who disliked me covering books, don't worry, I won't be covering any more books in this monster of a video, so the drawn out part that might be boring for some people is over with. Instead, I want to cover one last rat-themed game, which is actually a horror experience unlike the last Last one I played, and after that, I'll be wrapping things up. But before I get into this game called Bon Bon, I must warn you that this game has a lot of symbolism and messages regarding abuse. At least that's what I took from it. Some of it is left for the player to interpret and is kind of vague, and that's how I interpreted it. So if anyone has traumatic memories or something, here's your warning. This video is structured with timestamps that divide the video up into segments, and if you want, you can just skip the Bon Bon segment. Otherwise, prepare for a game that in my opinion is more disturbing and thus scarier than all the other games included in this video. Alright, here we are. Bon Bon. Ooh, very spooky atmosphere. I like that it grows like fur and then goes back to nothing. That's tight. Let's get to it, I guess. Am I a little child in the backyard with all my toys? Stark contrast of hearing the dog barking and then looking at this fucking thing. Use the mouse or right thumbstick to look around. Well, I am playing with mouse and keyboard. Play with wobbly dog? Rotate wobbly dog. Say hello wobbly dog. I can't even rotate it. Oh my fucking god, what the hell. That thing is evil. Are my controls supposed to be fucked right now? Ah, yes they were. I was sitting down. Carrying toys is hard work for little hands. Remember you can throw and push as well. 
Whoa. It's time to come inside, love. Don't leave your new balls outside, you'll lose them. I'll never lose my balls. Find all four balls and put them inside the house for mummy. Holy fucking shit. What the hell is up with you? No, don't scratch your fucking belly. Fuck you, weirdo. Play with Miss Purple. Rotate Miss Purple. That doesn't really do anything. Ah, there we go. That's kind of hard to control. Say hello, Miss Purple. That is the devil's doing right there. That's evil. I want you to have this. Come on, I can do it. Oh, I can't give it to... Are you Bon Bon? Can I jump? Can I... There's an invisible barrier. It is impossible. Alright, whatever. Did I trip and fall? Get up. What the hell? Ouch, my... Poor little toddler head. Jesus Christ. Play with rainbow face. Oh my god. It's kind of fun, actually. Jesus, I do not like bouncy hopper. What is in here? Cool. God, this is like... I don't know how to explain this other than some weird, like, subconscious deja vu of, like, memories when I was, like, three years old. And yes, I do remember weird instances and in, at weird ages. Like, I remember certain costumes when I was, like, four but I don't remember what I had for breakfast last week. Let's go inside. Don't lose your new balls. Bring them inside, please. All right, fine. <laughs> Satan. One. <laughs> Mr. Lemon. Oh no, not Mr. Lemon. Look at it. Look at that face. Wow. Hello, yellow digger. Nice push. Doesn't really work, does it? There we go. That's a better one. Okay, I know there's like one more. There's a green one, yeah. Is it Miss Apple? Yep. Oh, there's one more? Alright. Oh, fuck. Hello, Bon Bon. Can I bring this one instead? No. Jesus fucking Christ. He's like gesturing me to come closer with his fingers. Don't you look at me with that, with that face of yours. <laughs> oh no. He got excited when I said hello to him. I don't like that. That is a gigantic rat, like... I... That thing is bigger than the whole doorway. It's gotta be like a seven-foot rat. What the hell is that? Mr. Orange. <laughs> Fuck you. He just absorbed it. That's not good. Yay, cartoon time. My favorite time of the day.
What is this 1940s propaganda music? What the fuck? I wonder if there's any significance to this cartoon. This is some old shit. What the fuck? I don't know if I should even be watching it, like if it matters at all. But I know that if I were a game developer, I'd put something slightly meaningful in. Although I have no idea what the fuck is going on. I don't think it's important. Flutterhog? <laughs> I hate it. That's... It's nearly ready, love. Demon Finish toy. playing with your toys, then put them away. <laughs> ah, okay. What the fuck? No. Oh, that one didn't even matter. Pee wee. How come it didn't count? Are there specific toys I gotta put away? I think so. Draw man. Alright. Oops. Whoa. What am I missing here? What have I got to put away specifically? <laughs> Hello, tiny man. I'm concerned that there's no... Like, it's not telling me that I am successfully putting them away. And I can't pick this one up for whatever fucking reason. Away from home. <laughs> Hello, tiny man. Hello. Bank shot. Fucking hate that TV. That is haunted shit. I have no idea what I'm doing wrong or right. There's no longer a, uh, um, it's not telling me that I that I'm getting them. I don't understand. I don't know if it's like not registering because because that or what. <laughs> okay. Was it the rings I gotta put away? He's winking at me. I fucking hate it. It is the rings. Okay. Find one more rubber ring and put it in the box for mommy. So I didn't even need all this other shit in here. Get out. Get out. I win. Monster box. Oh. Yeah, I was way ahead on accident. I don't follow directions, clearly. Holy fucking... Oh my god. You look devilish. There's gotta be one more that I can find before I approach this motherfucker, right? Mom's making something in the kitchen. <laughs> Yellow face. I don't want to approach you yet. There's gotta be like another tiny man somewhere, right? <laughs> Georgie. I don't think so. I think that that's it. My last resort is to talk to you, I guess. Uh... Eight. Thanks. Hate you. Oh, he has the other one in his hand. Ready, ready, love. Can you come in here and punch this fucker in the head for me? I can't quite reach. Come on. 
Time to tidy up. <laughs> I I don't wanna. <laughs> Wait, did I not do it in time or something? He dropped it and then it cut to black. That's very ominous. Open your eyes. Ah, uh, do I have Happy to? Happy birthday, love. Blow them out. One, two, three. Oh, you missed one. Try again. There you go. Now, a big birthday slice for you and... Oh. I suppose that'll be your father. Oh. Back in a minute. Not my father. He's an asshole. No, I'm not interested. <laughs> Hello, Bon Bon. Yeah, I'm not getting good. Well, it's your child's birthday. Is that on your agenda? Yeah, I know you did. What were you doing? Cake looks good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Should I be listening to the conversation? I can't quite hear what they're saying. Hi, uh, buddy. No, I'm not interested. What the yeah, fuck did I just do to my cake? <laughs> oh my god, I hate it. <laughs> I hate that he just gets so aggressive. It's so unsettling. It's fucking amazing. No bon bon. I don't like the ways that the host is just twitching. Chatterbox. I have an idea. Alright, relax, relax. I'll give you more cake. <laughs> oh, I can't pick it up? Oh, here we go. Take that. I meant to drop it in his hand. God fucking damn it. Now I'm mad. I was really hoping that would do something. Jesus, he's so intimidating. No, no, no. Oh my god. Hate. Who made all this mess? Come on. Twasn't I. Twas the Bon Bon, I, s I swear. I promise, Mom, you must believe me. What the fuck? Hello, Daddy. Once upon a time, there was an old miller who had two children who were twins. The boy twin was named Hans, and he was very greedy. 
The girl twin was named Hilda, and she was very lazy. Hans and Hilda had no mother, because she died whilst giving birth to their third sibling named Engvall, who had been sent away to live with the gypsies. Hans and Hilda were never allowed out of the mill, even when the miller went away to the market. Okay. One day, Hans was especially greedy, and Hilda was especially lazy, and the old miller wept with anger as he locked them in the cellar to teach them to be good. Let us try to escape and live with the gypsies, said Hans, and Hilda agreed. While they were looking for a way out, a big brown rat came out from behind the log pile. I will help you to escape and show you the way to the gypsies camp, said the big brown rat, if you bring me all of your father's grain. So Hans and Hilda waited until their father let them out, and the next day, when the miller went to market and left the children locked up inside the mill, they carried all the grain down to the cellar. The big brown rat gobbled up the grain until there was none left, and then went to sleep behind the log pile. When the miller came home and found out, he declared that he was ruined and that they would all starve to death, and he locked the children in the cellar and wept with fear as he turned the key. The big brown rat was waiting. I will only help the boy child to escape and show him the way to the gypsy's camp, said the big brown rat, because the girl child will stay behind and be my wife. What the fuck? Come back once you've organized the wedding. Once I've escaped, I'll find our brother Engel and lead him back to rescue you, whispered Hans to Hilda. So Hans and Hilda waited until their father let them out. The next day, when the miller was out bartering for new grain, they made a trail of breadcrumbs all round the mill and into the cellar to show the wedding guests where to go. They took the most important pages out of the hymnal so that the priest would have the right words to say. Then they stole the miller's best Sunday jacket and took in the shoulders so that it would fit Hans, and he stole their mother's wedding dress and took up the hem so that it would fit Hilda. Then she put it on, and she looked lovely, but when the miller returned from market and saw them dressed up in the wedding clothes, he wept with shame as he beat them and threw them both into the cellar once more. The wedding guests were already assembled. There were mice and voles and stoats in the congregation. <laughs> All right. The choir was made up of crows who were already singing. The registrar was a big fat spider with spectacles on, and the priest was a long grey weasel who was busy rehearsing the right words from the hymnal. Hans walked Hilda down the aisle, and the big brown rat was waiting. The weasel said, Do you accept this offered paw in binding an inescapable holy matrimony, Hilda girl child? Hilda looked at Hans, who nodded as if to remind her that he would rescue her. I do, said Hilda. The weasel said, Do you take this innocent young hand for your very own Engel monstrous rat baby? I do, said the big brown rat, before anyone could interrupt. Then I'll pronounce you man and wife, squeaked the weasel as quick as he could, and in a flash all of the wedding party scattered and Hans and Hilda were left alone with the big brown rat. I don't understand, said Hans. The big brown rat pushed Hans through a secret tunnel that led down to the river bank, and Hans escaped and ran off and became a beggar boy. Of course, he never found his brother Engel, and never rescued Hilda. The old miller finally hung himself, but nobody minded. What the fuck Hilda is this story? died whilst giving birth to a beautiful litter of 13 baby rats, who grew fat in the miller's grain and lived happily ever after. Yeah, why don't you sleep on that, son? Nice, happy bedtime story. That was deliciously dark. Holy fuck. Average German story time. What the fuck am I doing now? I have a lot of tiny men. A little light bug. Excuse me. You gonna pretend that that didn't just happen? Everything's all distorted and slow mo when I do that. I'm assuming I go to this. The big, bright, glowy thing? No? What do I do then? I'm taking Lightbug with me. Come on, Lightbug. You're my best friend. Come on. I said come on. I can't carry it with me. Okay, fine. The fly, I suppose. Oh, what the hell. This game's fucking weird.
I don't remember having a cult of toys. And who the fuck be opening my door? And then closing it like that. What the hell? I'm so fucking confused. Poor tiny mid. Getting kicked around. <laughs> What happened to Lightbug? I bet I could use him. If I could figure out how to just carry him. Or her? It? I don't know. I don't... I'm not assuming the gender of the Lightbug. You are. I'm assuming this is where I go? Hello, wobbly dog. Go! Get him! I don't want to go down that fucking hallway. This hallway spells death. And destruction. What the fuck? Why? What the hell is even going on? Whoa. Something's wrong with that door. Excuse me? Oh my fucking god. Hello. Bon Bon. I'm assuming. Uh. Fuck off. Fucking fall. Give it up. Stupid bitch, you overcooked the bratwurst. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Cancel me. I don't care. That was a funny joke. That's not so funny. That's fucking terrifying. This is the slowest escape of all. Go, 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 go. Open the door faster. Ouch. My sanity. Crawled under, I guess. I don't know. Lightbug, help! You were always my favorite. Oh, what the fuck. Am I gonna see two big hairy feet on the side? Is he on top of my bed? Oh my god, he is. Ooh, the tail. Oh god. Oh god, I don't know if I should be going toward it, or away from it. I can't move at all. Why am I... I'm not trying to get closer You're to it. There, kiddo. Uh, it's okay, love. Mommy's here. What's he doing in here? Take it downstairs. Yeah, okay. Night, kiddo. Happy birthday. Good night, What's he love. doing in here? Take it downstairs? What does that mean? by etheric games that was interesting a lot of ambiguity but so ominous i don't know if i would interpret the correct things things are left for the player to interpret themselves obviously because there's a lot of unanswered questions but holy shit was that cool? Is it just my pet rat? Is that the deal? Or what the fuck? That can't be it. <laughs> I, I feel like this is uh, symbolizing abuse. He's just sitting there sniffling. Fuck you, Bon Bon. That wasn't bad, dude. That was a really interesting horror game. And I can comfortably say that that was a horror experience, unlike the past two that I played. That was cool. 
Okay, so as you can tell, I enjoyed this game quite a bit. It's pretty damn disturbing, and I really admire the way that it was done. I got this game for $3 on Steam, and this was developed by Aetheric Games. Now, for $3, it's not the best horror experience, but I did personally enjoy this game. The voice acting is just okay, the controls are very clunky and awkward, and the game itself is relatively short. But as you've seen in this video, all the games that I've shown are under a half hour anyways. On the Steam reviews for Bon Bon, it seems people just wanted more out of $3, and to that I'd say quit fucking whining. Paying for a horror game is not that bad. You should expect nothing less for $3, it's just $3. A lot of the negative reviews this game has are from people who likely drop $3 all the time on meaningless bullshit. I like to support game developers even if in the end I'm not the biggest fan of the game. However, if I have the option to get it for free, I'm gonna take that offer. Both Rat and Konish games and even Ratman are technically free but you can pay optionally to support the devs if you wanted to. I'm in this middle ground of not having much money but still wanting to make an incredible video. So for the sake of the topic of this video, I would have paid $10 if that was the price of Bon Bon just to be able to show you guys my experience with it. In contrast to all the other things I've already covered involving rats. And so all those other games that I got for free, if I had to pay for them, I would. But I didn't have to, so I didn't. Bon Bon's story is kind of vague. As you saw, you play as a little kid who was being traumatized by this gigantic rat, which is probably exaggerated by the mind of the kid. However, things aren't clear on what represents what. I can't tell if Bon Bon is simply a pet rat, as was shown in the credits, or if the real trauma was disputes between the kid's parents or something else entirely. The wrench in the system for me was the horrific bedtime story that the kid listens to on this very old school recording device. But I'm not really sure how this bedtime story connects to the actual story. I'm not sure where to draw symbolism from because everything is incredibly vague. I don't know if that means I'm just not understanding it and it's right in front of my face and I'm stupid, or if the game itself had a very messy and directionless plot. But I also barely understand the Brazil Brazilian Rat and Konish game, so I guess I'm over two with that. Ratman was simple enough, and so was the 2D Rat and Konish, but Bon Bon felt like a shotgun blast of vague ideas that are left for the player to interpret. My issue was that I just don't think the puzzle pieces were big enough. As for the gameplay goes, it's nothing special. It's a walking simulator where you pick up objects and drop them. That's essentially the full extent of the gameplay. However, the disturbing and unnerving feelings that this game gives off, I thought, were very well designed. The game is not for everyone, and frankly none of these games are, but this one especially, I would think, would have divisive opinions. Before I showcased my footage, I said that it was likely about abuse. I'm still not 100% certain that's what the developer was even aiming for, but that's really the only underlying message that I can depict. In a way, I think this game was trying to say too much without proper structure. For example, the bedtime story involves Hans and Hilda. Am I supposed to be Hans in this game? Is Hans my father? What's the real connection? If I'm being honest, this game felt like a demo to a bigger, unfinished project that never happened. But I gotta say, I enjoyed this game more than both Rat and Konish games, perhaps simply because it was scarier and I have a terror bias. I'm not sure, but I know that this experience for me was more enjoyable than the other two, and the fact that I had to pay $3 doesn't bother me that much. Yet, I also really liked Ratman, and that game is completely free. All four of these games are very different from one another, and so the experiences have stark contrasts in many ways. I'm just trying to say that sometimes you get what you pay for, and a game that's $3 will likely do better than one that is free. But that is also not always the case, because sometimes paid games can be outshined by incredible free games. I think this would all boil down to personal preference, whereas I'd say I enjoyed Bon Bon most, Ratman 
Japan as a close second, then the 2D platformer, and lastly the Brazilian folk story. But this order of likability could very well be reversed for other people depending on what they like. That's fine. And like I said, these games are all quite different, which was partially the point for this video to provide glimpses into the realm of rodent horror from a variety of angles. Hence Bonbon bon fits perfectly into all of this for its uniqueness. Now, in this last segment, I'm going to be wrapping things up. I know this video is huge, which is pretty much the opposite of the current norm. Nowadays, YouTube shorts are the popular trend given society's shortening attention span. That's not a diss on everyone else. I mean, it is, but at the same time, I struggle to stay focused as well. I hardly watch large videos like this unless I'm not currently working on a project, which is a rare occurrence. But assuming you've made it this far into this monstrous video, I imagine you've enjoyed the report of ride. The thing I want to circle back to was the idea of large rats being a cryptid. One of the most popular sightings of the cryptid giant rat was apparently World War I, where these rats were called trench rats. Here's what I found on Wikipedia. Trench rats were rodents that were found around the frontline trenches of World War I due to massive amounts of debris, corpses, and a putrid environment, rats at the trenches bred at a rapid pace. The rats likely numbered in the millions. According to some soldiers, these rats could grow to be as big as a cat's. The rats played a role in damaging the soldiers' health, psyche, and morale, and were responsible for a lack of sleep, adding to the filthy conditions and unsanitary hygiene in the trenches. As such, the trench rats left a lasting impression on the Allied soldiers who served the Western Front, with veterans who served in the French and British armies speaking about their horrible experiences with rats during interviews. Attempts to solve the rat problem were not effective during the war. Although they could be found in abundance during World War I, these rats appeared to decrease rapidly after the war ended. The rat's contribution to the terrible environment in the trenches aided in the avoidance of using trenches in future wars, especially in Europe, where their negative legacy remains to this day, memorialized through media portrayals. Trench rats are often viewed with a pessimistic connotation associated with the worst of trench life and warfare, especially in their depiction in movies. They have also been portrayed in a positive light in poems, such as Break of Day in the Trenches by Isaac Rosenberg, as well as in modern fictional history videos as a metaphor for the life of a French soldier living in the trenches. Clearly this cryptid has some truth to it. Soldiers who witnessed rats in these war trenches claimed that some were as big as cats. That's a bold thing to say. Or is it? Technically, the largest species of rat is known as the Gambian pouched rat native to Africa. These things can weigh up to 9 pounds. The average weight is around 3 pounds, but they can get that big. The size of this thing is pretty close to the size of a cat. Of course, there weren't Gambian pouched rats in the trenches of World War I, but I'm saying the mystical aspect of the scripted really isn't so mystical and might be closer to nature than we'd like to admit. This doesn't mean I think mutant rat people the size of the creatures in Ratman truly exist, but just consider for a moment. Look at the horror trilogy I covered, written by James Herbert. The rats in these books are roughly the size of cats or dogs and are also furiously bloodthirsty. Saying that out loud sounds ridiculous, it's fiction. But when a real species of rat can reach that size, given specific circumstances to its environment, it's really not that far from reality. Unlikely, absolutely, but impossible, no. So, you're saying the thing that attacked you was a giant rat? As I mentioned earlier in the video, these rats in World War I had a constant buffet of corpses to dine on. It's not like soldiers were out trying to kill the rats, they were trying to kill each other. Of course, I'm sure many soldiers killed rats that were eating their food, or even them, just to get rid of the pest that they truly were. But I'm saying it's very possible that rats in these trenches grew to a size that would be considered the giant rat cryptid. However, looking at some of the real photos of trench rats in World War I, they don't 
don't really look gigantic. They look slightly bigger than a regular rat, but it's not really the stuff of nightmares. To be fair, war is the stuff of nightmares. Rats, in this case, were just one of the ingredients to the horrific melting pot. Trench rats on their own seem to have been exaggerated. All I'm saying is, despite this exaggeration, we shouldn't entirely rule it out as nonsense. I also have that poem here that was mentioned on Wikipedia, written by Isaac Rosenberg. The darkness crumbles away. It is the same old druid time as ever. Only a live thing leaps my hand. A squeer sardonic rat. As I pull the parapet's poppy to stick behind my ear. Droll rat, they would shoot you if they knew your cosmopolitan sympathies. Now you have touched this England hand, you will do the same to a German. Soon, no doubt, if it be your pleasure, to cross the sleeping green between. It seems you inwardly grin as you pass, strong eyes, fine limbs, haughty athletes. Less chanced than you for life, bonds to the whims of murder, sprawled in the bowels of the earth, the torn fields of France. What do you see in our eyes at the shrieking iron and flame hurled through still heavens? What quaver, what heart aghast, poppies whose roots are in man's veins drop and are ever dropping, but mine in my ear is safe, just a little white with the dust. Personally, I think this poem is pretty awesome, but some of it went over my head upon my first read, and I'm assuming some of it went over your head as well. On Wikipedia, however, there's already a sort of breakdown of the things Isaac was really talking about. Isaac contemplates the folly of war, viewing the trench rat as an outsider to the conflict while questioning how it understands the destruction of war. There is irony used in the poem as an insignificant creature, such as a rat, could successfully complete the Herculean effort of crossing to the other side. For example, when the speaker depicts of the ability of the rat to touch both a German's hand and a British soldier's hand, connecting both enemies and be cosmopolitan by being able to cross no man's land to either the British or German trenches. In a sense, the poem portrays the rat in a positive light as the speaker believes it could perform amazing feats, like crossing no man's land with no repercussions that no ordinary German or British soldier could do on the battlefield. Going back to Wikipedia, there's a lot more on the trench rats. When living in the trenches along the western front, food and waste created by soldiers drew the rats in. The environment in the trenches was optimal for a rat's breeding ground. With an abundance of corpses, food, shelter, water, and waste, the rats were able to breed quickly. Rats could be found wherever soldiers were, where they ate, where they slept, where they fought. These are estimations that show it is possible there were more rats than soldiers in trenches, with reports from soldiers stating that some rats could be the size of cats. Rats, being nocturnal creatures, would often be active during times when soldiers were trying to rest. Only those with high enough status would be given anti-rat beds, while the rest of the soldiers would have practically no form of protection against them. It was not uncommon for rats to crawl across the faces of sleeping soldiers or even eat food straight from the soldiers' hands as they become more accustomed to human presence. Attempts to separate food from the rats would prove to be futile, as rats were bold and snatched the food from the pockets of sleeping soldiers anyways. In addition to eating the food rations of soldiers, rats also had a proclivity to eat the candles of soldiers, taking away a source of light in an already dangerous environment. Can I just say, holy fucking shit is that scary. Dude, rats eating the only light source of soldiers is terrifying. Especially because, keep in mind, these rats aren't just measly little runts that are easy to kick away. These things are larger than regular rats, and they are driven by a comfortable gluttony that overrides their fear of humans. And if there's enough of them, you can't do much about it. It's unlikely any soldiers were actually killed by swarming rats. It was more of a terrible nuisance that affected soldiers psychologically. You can't really sleep when your fingers and toes are being nibbled on. Or or when you realize that most of your friends who died in battle were essentially buried where they fell, only to later be the lunch of rodents. Let's keep reading. 
trench rats contributed to many different psychological effects on the human psyche given their ability to disrupt sleep and reduce the overall quality of the soldier's rest. The noises rats made in no man's land during night would sometimes cause soldiers to believe enemies were mounting an attack, leading them to grow paranoid and shoot out into the empty space between trenches. Rats also scurried across the soldiers' faces and bodies when they slept, which was another cause for awakening. On top of all this, rats were known to eat the irretrievable dead bodies of soldiers left in no man's land, and the nibbling of rats eating bodies could be heard in the trenches during periods of silence between active warfare. On the other hand, the situation with the rats also allowed some reprieve to the soldiers stationed along the western front. Due to long periods of inactivity in the trenches with an abundance of rats, rat hunting became a sport and a source of entertainment for the allied soldiers to stave off boredom. Because ammunition needed to be conserved for battles, killing the rats with bayonets was acceptable and eventually became a pastime for the soldiers. Rats also served as companions, with some soldiers keeping them as pets to escape the brutality of the war around them. Overall, the negative experiences with the trench rats that the Allied soldiers experienced on the Western Front far outweighed those of the positive, and many British and French veterans who served there would later recall rats as an integral part of their their worst experiences in the trenches amongst the mud, rain, lice, trench foot, and death. These monstrous rats were clearly a big problem, and honestly I feel like I barely heard about rats in war until I looked it up. In school, discussing history, it was more about the political shit and less about the deeper and darker psychological things like being driven insane by rats. I'd also like to mention that sometimes soldiers brought in dogs to help hunt down rats and cleanse the trenches of any rodents. And also there were attempts of using various chemical agents to ward off the rats. So people really tried to get rid of these rats, it's just that sometimes their resources were exhausted and in those times there was no way for them to make their situation any better. But I think as for World War I, that's the end of the line for rats. Combat strategies changed drastically in World War II, and rats weren't nearly as big of a problem. But so far we have just this one perspective of the natural cryptid, if you will. Where else could we look to gain more perspective and evolve our understanding of the possibility of such mythical creatures existing simply in a less exaggerated form? Well, I mentioned the Gambian pouched rat from Africa, which is mainly in Kenya, Senegal, Angola, and Mozambique, but let's go just a tad downward, to South Africa. Apparently, there's the story that two babies were eaten by giant rats in different townships in South Africa, and apparently both of these attacks happened within the span of one week. According to DailyMail.com, Lunati Dwadwa, 3, was killed as she slept in her parents' shack in the Kayalitsha slum outside Cape Town, and another girl was killed in Soweto Township near Johannesburg the same day. Little Lunati was sleeping on a makeshift bed on the floor of her family's breeze block in corrugated iron home on Sunday night when she died. Her puzzled parents didn't even hear her scream. When her mother discovered her lifeless body, she saw that her daughter's eyes had been gouged out. And I apologize in this segment for butchering any African names. I suck with this today. Bukiswa Dwadwa, 27, said, I can't forget how ugly my child looked after her eyes were ripped out. She was eaten from her eyebrows to her cheeks. Her other eye was hanging by a piece of flesh. Her father, who I'm just gonna call Makona, because I cannot pronounce that first name, said police told him nothing could have done that but rats. And the website says that today, which was actually June 3rd, 2011, police revealed that a baby girl died in the Soweto township when she was attacked by rats while her teenage mother was out with friends. We were called to the scene of the death of an infant due to a rat attack on Monday morning at around 9 a.m., said police officer Bongami Mlongo. The mother of the child was arrested on charges of culpable homicide and negligence. According to this same article, a month prior, an elderly lady aged 77 was killed after giant rats chewed off the right side of her face. So I don't really know what happened in 2011 that would provoke violent rat attacks back to back to back in South Africa, but the people here in these impoverished townships say that giant rats grow up to 3 feet long, including their tails, and have front teeth over an inch long. 
and apparently they suspect that the baby attacks were done by African giant pouched rats, which is the same species I mentioned earlier, the largest rat species in the world. So there's multiple aspects of this to take into account. First, I'm not sure any of this information is really that reliable. It's incredibly difficult for Westerners or rather modern world journalists and reporters to get clear and unbiased information from places like South Africa. South Africa is actually one of the few African countries that is more up-to-date and more open-minded with modernity in comparison to say Nigeria, Uganda, or maybe Ethiopia, whereas those countries just kind of cling a little too hard to unverifiable mysticism. Yet even with that said, many South Africans have that same attitude. I read a book which was more like a series of documents which was called Psychiatric, Traditional, and Other Interpretations of Ukutwetiulwa, a witchcraft phenomenon in the Western Cape. In this free online PDF that I found, which will be in the description of this video for anyone interested, I discovered that phenomenons like witchcraft are much more serious for countries like South Africa. In America, sure we have our religious customs, lots of Christians and then Native Americans have their own religious beliefs, so on and so forth, but the majority of our government and the people making important decisions do not shy away from science. Even our religious people still believe in a logical amount of science. We know that if you're suffering from cancer, you're going to choose chemotherapy instead of praying to get better because scientifically speaking, praying to get better and doing nothing pretty much have the same results. Yet when Westerners go into South Africa to investigate and interview people who believe in horrific forms of witchcraft, the idea of psychological analysis is completely new to them. I went and did a song about this witchcraft thing called Ukutwetilwa, featuring an artist from South Africa called Spawn Mortis. There's a lyric video for it which should be at the top of the screen right now. I read this roughly 100 page digital book because I wanted to know what I was talking about. Mystical stories in South Africa are told generationally and so there's no easy way of finding the exact origin. It's like how Christians tell their kids about heaven, hell, and Jesus. Same idea, except most people in South Africa don't have immediate access to the same scientific education as we do in America. According to this book here, there is practically no such thing as a psychiatrist who is completely up to date with Western medicine and psychology within any South African hospital. That sounds extreme, but the people who went there to conduct this study could only find nurses at best. So where am I going with all this, well, my point is, countries such as South Africa don't always have the same ideologies as countries like America. Personally, I don't make fun of South Africans for believing wholeheartedly in their own religious customs because there's plenty of things science cannot explain. I question both science and religion. I'm not faithfully nor scientifically biased with the spectrum of my philosophy. Spawn Mortis, the person who I collaborated with for that song, very much believes in the supernatural. Yet, he and I live in two very different worlds, so I'm saying it's likely that these South Africans claiming that these rats were as frighteningly large as they say simply aren't the most reliable witnesses. At least not for the standard of information we hold in America. People like to tell stories and people love to exaggerate them. In this case, it'd be more like the witnesses likely believed that the rodents were perhaps impossibly large, but the idea of it being impossible does not cross their mind. So such rumors spread and then it becomes a common belief. And then when modern reporters investigate these kinds of cases, they can't really get an answer that they can see eye to eye with. Yet, one thing to keep in mind is that these places where these rat attacks occurred are not in very good shape. In fact, according to DailyMail.com, these were filthy, ramshackled slums, which would be the perfect environment for larger-than-usual rats. So, once more, all I can say is that there's likely some truth to it, but it's still kind of smeared with misinterpretation and deception. This would seem to be the case for pretty much all cryptids, which is why so many YouTubers make research videos about them. Well, not all cryptids, some are pretty fucking stupid. <laughs> but a handful have their own rabbit holes. We bounced around quite a bit, but I want to provide one more perspective with the giant rat cryptid before concluding my thoughts. Let's take a look at modern day New York City. New York has had a terrible rat problem for quite some time now. Most of these rats are regularly sized. The main issue is the abundance of them. 
However, there are some instances where abnormally large rats have been spotted. An article titled The Beast of the Bronx included this picture and said this with it. It may be the size of a small dog, but this is not the sort of creature many of us would fancy petting. What appears to be a giant rat was allegedly found dead in a footlocker shoe shop in the Bronx, New York. Scooped on a shovel in the Fordham store's stock room, the massive brown and white rodent measures around 3 feet. Experts think the rodent is a Gambian pouched rat, a fairly common pet that can grow up to 3 feet. It is not the first time the giant breed has been spotted in New York City. One of the creatures was speared to death by a pitchfork at a sprawling Brooklyn housing project last year. Jose Rivera, a housing authority worker, was clearing a rat hole at the Marcy houses in Brooklyn when three of the creatures popped out. He was only able to nab one. It appears to be almost three feet long, including the tail, is covered in white fur, and looks well fed. After he caught the rat, Mr. Rivera, 48, said, I hit it one time and it was still moving. I hit it another time, and that's when it died. I'm not scared of rats, but I was scared of being bitten. Naomi Cullen, head of the Marcy House's Tenant Association, said there have been sightings of the outsized rat for at least six years. She said the residents have told me that they've seen it running around with other rats. Resident Stephanie Davis, 44, said, Even the cats are afraid of the rats. They get together and gang up on the cats. Pam Davis, 43, added, They're here day and night. We don't dodge bullets, we dodge rats. They're so big, they should charge them rent. So from this, it seems like whenever there's a giant rat, we look to the Gambian pouched rat as an explanation. Yet, that's a little bit strange if that species is native to Africa, what the hell would it be doing in New York? Or what would it really be doing in Germany or France or Britain in World War I? The answer is it has no business being there, so I don't think it's really the most logical explanation. I only think that the existence of the Gambian pouched rat would be proof that rats can reach quite a threatening size, but it wouldn't make sense if once any brown rat or black rat reached roughly 3 feet that it was automatically scientifically considered this African variant. Rather, I would argue these are probably just rats that have grown in accordance with their environment. If you enclose the shark with a small and cruel box as a baby shark, when it grows up to be an adult shark, it will stay small. I mentioned this when playing Ratman in the shark sequence. Those sharks were too big for the size of those tubes, but they'd be perfect size for open ocean. Or maybe, perhaps, over a couple of generations in an environment where gluttony is the norm, such creatures could exceed their natural size. That was my argument for the trench rats, given that they had a constant feast whenever they wanted. World War I lasted about four years, and the average lifespan of a rat is one to two years. I think it is possible that rats that were born in gigantic litters into a world where dead humans were literally everywhere, and the environment was quite favorable to them, that these rats would inevitably be larger than average. Much larger. The only thing is, it's a little quick for evolution to work that way, so it's possible that trench rat mania was slightly exaggerated because of the hellish world of war that they were in. If a snake crawled on me in my sleep, I'd freak the fuck out and immediately imagine it to be much bigger than it might really be out of panic and fear. I would then tell my friends and family that a huge snake slithered on me, when in reality it might not have been as big as I thought. But in the case for New York City, there has been plenty of time for the rats in the city and in the sewers to literally evolve into a larger subspecies. I really don't think that it's as simple as saying the largest sightings are the African Gambian pouched rat. However, I would argue that it's likely that the Gambian pouched rats were the ones that were spotted in South Africa, given South Africa is much closer to where the species is naturally from than New York. But also, now that I think about it, if these Gambian pouched rats are sometimes used as pets, we can't rule out the possibility that some Americans here and there want the Gambian pouched rats as pets. If something happened to said pets or they had a litter of babies or something, there is a chance, albeit a slim chance, that some Gambian pouched rats managed to become one with the other city rats. But all of this is kind of up in the air. When I look up giant rat cryptid, there really isn't an exact estimated size for what this mythical species might be. 
So that's why I've drawn all these connections to the largest and most terrifying sightings of different kinds of rats. I'd be irresponsible to say for sure that this or that was really some larger subspecies of rat that we should consider a cryptid. I think there's conflicting evidence and not enough proof to make any solid statements. All I can provide with all these perspectives is an educated guess, and my guess is that most of these rat sightings that are roughly three feet long, or the size of a cat, are likely the Gambian pouch rat or are simply rats that have sort of quickly evolved with their environment. If the requirements for a rat to be the giant rat cryptid include being much larger than three feet, like four or five feet, then I'd say it's probably nothing more than a myth. But bear in mind, there have been lions that have evolved into the biggest, strongest lions on the planet from being in landlocked area with no predators and an abundance of large muscular prey. These lions grew in accordance with their environment and are now literally larger on average than any other lion elsewhere. Is this a cryptid or simply a real natural subspecies? I believe somewhere out there in uninhabited forests and jungles, there are some yet to be discovered megafauna. The same can be said for the ocean, given deep sea gigantism. I'd like to believe that there's yet to be discovered species of snake in the jungle, and species of octopus or squid or shark in the ocean that are much larger than they should be. But the reason that gets iffy with rats is because rats live next to us, around us, under us, above us. If the giant rat cryptid is real, I think we would have more proof. Otherwise, we can argue that it is real and it's simply giant rats that are roughly three feet long, including their tail, because that is the largest reported size. I think to say otherwise is strictly conspiracy and would require a lot more evidence. Yet I do think if humans were crazy enough to try, if we had a controlled environment designed to hopefully make rats larger, and this environment was sustained for maybe a hundred years, then we would probably see something monstrous unfold, perhaps reaching that four foot, maybe five foot length. But that's all hypothetical. I'd imagine such evolutionary experiments could have significant effects on almost any species. So to finally finish things here, we covered a British horror novel trilogy on rats. We discussed rat kings, rat worship in India, the serial killer Tsutomu Miyazaki. We covered a game where a marine shoots his way through a rat cryptid infested sewer, a game where you play as a rat roaming underground while tied to another dead rat by the tail, a game where you adventure into a hidden temple of rats, and also a game where you play as a child being tormented by an oversized brown rat. And now we have dissected and analyzed the cryptid of the giant rat entirely. I hope that this video truly was a collection of vermin filth for whoever is still watching. This fucking script is 76 pages long and I hate myself, but I hope that the ending result was satisfactory content. But now I can't help but think that you're tired of hearing my boring voice, so once and for all, thank you for watching. If you weren't already having one, have a bad day.